In this video, I want to introduce you to the computer programming language called Julia. Now, it's a wonderful rainy, cold Cape Town winter's day. And uh, I was rather curious. I always use Python in the IPython notebook, but could I use Julia uh, to do some of this analysis? Now, it's a computer programming language really for computer scientists, mathematicians, etc. And I was wondering if a mere mortal, a mere surgeon like myself could use Julia. Now, I'm never going to move away from Python and the iPython notebook. They really are fantastic. Uh, it's, it's really phenomenal stuff to do your work with. Um, but I was wondering what I could do with Julia. Now, Julia has packages that you can import. They are like your uh, Python modules, but they're certainly not that well developed. And I don't know Julia that well that I could just write the code all on my own. So I want to use some of these packages. I'm also not going to use the IPython notebook for this demonstration. I'm going to use a different development environment called Juno. It's beautiful. It's built on Lighttable and really looks well. Um, certainly, though, for any kind of production work, I'm going to stick with, uh, with the IPython notebook and, and Project Jupyter. I, don't, I think it, it really doesn't get any better than that. But let's go. Let's have a look at uh, Julia. And uh, I'm going to take you through this video rather, uh, at, at rather some pace. There's quite a bit to do. I'm not going to stop and, and talk about all the syntax. Just follow along. And what I'm going to do is to show you a, a data frame, a database, which is just a spreadsheet of values that we're going to use. Now, I'm going to show you just how to construct one from scratch in this video and just import some of the random, va random variables to populate my, my, my database. But I'll, uh, uh, I'll, I'll mention quite a few times, I think, in the video that you can just import a spreadsheet with your data and use it as such. But I wanted to show you some of the functionality of Julia. So uh, going through some pace, maybe if I have some time later, I'll break it down into slower sections and go through some of the syntax. Really, Julia is a phenomenal language. And uh, let's go have a look. And so here we are in Juno. You see that I have already uh, typed uh, everything I want to show you. Let's start right at the beginning. We're going to just uh, import some of the packages that we're going to use. The first one is a package called Markdown, just so that we can print some uh, text to the screen. I'm going to use a prob in a proper, probably not in the uh, in the correct way, but you'll see how we do that. So in Juno, we just type using Markdown, and I'm going to hold down on the Mac the Command key and hit Enter, or on the PC that would be Control and Enter. And you'll see uh, at the bottom the little spinning disk went on while it imported. Now Markdown is not a big package that will go fairly quickly. I'm now going to do uh, the data frames package, again holding down command uh, and enter or, sh or, or control enter. And again, you'll see our little nice little animation down the bottom as uh, this gets important. And this takes quite uh, quite some time. Data frames is a big package, and uh, uh, it takes a while to do. There we go. It's done. The uh, next one we're going to use is distributions. We're just going to look at uh, using random. Uh, random variable distributions. Import that. Done. Now a big package called Gadfly. Now that is the package we're going to use to do some plotting or graphing on the screen. Also a very big package and um, if that's the first one that you do load it might take quite some time. Okay, I cut uh, the waiting period out in the video for you because uh, depending on the system you use you could ser seriously go out and uh, take out two gallbladders before uh, before coming back. Uh, the last one we're going to use is the hypothesis tests. This is a package that contains a few uh, rudimentary uh, statistical analysis and uh, at the end we'll see how to use those. Good. This is how I'm going to use a markdown. So it's markdown.pass and it's just a string that I'm going to print to the screen and you see beautifully rendered here in Juno. There we go. So we're going to create our first data frame. There it is, data frame. We're going to use um, the word data frame there, capital D, uppercase D, uppercase F, and I'm going to attach it to this computer variable called DF, just for data frame. And it's going to contain two columns and see how the columns are just separated by a comma here. The first column is going to be called A and there's no uh, double quotation marks there, so it's, uh, I'm not entering as a string. That's just going to be the name of the column, and I'm going to have a column B. Column 1 is going to contain the integers 1 through 10, and column B is going to contain the integers 2 through 20, but in steps of 2. So I'm at the end of the line, hold down the command key, control key, hit enter, 
and there you go. So this is what Juno is going to do. It's going to render the data frame there for you, hidden. But if you click on it, there you go. Beautifully, it uh, shows you that data frame on the screen. So there's my column A and B. And as I said, one integers 1 through, through 10 in my column A. And in the rows for column B, we have 2 to 20 and going up in steps of 2. If I just click on it again, it hides itself. That works rather well, I think. So some more markdown just to the text. Let, let's select certain rows and columns. So I can do that referring to the data frame DF. That was the computer variable name I gave my data frame. And I can say <coughs> the rows that I want, row 1 to 3, separated by a comma, then columns. So it's row, comma, columns. So I want rows 1 to 3, and I want only column A. Look how that goes in square brackets, and there is this colon in front of the column name. And uh, all I've, I haven't attached that to another uh, data frame name. I'm just just asking uh, Julia just to uh, just to select that those rows and columns for me. And if I do that, look at that again. It's just a row, uh, uh, column A, and just the first three rows rendered there. Let's just uh, show how to add a column named names containing just some strings. So to do that, I'm just going to refer to the data frame I've, I've uh, created up, up there, df, and then in square brackets, just the colon again, names. So that is going to be the name of this third column. And there's just 10 ABC string elements there, just some um, uh, single characters. So there's 10 of them, so that'll fit in nicely to my data frame because I do have 10 rows in it. And if I hit enter, you see it is a vector and it's a vector ABC. So Juno is only going to refer to this vector that you created. This is a row vector. Well, it's actually a column vector, I must say. Um, uh, that's uh, this part of the mathematics uh, of Julia. So if you do have these commas in between, it's going to it's going to do a column vector for you. If you if you did not, it'll be a row vector. If if you didn't put the commas, anyway, it's just showing me the vector of ten ten dimensions. I should I can say I suppose that it's going to add to my data frame. So let's create a new data frame by selecting only values of A in the names column. So remember here we only selected some of the rows and a certain column. Now let's do that. We create a new data frame called data underscore A and it is from the data frame, DF data frame, the column names that are equal to, so it's dot, double equal sign, A, comma, and the colon. So you've got to learn how to use this syntax for Julia. And if I uh, were to hit uh, Command Enter, Control Enter, there we go. So what it's done, it's uh, gone into the names column, names there, and it's only selected the rows that contain the value A in them. And give me gives me the corresponding rows in both columns A and B. So that is my new data frame that I only select if I wanted to do some research. And and, and some of the research participants were were in uh, uh, selected to be in, in in group A. I could create a new data frame with only their values in it. And this is the way to go about it. What if I wanted to have uh, more selection criteria? The way to do to go about that is uh, the same as this, but uh, you're going you're gonna, to uh, put parentheses around what you want to do. So it's still the data frame uh, in, big in big square brackets. Then look at this. There's a parentheses there and there, and it has the single ampersand sign there and another parenthesis there and there. So I want where the names column it contains the values of A and the B column has numbers greater than 4. So if I were to do that, it's still only A, but now in the B column, we're only going to have values that are larger than 4, so 6, 14, and 20 there. So you can build up quite a few criteria just to select parts of your database, your data frame. And that's, uh, that's wonderful if you want to do some analysis on that. So let's do some simple statistics on what we have. 
I'm going to just ask the uh, Julia just to describe data A, the A column for me. Now look what happens. A spin there, nothing happens. There's a check mark there, so it was executed the way Juno works. Uh, it is going to hide it for us in what is called the console. And to view the console, you have to hold in command and the little um, uh, uh, Control, I should say. So even on the Mac, it's Control. So it's Control and the little tilde sign. And the console opens up at the bottom. And you can see it has described the A column. So the mean for the values in the A column, and remember data underscore A, only contained the A's. If we, where did we do it? There. There's our data frame. So it's only going to look down column A here. So it's values 1, 2, 3, 7, and 10. It has a mean of 4.6. Third quartile there, a maximum. The NA stands for uh, uh, rows that contain no data entries. There were zero of those, and the percentage of that makes up zero. So it gives us a little description there. Starts there, min, first quartile, median, mean, third quartile, max, the NAs, and the NA percentages. So I hit control and the tilde key again, and it disappears. So if we just were to look at the big data frame and just look at column A, we can just ask it to calculate the mean of all the values. So there you go, it's 5.5. We can ask it to sum all the values, 10 plus 9 plus 8 plus 7, I mean, that would be 55, the standard deviation, the variance, the minimum or the maximum. There's lots of normal descriptive statistics that you can just do on any of the columns uh, in your data frame. Here we've asked just for some um, numerical calculations and we'll get all of those. Let's uh, ramp things up, make it a bit more interesting and we're going to populate just an empty data frame. Data, we're going to call this data, so not df, I'm giving it a different name data and it's a data frame, open close parentheses, so it's just an empty an empty data frame. There it is. If I click on it, there's absolutely nothing in it. Now, what I'm going to do is just to create this data frame, as I said, there from scratch. It's an empty, but I'm going to populate it with columns and rows. The normal way that you would go about it, obviously, is just to import a spreadsheet. Uh, you can import a spreadsheet, a spreadsheet that you've saved in Excel or in other spreadsheet software. If you uh, do it, uh, save it as a CSV file, it, it's a bit easier, but uh, you can import your spreadsheet, but what I'm going to do here is just to create one from scratch and put in random variables in it just to show you how the distributions, the uh, random variables distributions package works. So first of all, I'm just going to create this uh, empty array. I'm going to call it gender array, and I'm going to add just this uh, single character F to it, and you'll see it in a moment why I do that. It's, it's not necessary. It's just for explanatory purposes. So there we go. It's this vector. One, one by one, uh, uh, one row column vector with the character F in it. And now I'm going to create this little for loop. So um, obviously if you just do your normal statistics, you know, import your, your, spreadsheet, soft, your spreadsheet file, you, you needn't go through all of this. But just to show you a little bit uh, a, a, a more uh, of Julia here. So I've got this for n loop. So it's going to uh, loop through this from this for to this n at the bottom. Um, from 1 to 199, so it's going to go through the 199 times. I'm going to create this ra a no a random normal variable called Rn, so it's just a rand n, empty parentheses there, so it takes a standard normal distribution, so it's going to have a mean of 0, and it's going to just randomly select values uh, on either side of 0 um, as a standard normal distribution, in other words, um, it's going to have a, uh, this distribution has a uh, standard deviation of 1. So it's going to select that, and if you think about it, it's either going to be positive or negative. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to run an if-else end statement inside of it, and I'm going to say if it shows a number that was equal to or less than 0, I'm going to append, see the exclamation mark there, the gender array with female else. In other words, if the random number was positive, I'm going to append the gender array with male. So I started with one, and I'm going to add 199 other randomly selected male females. So every time you run this, you're going to uh, uh, obviously have have uh, different results. So I'm, what I'm what I'm want to do do here is just to create a, a column vector: male, female, male, female, male, female, uh, 
just randomly. So I'm at the end of the last end statement here, and I'm just going to hold down Command Control, hit Enter, and there it is. You see there, it's executed. If I wanted to look at it quickly, so there's gender array there, uh, executed, and there you see it's this column vector 200 randomly, either male, female, male, female, male, female, male, female. So if you ever wanted to to do uh, to to create uh, the entries in a column um, randomly, this would be one way of going about it. There's obviously other ways, probably uh, easier ways, and more um, computer sciencey ways of 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 doing it properly. So what I want to do now is to create this. Remember, my data was an empty data frame. I'm going to create this column called gender colon gender, and I'm going to add to it this gender array, which is my 200 rows of randomly selected male and female patients just added uh, just added to there. So there we go. It is now this. When you do it this way, it's, it's not going to give you the whole data frame. It's just going to give you this vector, column vector that you added to it. Now I'm going to do this the same, and I'm going to go through uh, a new, uh, I'm going to create a new array called group array, and I'm going to call it A. Uh, I'm going to, uh, sorry, I'm going to call a group array and I'm going to add, just as I did before, just add something to it called A. You don't have to do that. You could have done that all in here. It's just for demonstration purposes. I'm going to do exactly the same. And I'm going to uh, randomly put in either A or B, A or B, as if these patients belong to two different groups. If I do that, that very quickly runs through. If I look at my group array now, which is this vector, and again, it's just random. Let's go down so you can see it's just random A's and B's, A's and B's all the way down. Click on it and it goes away. And now I'm going to add that as another group in my data frame. And I'm going to call this group, uh, this uh, uh, column, I'm going to call a group. And I'm going to attach this to it. There we go. And uh, let, let's add some more columns. I've got two columns now. It was randomly selected male and female and randomly selected A, B. So... Let's add some more columns. So I'm going to refer to my data frame data, and I'm going to add an age column, a days column, a temp column, a white cell count, and a CRP column. And I'm going to use uh, random, uh, normal, uh, random distributions, random variable distributions. And the way to go about it is this way: rand. I'm going to use the normal distribution with a mean of 35 and a standard deviation of 10. So that goes in these parentheses here, comma 200. I want, please give me 200 random variable, random values that is normally distributed around a mean of 35 with a standard deviation of 10. Done. And if I look at it now, it's just this vector, uh, column vector, 200 values. I've asked for 200 of them. And one after the other, and they are randomly distributed around this normal distribution with a mean of 35 and a standard deviation of 10. And that's, that's quite beautiful to do. Let's do a days, and we're going to use a Poisson distribution, and we're going to give it a lambda value here of 2, and I want 200 of those as well, please. And now I'm going to have an admission temperature, and I want it to be from a normal random distribution um, around a mean of 38 with a standard deviation of 2, and I want 200 of those, please. Uh, the white cell count, I'm going to have a mean of 5 and a standard deviation of 5. I want 200 of those. And now I've just been a bit silly here. This is definitely not a, a proper distribution. But I just wanted to choose something different than a normal distribution. So I'm going to have a lambda value of 2 for my Poisson distribution. I want 200 of those. And then what we do here, we add times 2 plus 100 to each of those. So it's going to take each and every row entry, multiply it by 2 and add 100. Just so that we get something you can see here. Just so that we get um, this kind of values round about for our CRP. As I said, it's not, not, not a proper way of uh, having gone about that, but just to add something, uh, something different. So data, if I just were to command control enter behind that, there's my whole data frame now. You can see it has gender, group, age, days, temperature, white cell count, CRP, and I have 200 rows of entries for those. So I created this data frame uh, um, just by selecting random values, showed you how to generate it in real life. You're obviously going to have real data inside of a spreadsheet, and you just you can just import that spreadsheet file, not have to go through all, uh, all of this. 
So I'm now going to use Getfly, which is a popular plotting lib uh, package for 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 uh, Julia. So this is the way it works. Because I uh, said using Getfly, it's now in memory, and I can just use one of its keywords there, plot. And then there's my open and close parentheses, and there's the close one right at the back. It, uh, it Getfly takes uh, data frames as entry values. So I'm saying use my data data frame. On the x-axis, please plot the values that are in gender. And there are only two values in gender, and they are categorical. It's only, only going to be MF, MF. The color, it's obviously then going to uh, do two columns for us, and I want you to choose different columns based on, or do two different colors for my two columns based on the values that you find in gender. It found two values, so it's going to choose two colors. And I want you to, to draw a histogram for me. So that's the geometry, uh, that's the way that Gadfly works. It draws these geometries, so it's geometry geom dot histogram. I want you to put in a guide, guide, uh, you get uh, the titles, the XY, X labels, Y labels, that's the uh, text that you can add to your plots. So guide.title, I want it to be title gender, and I want the Y label just to be numbers. So that's how you would construct a histogram. I'm going to hit the command, enter, uh, control, enter, and the first time you run a plot like this, also uh, you can uh, probably uh, swallow down a quick cup of coffee uh, while you wait for this to render. Okay, we're back. I had my coffee. Uh, took out another two gall gallbladders. It uh, really takes quite a while to do the first one, but a uh, bit annoying, but there we go. So there we go, gender in my title, numbers on my Y label, and it found only two values, F and M. So, so many males, so many females here, and uh, it colored them indifferently because I asked it to use colors based on what it found. It found two, and this is, these are the default, default colors. The first one it chooses is a blue, and then this... Uh, Nasty looking yellow for the second one. Let's try a box plot. So again, uh, plot, it takes a data frame as an entry. On the x-axis, I want whatever you find in gender. So immediately you know it's going to find two things. And on the y column, I want age, but I want it to be a box plot this time. So geom.boxplot. And I'm going to just add a title called age difference between male and female. Now the second time you run a plot, it's going to be a, a bit quicker certainly won't be time to do a, a major surgery while you wait. And there you go, two beautifully rendered box plots. When you uh, look on the internet uh, you uh, uh, and search for Gadfly, you'll get all sorts of interesting information as to how to increase the gaps between these. It's all just extra arguments that you can put in there. So what did it do on the x-axis? It, well, it found only two types of uh, categorical entries in the gender column, female and male there. And uh, it took the age on the y-axis and it created a nice box plot for us there. Let's do a, den a kernel density estimate. Uh, so plot again data on the x-axis. I want the white cell count. So it's going to be this distribution of white cell counts. And color equals gender. Now it's going to find two entries, again M and F. So it's going to draw two density estimates for me there. So the density, and I'm going to call it that, if that doesn't make too much sense, look at the uh, look at the output. There we go. Because it found two types of uh, entries, it drew two graphs. So it's going, it's going to do male and female separately, and there we have a kernel density estimate of the distribution. And now remember, I took white cell count as a normal distribution uh, around, uh, around about 15 was somewhere there with a standard standard deviation and indeed uh, and I asked it to, to give me uh, 200 ra random variables from that and, it, the, and you can see beautifully these are kind of normally distributed uh, pattern that I do get there. Let's just look at um, white sock count according to the groups. Now remember there were groups A and B so this was going to look exactly the same, and it seems as if this time, because it's just random variables, there was a bit of a difference here between uh, groups uh, A and B. Let's just look at the CRP. Remember, I created that very awful distribution for CRP, and uh, this is for the whole. I didn't say color equals group, so it, it took all of them as one, and you see this very funny uh, distribution. The reason why I wanted to do that, now every time you run this, you're obviously going to get something different, 
uh, this being random, and I didn't seed it with the specific uh, initial values. So uh, you're going to get a different plot, but certainly you'd be, uh, you'd be a bit concerned just doing normal parametric analysis on a kind of distribution like this. Um, you're not going to be sure that indeed those CRPs came from a normal distribution or a normal uh, population parameter. So let's do something else. Let's do some point plots. So again, I'm taking my data frame as an entry on the x-axis I want, white cell count on the y entry, I want CRP. So it's going to take every single patient's entry and it's going to just do a scatter plot for us, in essence, to see if there's some uh, correlation there with white sock count and CRP. I'm giving it a title again, but this time I'm just going for points. Points. So we, all we're going to have now is, is just that. And look, because of that funny distribution I chose, this is what, this is what we end up with. Certainly, uh, certainly uh, um, because of the weird distribution I chose, that looks a bit awful. Anyway, so uh, let's do something else. Um, let's just do points again, and this time we can just see the distribution of CRP. Now, some of these values fall on top of each other, so that's why it doesn't look like we have 200 values here. So I asked on the x-axis, just find me the different things you find in group. Again, it found two categories, A and B, and it's just going to plot the actual CRP values that it found. So there were quite a few at 110, quite a few at 100, and, they, and it just plots it on top of each other. Unfortunately, I haven't found a way to do some jitter in these so that they, uh, the points can be spread out. You can actually see how many there are. Okay, let's create some sub-data frames. Remember, we, we did that. And let's call them something new. We, we now want to create two groups. So I'm going to call them group A and group B. So for group A, I'm going to take from the data frame data, I'm going to take the uh, column called group, and I only want entries that are equal to A. And then because there were only A and B, I could have said here equals B, but the other way to do it is not equals A. So again, the data data frame, the group column, where it doesn't find A in our, in our example here, it's just going to take all the Bs. So if I were to run those two, you'll see now these two data frames will only be for A and this one only for B. So it's just super selected all of those for me. So let's just do some statistical analysis and now uh, a look at that. Let's just first have a look. What was the mean of the white cell counts for the patients in group A? That was 14.7. Let's look at the standard deviation for uh, almost five, and that really is because uh, of the distribution I chose up there, and that is standard error of the mean. We can also just ask for 95% confidence interval, and uh, that is the hypothesis test uh, package I imported. It has this function called CI, confidence interval, one sample t-test, don't be too concerned about the name that was given there. So as this group uh, A is my data frame that just contains the patients from group A, and I want the 95% confidence intervals for their white cell count. And there we go, 13.7 to 15.9. Let's look how that compares to the, our group B patients. In this instance, the uh, mean white cell count was 15.2, the 15.3, uh, the uh, standard deviation there, the standard error of the mean, and the confidence intervals there, 14.3 to about 16.2. So let's compare these two. I can do a p-value that also comes from this package, from the hypothesis, hypothesis test package. p-value, equal variance t-test. If we look at the two standard deviations there, almost exactly the same, and I set it up that way, so I can use this parametric test uh, of equal variances. I want group A's white cell count, comma, group B's white cell count. And if I were to enter, you see the, a p-value of 0.5, so no significant difference there. Just to show if uh, they were not so, we could also do a main whitney u test. This is for interstate, see where the main whitney u came out. It came about 04, 0, 0 0.5 as well, I suppose you can round it off. Um, which just shows you, once again, I suppose this is not proof of it, just not one example like this, that the uh, non-parametric test is a little less sensitive than the, uh, than the parametric test, but don't use this example as an argument to say that that is always so. Let's just look, because I chose CRP so badly, um, that perhaps we should not use a parametric test there, main Whitney U on the CRP values between the two groups, but once again, you see that wasn't really significant at all either. So... 
I hope, uh, hope you learned something and see that you can do a bit of statistical and medical statistical analysis here, run through um, the packages that you would need to import, um, how the data frame works, created this uh, data frame uh, from scratch by these distributions. Again, in real life, you'll just import your, your Excel spreadsheet or your, your spreadsheet file, and you can do some pretty awesome graphing and some pretty awesome um, simple statistical analysis on your data. Good. So here we are in the second lecture. In the first one, I was really just interested to see whether I could do some basic medical statistics using Julia, and more specifically using some of the packages with which you can extend the base installation or base install of Julia. And I promised we'll look at one or two more of these uh, packages. And in this lecture, I just want to look at the distributions package. Remember in Julia, we use this keyword using to import a package. So I'm going to import distributions. Once again, we are in the Juno development environment instead of my usual uh, Jupyter notebooks. So for Juno, we just uh, hover over the end of a line of code there in the uh, Mac OS, which I'm here. I'm going to hold down command and hit return. On Windows and Linux, we're going to use the control key and hit enter. I do that. You can see the little animation at the bottom. It is busy importing the distributions package. Once it stops spinning, you'll get a little check mark there. It has been installed. Now, I'm also going to uh, uh, import here the Gatfly plotting library, plotting package. Now, if we've just started it up, once again, I warn you, it's going to take quite some time to do it. If uh, you've opened, uh, opened uh, Juno before or Julia before and you've already imported it during that session, obviously, it'll be a lot quicker. But this, I've just started up this computer now, so the first time I am going to import this Gadfly, it's going to take quite some time. And what I'll do, I'll uh, pause the video and come back when it's done. Uh, otherwise, it really is just a waste of time. You can see the spinning cubes at the bottom just indicating that it is busy importing that, uh, that package. And uh, I'll just pause the video and come back when it's done. Okay, we're back and Gadfly has indeed imported. The last thing I'm going to import is the markdown package. That's a small package that should go fairly quickly. Now I'm going to just again use markdown.pass and uh, just to print something nice to the screen using distributions in Julia. There we go. So the first thing we're going to do is just um, set a random seed value. So S rand. And I'm just going to use one, two, three. That means the first time that I run this code, if I open uh, this file and I run the code, I'm going to get the same random results every time. Now, before we use the package, I just want to show you that Julia has uh, a random num some random number commands. And the first one that we are going to use is RAND. I'm going to use it in a special way. I'm just going to ask it to choose a random value from a set of values which I give it. And so it's R-A-N-D, open and close parentheses, and I want to go from 1 till 10, inclusive, and in steps of a half. So I'm going to tell Julia that take the values 1, 1 and a half, 2, 2 and a half, 3, 3 and a half, up till 10, and give me any one of them. At random, give me one back. And it gives me back the value 2. 2 dot there, indicating that this is a floating point value. It's 2.0. I can do more than that. I can... Uh, suggest that I want more than one back and I'm going to add it to an array. So it's my computer variable. I'm calling it x underscore rand using underscores there in my variable names, probably a bit old fashioned there. Anyway, rand open and close parentheses. And inside of that, there are two arguments. One is the range that I wanted to use from one to a hundred in steps of a half. And instead of just giving me back one value, I want, now want 10 values. So I can introduce a comma, then 10 inside of this rand uh, command here. And if I hit there, I'm going to get this array back, which is called a vector here because it's, it will be a column of values. I can click on it and a tool will open for me. And then there are the numbers 17 and a half, 2, 20, 83, 21 and a half, 
all 10 of them chosen from this uh, range of values from 1 to 100 with a half value steps inclusive. Good, now let's use a random number. R-A-N-D-N. That's going to select a random number, not from the set that I give it, but from the standard normal distribution. Now remember, the standard normal distribution has a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. So if I just were to run the code, it gives me back 1.53. Once again, I can say, don't only give me back one of them, give me back 100 of them. And I add that to the computer variable. This time I've just called it x underscore randn. You can call it whatever you want. And there's my vector now containing 100 values, but taken from a standard normal distribution. Just to show you that it is a standard normal distribution, I'm going to plot the density the kernel density estimate or density estimate of these hundred values. So I'm going to use the plot command, which now comes straight from Gadfly. So I can just use plot uh, function there, method there. X equals my random numbers, and I'm using the density stat, the geometry I'm wishing is a line, and I'm giving my plot a, a name, the title, 100 values from random n. Once again, I'm going to run this code. I'll have to pause the video because the first time you plot something, it takes time. And there we go. We can clearly see this is from a normal, a standard normal distribution centered at zero. Most of our values are going to be there, trailing off to the side. And I asked for a hundred random values and it took those values, used the equation for a density estimate to draw that graph for me. Now let's just use instead of RANDN, let's just use the normal distribution as is. What we can do now, or I should say this is part of the distributions package. So I'm still going to say RAND, remember that was just going to give me back a random value and I could um, give it a range from which to take, but now inside of the parentheses there is something else I could say now, normal, and that takes two arguments, the mean and the standard deviation. And I've attached the two computer variable, this time I've called it x underscore norm, and I want a thousand of those. So rand still takes these two arguments. The first argument where before we gave the range, say from one to hundred and steps of a half, now I want instructing Julia, take the normal distribution, with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 20, construct that, and from that random variable distribution, give me a thousand values. Instantly done. And there is my 1000 values drawn from random normal variable distribution um, uh, with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 20. Now look at this Juno very nicely. I can hover over that 20 click on it and drag it left and right, left and right. I can uh, ask for different values and it'll update the vector. It'll update that vector. Let's just plot that. That should go a bit faster now. And there we go. That was almost instantaneous. Anyway, now you can see my density uh, estimate here is centered around a mean of 100 trailing off on both sides with a standard deviation of 20. Now, um, I perhaps can illustrate this a bit better with a histogram, and I will make a video just on the uh, on uh, Gadfly as well. But as you can see, there, this is a histogram. Most of the values were were around a uh, hundred there. Good. Let's go and do some descriptive statistics just on these, just to make sure that we are indeed dealing with a normal distribution, as if those plots weren't uh, proof enough. Anyway, we can ask for the mean and for the thousand that I got this time around, because remember I used the rand method there, just give me random values back, a thousand of them, but take them not from a range that I give you, but take it from the normal distribution there with those parameters. So indeed very close, my thousand values got there. Indeed a median would be close enough there as well. The maximum value I got was 172, the minimum was 37.69, the standard deviation very close to 20 as we asked, the square of that, which is the variance, 
And I can also get certain quantiles, the, the 50 percent, 50 per, 50th percentile, whichever way you want to want to say that, 80th, 80th, 95th, 99th. We can ask for the values there, and we're going to get it back as a vector. So the, that would be uh, the median anyway, the 50th. And indeed, there's the median up there, 99.552, 99.552, and you see the values go there. The length of the vector is just going to tell us how many values. Indeed, there was a thousand in it. We can ask for this thousand that we got, what the skewness is, and what the kurtosis is. It'll work that out for us very well. We can also fit an array of values to a distribution. And uh, here we can use the fit uh, command there. And uh, we say we want, uh, want it to... Uh, as a normal distribution and we give it our thousand values and it's going to tell us well that thousand that you have has a mean of 99.547 which we already knew and a standard deviation of 20.7 which is just what it grabbed there so fit is going to do that for you let's look at another distribution the binomial distribution now remember there's uh, two things to a uh, a couple of things to the binomial distribution. It, it by meaning two, um, you've got to have an outcome, uh, only two outcomes. And uh, the flip of a coin, for instance, is only heads or tails. And also, you must have the fact that every time you run the experiment, the previous outcome should not influence the current outcome. In other words, if I just flipped a coin and I flipped it again, the second flip is not determined by the outcome of the first flip. So, uh, I've got a little vignette here, a little story for you here. Let's imagine, uh, let's imagine that we do 30 cases of a certain procedure and the probability of a complication occurs in 2% of cases. Let's make it 0.02. Let's keep it there. So that complication, the patient either has a complication or they don't. So it is binomial. And we know from historical data that this complication occurs in 2% of these operative cases. So that, that occurrence of that complication would be a success. So don't look at the little uh, definition of the term success because you need to have a complication is not a success. But the, the outcome that we're looking for happens in 2%. That outcome, that 2% is our success rate. And we can now ask the following. So give me, I've used the computer variable name x underscore binom from the ra randomly select for me 500 cases, take it from a binomial distribution. And this binomial distribution says if I were to do something 30 times, so I, in, in the next 30 cases that I do, that's my n, my n value, and the probability of something occurring is only 2%. So use that distribution. And if I were to do these 30 with an incidence of success of only 2%, if I were to repeat this 500 times, tell me in each time what um, uh, the, the outcome is going to be. And there you, there you see it. If I do these 30 cases in a row, the first time I do the 30 cases, I got zero complications, zero success. The second time I did the 30 cases in a row, I got two complications, zero, zero, etc. So that would give us this kind of, if I could do a histogram of that, let's just go there, let's draw a histogram of that. And we see, well, indeed, it was much the probability or the likelihood of me having zero complications was pretty high if I only did 30 cases and, and my, my success rate or my complication rates only 2%. We can see that much better here with a density with a density estimate here, and indeed that is so, your highest likelihood is going to be to, in 30 cases, you only do 30 at a time, if I were to now report, if I were to do a trial and I only included 30 cases, if something occurred in only 2% of cases anyway, I had this highest probability of a net run of 30 to have no complications whatsoever, I had um, a smaller likelihood of having one and then two and three and it gets less and less and less as we go.
So that gives us an indication if I'm going to do a trial and I'm only going to include 30 patients and something occurs in such a small percentage of them, the highest likelihood was in the run of 30 that I was going to get nothing whatsoever. So those are two of the probabilities. There are many, many more. You see the website here. You can just go on there and there's a multitude of different uh, distributions that you can use. Here's one example of a continuous random variable and a discrete random variable I've shown you here. But the distribution package is much more than this. Does that? And it can also give you a univariate um, analysis, a multivariate, uh, uh, not analysis, univariate random variables, multivariable random variables, and even matrix variate uh, random variables. So, very powerful package indeed. And as you can see here, uh, very, very easy, easy to use inside of, uh, inside of Julia and just asking for some random variables from a certain distribution. Indeed, very easy to do, very powerful. In this series, we're going to take a closer look at the computer programming language called Julia. Now, here we are on the Julia homepage. You see the URL julialang.org, lang for language. You can read up all about Julia, uh, read the documentation, learn about it, all sorts of good information here. So why Julia? Indeed, there are many programming languages for you to get involved in. C, C++, C Sharp, I think would be most people's uh, start, uh, start when they look at computer languages. If you want something that's easy to learn and yet phenomenally powerful and can do website development, can do program development, can do scientific computing, Python is a phenomenal language to start getting involved in. Here though we're going to look at Julia. And uh, when you choose to get involved with a programming language, you really have to know what your goal is. So Julia really is for someone who wants to get involved in the future in some kind of scientific uh, computing. Anything that has to do with any kind of mathematical evaluations, uh, uh, Julia is well suited to. Julia is a very, very quick uh, uh, language. By quick, I mean uh, the code gets executed very rapidly, uh, as opposed to something uh, like Python or your other mathematical languages like uh, MATLAB or using, even using Mathematica, which can be quite slow. So Julia, you write the code, which is almost like writing English. It's almost as easy as Python itself. Uh, but it gets compiled into computer code, which is then rapidly executed by what is called a just-in-time compiler. All of those things you can learn about with time. This series, we're just going to get comfortable with the programming language called Julia. Now, the first place we're going to go to is the download section here. You can see the current release as of the making of this recording is version 0.3.11 and version 0.4 is under development. You can see here how to install Julia for Windows, for Mac OS, and then for, for either the Red Hat package managers or the Debian-based Linux operating systems. You can click on those, and we'll certainly look at how to install those. Once you've installed it, though, which we're not going to do right now, you can uh, either uh, install uh, your IPython, or what is now referred to as a Jupyter Notebook, because you need to write the code somewhere. You might have the language, but you've got to be able to write the code somewhere, and that is called a development environment. And the Jupyter Notebooks are phenomenal. You can do all sorts of other programming languages inside of these notebooks uh, these days. Uh, they are phenomenal, especially for the use of Python, and uh, we're going to... Uh, we can use Julia for that as well. Juno is a fantastic development environment, and we're going to look at Juno as well. For right now, though, I want to show you something called JuliaBox.org. It is a website that has Julia built in, so you don't have to download and install anything. It is fantastic. It makes use of what is called these iJulia notebooks. iJulia refers to a, a form of Julia that works inside of these Jupyter notebooks. The developing environment. Now, notebooks or Jupyter notebooks is all big words that you might know nothing about. What it refers to is, is this environment where you code right on into a web, web page. So if you download Jupyter notebooks uh, through a system like Anaconda or, or, or others, you're going to have it on your computer, but we're going to use the notebooks 
that live on the internet so we don't have to install anything juliabox.org we're going to click on that and there we go juliabox.org still in beta but actually it works quite beautifully so we're going to learn how to start coding in julia using this julia box it's very easy you just sign in with your google account if i hit click on that it's going to sign me in automatically because i've signed in before if that's the first time you do it a box is going to open up and you've got to put in your google username and password for this reason, I am using this, you can see on the top, I'm using the Google Chrome browser just because everything works properly better than perhaps the other operating systems and there's all sorts of technicalities involved there as well. So I haven't installed Julia at all, I did not have to install Julia. I'm going to run a Jupyter Notebook right inside of a active web page. I'm going to sign in there. It's going to take a little while just to sign me in. As I say, it's going to sign me in automatically. Uh, because uh, I've done so before if that's the first time you do it you'll have to have a Google account and you have to sign in with that Google account and this is what it looks like with time we're not going to go through the step of what each and every little thing means as we go along what is going to happen is we are you're going to learn how these things work by just using them all the time so this is what it looks like there's my little home button there which means it's a computer a directory just as on your hard drive but it lives in the cloud and I can store all sorts of sorts of things here on the right hand side we see I can start a new Julia notebook that is my computer file that I'm going to code Julia notebook version open 3.11 you see Julia the Julia box of, I've already made the new 0.4 development open and you can also use the, an older version of Python Python 2.0 suppose most people still use Python two but python's already gone into 3.4 almost going to 3.5 so a bit more advanced than that is but we are interested in the julia notebooks that is what we're going to do so we're going to start off with julia by not having to install anything we're going to use juliabox.org good we're back here in the julia box and you see the little home page there and you can see uh, I think it happened already right at the end of the next section it loaded my file structure so these are the files that I already have folders I should say that I already have on my Julia box it works just like a hard drive on your computer but it lives in the cloud and how you can make these little uh, folders or folders with inside of folders you just say new folder and Oh, server error, that's phenomenal. That's a good start. Let's try again, new folder. There we go. It makes, oh, it, it did it twice. So there was a little hiccup, no problems there. You don't have, when you create a new folder like that, you don't have the control over what you call the folder. But what we do have is the following. I can click on that and we see a little rename and delete button appears. Let's delete that folder, which happened twice. Now this folder, I'm gonna click on that and I'm going to rename that folder just call it a new folder new folder hit enter or return and there we have now we seem to have quite a bit of server errors at the moment it just might it's just a connection issue I'm just going to hit this little reload button there and there we go we see a new folder there I can click that one uh, my new folder there's another folder I made previously I can just delete both of those no problem another little error we just sync that now unfortunately that is how it seems to go this morning but certainly that's not the norm you shouldn't worry about these things at all the one folder that i've already created contains our first lesson there's the lectures on julia so if i click on that obviously that folder opens up i can see the folder structure and i can go back home or i'm in this folder now once i'm in this folder i can click new and start a new notebook so if i start a new notebook we see that this tab opens up and it's going to download from the internet a new clean notebook and this is what it looks like you can see the julia kernel starting up there please wait kernel is now ready we're going to write a julia file in julia version 0.3.11 so let's just get familiar with this up top here it says untitled once again i can click on that and say my new file so it just has a name so it's a file that lives there now and these are the code blocks inside of these little blocks i can write my code and i can execute my code so we'll learn what all of these are about one that you can look out for now is just the save button 
if you've written some lines of code it will just save that for you once again i seem to have a very uh, bad connection today it's not going to do much for me i'll uh, for the next bit of uh, these lessons i'll try to reboot the system these are where you write your lines of code very easy to see though this little drop down box each of these little cells can be either lines of code or lines of markdown we won't worry about these two markdown is where you just write normal text i can write a normal line of text there executed and it will look like a web page with nice text on it i can even format this text using either markdown or html normal html code that i can put into these little cells and i can have nice words in between my lines of code and this is what is referred to as a notebook this is a jupyter notebook running right inside i didn't have to install jupyter notebooks i did not have to install julia i'm running everything right here so in the next section we're going to start our first look at the actual language which is what you're here for here we are back in my folder structure we can see the home button there i'm inside of this folder the new file we've just created is right there but i'm going to show you lesson one now you can just start a new new folder a new uh, notebook there but i've already created one that we can use in lesson one let's open that up there we go took some time to load kernel starting please wait everything is installed let's go and these are all the things we're going to get up to now look at this this is what a notebook looks like i'm writing code but i'm also writing these little headers and subheaders and what you can see is even some text in between that have got bullet points in them it all looks very neat look at this this is what a notebook is the jupyter notebook and that is what makes scientific computing so exciting these days you can write a whole manuscript with your code right in between and these are all the things we're going to get up to when we look uh, at our first lesson we're going to just use julia as you can see as a giant calculator it is a scientific programming language a technical computer language and that is what we're going to start off with as opposed to the normal hello world so here's a line of a uh, cell code you can see these this faint line that appears and if i move across to this you see the faint line that cell of that code cell and you can see here that it was a markdown cell as opposed to a code cell so in, inside of a markdown i can write normal text but i can also give it a size by using using either markdown or html tags let's double click on this and there you see all i've done is used html tags open h1 heading one that's the largest font it will render for me close h1 the alternative is let's take those away i'm just going to go to the front there and use a markdown little shortcut called the hashtag see there it jumped already to h1 that's the largest kind of text that would be the same as h1 heading one now how do i execute that line of code because if i hit return or enter it's just going to jump to the next line let's hit the backspace i can do it in two ways i can either hit the play button there or if i'm in the cell i hold down the shift key on mac os keyboard i hit return on windows and linux i will just hit the enter key so i'm holding down shift hitting return and that line that cell of code executes beautifully let's double click on this one you see there are two hashtags that would be the same as h2 heading 2 so i can just go to the end and just close heading 2 there these are html tags many people are familiar with html tags i can execute the, the cell there there we go look at this it's even smaller and you guessed it it's three that's the would be akin to an uh, h3 so three little you can go up to six h6 uh, the smallest subheadings you can do let's just run that line of code so first off we're going to look at simple arithmetic just doing simple basic uh, uh, additions and subtractions we're going to move on to doing this through the built-in functions next up we're going to look at associations we can round off numbers we're going to calculate the greatest common divisor and the least common multiples 
we'll have a look at absolute values, some trigonometric functions, and they are all there, not just the ones I've listed here. We can calculate the sign of a value, and there's a few caveats there, something I just should make you aware of. We can use numer numeric comparisons where we compare values to each other. A lot about that. We're going to look at special powers. Those are your uh, square roots, your cube roots, and the uh, exponentials and logarithms we'll have a quick look at. I'll tell you quickly about all these special functions, complex numbers if you're interested in those, and we're going to talk a lot about plotting in future lectures, but I'm going to give you a brief look at how to plot some of these mathematical functions. So let's get the section started off by doing some simple arithmetic. We're going to do addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and powers by arithmetic operators. Just plus, minus, multiply, divide, and take a power. Now, if I click in this little cell here, you can see that it is a code cell. So I'm going to write code in there, but you can see I've got a bit of text there. As in Python with Julia, we can write these comments, comment lines, starting them off with this pound sign. I can even put a space there. Anything after that pound sign for that line, the Julia is going to ignore. It's not going to execute that code. So that's not markdown. That is just part of Julia itself. Same as with Python. All languages have their own little comment uh, key, uh, key, uh, keys there. This uh, here in Julia, we have the pound sign. The hashtag is just going to ignore that line of code. But let's go get going. 2 plus 2. I'm putting these spaces in just for visual effect. You don't have to put them in there. To execute this line, uh, the cell, I'm going to hold down Shift and Return or Shift and Enter. Or I can hit this little play button. Off we go and we see this. It gets exec executed and 2 plus 2 indeed is 4. 3 minus 4. What's that going to give us? Negative 1. As simple as that. Multiplication, 3 times 4, shift enter, that's 12. Multiplication, as with most languages, is this little star sign, shift 8 on most keyboards. Division is the forward slash sign, so I can say 12 divided by 4, and that's going to give me 3. One thing I want you just to notice, see, that was 12, but this is 3.0. There's a difference between those. This is an integer, this is a floating point value. We'll get to that uh, in future. And just... 2 to the power 4, so in case you know Python, and Python those will be double stars, but here in Julia we have this caret sign, shift 8, and I'm not putting in spaces there, although you could, just to remind myself visually that this is 2 to the power 4, and indeed we're going to get 16. So simple arithmetic, just using simple arithmetical operators. Next up, we're going to look at the use of functions to do these simple calculations for us. So we've seen how to do these simple calculations just using these operators, plus, minus, multiply, divide, and power. But we can also use functions to do that. So in this section, I'm going to look at the use of functions and we'll say something about fractions as well, because we haven't done that. Now, we're going to have a future, future lecture all about um, the types of data that we can use in Julia. But I want to show you just now, just a little sneak peek, type of. Type of. If I write that, and I open and close parentheses, and I just put in the value 3. What is the value 3? I'm going to hold down Shift and hit uh, the return or enter keys, and I see in 64. It's a 64-bit integer. As I say, we're going to have a whole lecture, a lesson, uh, just about types. So it's a 64-bit uh, integer. If I say 3.0, so I just went into that cell, just changed the line of code. I'm going to hold down Shift, Enter again. It will execute again. Now we see that's a 64-bit floating point value. But look at this. So we're going to look all, uh, all, all uh, at all kinds of types in, in future. But let's do this. Type of plus. In Julia, phenomenally so, this plus operator is also a function. 
it can also perform a function. Now remember from mathematics, the f of x equals x squared. That's a function. f is a function of x. Same in computer programming languages. There's this function. And it takes certain values. The f of x takes the argument x. That x is called an argument in computer science, whereas it will just be called a variable in mathematics. Now, uh, this is a, a function in its own right. So I can use it like this. I can say, as I would say, the f of x, I'm going to say the plus of something. Now, just let me go back. See, once I open the parentheses, it automatically closes it for me, puts the cursor in between, a bit of uh, text completion there. In, in the Jupyter Notebooks, it works really well. But I've got to give it some argument now. Now, arguments are separated by commas, and I want to add 2 plus 2, so I'm going to say 2 comma 2, not 2 plus 2. There's a function called plus, and I can actually just use a little plus sign instead of writing something like add or whatever. In Julia, it was coded that way that you can use the actual mathematical sign as a function. So look at that. If I execute that line of code, indeed, it is going to be 4. Now I can also add some more, 4 and 7, oh, let's just carry on, I'm just hitting keys on my keyboard there, it'll do all of those for me. Now, <coughs> you see it goes up there to 28, so it's just going to use all of these and it's just going to pass these arguments to the add function, the plus function, and it takes what that function does, it just adds all the arguments. Let's look at minus. I can still say 3, 4, and again I'm going to get my negative 1. No problem there. Multiplication, no problem there. 3 times 4 is 12. Division, I can also use division as a function. 12, 4, that's going to give me the 3.0. The power sign there, that's also 2, 4, that is 16. So no problem, I can use all these simple operators in in Julia as functions, passing some arguments to a function. Now just one more thing, the fractions. If I say 3 divided by 4, I'm going to get 0 0.7, but if I want to maintain that as a fraction, I can just use these double divide by signs. So I'm just putting in two forward slashes, and if I do that, it's going to maintain it as, instead of 0 0.75, it's going to maintain it as a fraction 3 over 4. So I'm going to show that I can calculate the numerator of 3 divided by 4. The numerator is 3, and the keyword there is num. Keyword for the denominator is dn, for denominator. 3 over 4, and that's going to return the 4. Julia's uh, quite clever in that it will even simplify fractions for you. 6 over 9 can be simplified to 2 over 3. Indeed, no problem. Look at this, another line of markdown. So if I click in there, that was code. If I click in this code cell, this cell, it is actually markdown. Let's just double click on it to see how I constructed that. So you can see for markdown, I can use these little plus signs. As long as there's a space afterwards before the line starts, that'll be seen as a little bullet point. And here you can see what is called LaTeX. Now LaTeX, it's spelled like latex. So LaTeX code just executes code in a PDF uh, in certain Office applications. If you have some uh, add-ons, it will render mathematical notation for you. So that's something you can learn how to do with time. And I hide them in between these little dollar signs, single dollar signs that will execute them in line. And even this value 1 here and this value 2 I'm rendering as LaTeX uh, images. Look also at something else here. You see these little stars on either side of a word that changes that text to italics. So you can just double click on that and you can very quickly learn something about LaTeX there and the use of some more markdown. That'll come with time. Beautiful bullet points there. I'm rendering fractions there. So that's not what I want you to see. I want you to see the fact that 5 divided by 3 is 1 and 2 thirds. So this 2 is the remainder. And indeed, we can do that. What is the remainder of 5 divided by 3? So that REM is a function. I'm passing arguments to that. And it's going to work out the fact that that is, that that is indeed a 2. Now, that is, I'm going to delete. Let's go to this line of code. I can get both that uh, solution to the division and the remainder by using diff rem. Diff rem. And we're going to have 
five. Uh, let's do the five and three again. And you see three goes into five once with a remainder of two. Excellent. You've learned all about functions now, how to use mathematical functions, and we've learned something about fractions as well and how to do divisions, calculating the division and the remainder. In the next section, we'll take a quick look at associations. Now remember the associative law, we can associate certain uh, parts of an, an expression and uh, for that to be executed first, the same happens in computer languages like Julia and I've just shown you here the order of operations. Now these are all little symbols that you'll be unfamiliar with, some of them we would be, there's our fraction and uh, at least there's the little carrot sign there for um, um, what to do with powers, if I double click on that you can see how that was constructed. What we're interested in is just this. Say, say for instance, we say uh, 2 minus 4 times 3. Of course, it's going to do 4 times 3. Multiplication comes before uh, subtraction, so that's going to be 12. And so that's 2 minus 12. And indeed, we get our answer there, negative 10. But we can force the issue by just simply putting our little parentheses around what we want to execute at first, times 3. So 2 minus 4 is negative 2, times 3 is going to be negative 6. So just forcing the associative law, just associating things so that we can force the order in which these uh, operations are executed. So similar to normal pen and paper mathematics. Let's just move to uh, the rounding of numbers. We can round to the nearest integer using the round function. So let's do a round. So we can call the round function 3.4. And that's going to round, of course, to the floating point value 3.0. It is only at values of 5 that it starts rounding up. So 3.5 is going to round up to 4. Now, what we can do is force the issue so that it always rounds towards positive infinity side and we can do that with a ceiling function c e i l so if i put in 3.001 normally that of course would round to three but i'm forcing the issue so that it rounds to positive infinity side so that's going to give me a four same with uh, ceiling on the negative number side so let's take negative 3.999 you know, that's going to, of course, round to negative 4, but I'm forcing it towards the positive infinity side of the real line. So that is going to go to negative 3. I can, f uh, I can force it to go to the floor side. Now, floor means uh, it's going to go towards negative infinity. So 3.999, which you can think rounds to 4. If I force the issue, it's going to go towards the negative infinity side. The, f uh, the same will go, for, uh, will go for, say, negative, negative 3.001 which is going to go to negative 4. We're forcing it in that, that direction. Uh, we can go a step further, and Julia, we can also force things towards the 0. And for that I use trunc, T-R-U-N-C. So if I use 3.999, that's going to go down to the 0 side, which is 3. But on the other hand, if I use the truncate or trunk, if I do negative 3.999, it's going to go towards the 0 side, which is going to be 3. Let's move on. I just want to show you greatest common divisor and least common multiple. Now, the greatest common divider, greatest common divider, there we go, that's a function. So let's take this example that I've put down there, 4, 8, 20. So it's going to look at what can we divide into all of those numbers that will leave us with a 0 re remainder with a zero remainder. Of course, I can divide one into each of those. One goes into four, four, uh, four times, one goes into eight, eight times, one goes into 20. So one would be a common divisor without any remainders, but I want the largest possible one. And it looks like four can go into itself, four can go into eight, and four go, can go into 20. So indeed, four is going to be my greatest common uh, divisor. The least common multiple, on the other hand, let's have a look at that. Least common multiple, Let's do the 3, the 5, oh, the 2, the 3, the 5, and the 10 I looked at. Now, it's going to take multiples of those. What are multiples of 2? 2, 4, 6, 8. Multiples of 3? Three, 3. 
6, 9, etc. 5, so it's 5, 10, 15, 10 is 10, 20, 30. So it's going to plot out all of those, all of those multiples, and it's going to see which one is the smallest common one amongst all of those. So let's have a look at that. It returns a 30. So for 2, we're going to 2, 4, 6, 8, 10 until we get to 30, 3, 6, 9, 12 until we get to 30, 5 until we get to 30, and then 10, 20, 30. So 10, of course, is going to play the huge role. So from 10, we'll go to, uh, we'll have to go to 20 because remember, 3 cannot go into 10 without a remainder. 20, 3, well, 3 can't go in there. 30, yes, they can all go into 30. That's going to be the smallest common multiple. So those uh, uh, greatest common divisor and least common multiple you can use to great effect in your calculations. Let's move on to absolute values. You can see there what the absolute value is. Let me just click on this code cell. You can see how I executed that. So it's LaTeX code, backslash left and upright, backslash right on upright there. So that just shows you it's going to do these absolute value signs for me there of negative 1, negative A equals A. So if you just look at that carefully, you'll see how LaTeX works. It's not difficult, and that gives me this beautiful mathematic uh, rendering of the notation there. So absolute ABS, that's the absolute value, say, of negative 10. That's going to return just 10. There's also the app squared, ABS 2, for app squared. So it's going to take the square of the absolute value. For, uh, for us, this is going to be 100. Moving on to trigonometric functions. And you see there how I constructed that. Uh, you can have a look at that. And there are indeed all the uh, trigonometric functions are there. I've just listed a few of them. So uh, just to introduce pi to you, so we can say what is the sine of pi. Now, what is the sine of pi? What is pi? It's 180 degrees. What do you expect to see? What is the sine? You might remember what the sine of pi is or the sine of 180 degrees. It's got to be zero. And if we execute this, we get something funny. Now, it says 1.22 times uh, 10 to the power negative 16. That is what it's saying, saying there. Now, this is peculiar to the fact that computers cannot really deal with uh, irrational numbers. It's going to truncate them somewhere. It's got to cut it off somewhere. It cannot uh, use uh, values uh, without end. I mean, pi has no end, the value pi. 3.1415926535, etc., etc., etc. It never stops. But the computer can't deal with that, so it's got to stop somewhere. And in this, uh, as I said, we're going to have a look at types. Uh, uh, in using pi as, as such, it is not the true value of pi. And when doing the sign of this value that it does hold for pi, uh, it's still within its limits to do that calculation of this definitive number. And uh, it's going to do its best, and it's going to throw out this value of 1.2 times 10 to the power negative 16, which you have to accept as being zero. That is just the way a computer works, and, and, and you have to live with that. Now, the next thing I want to show you is just you can force the fact that you want to deal with uh, degrees instead of uh, radians. So I can say sine, and I just can put a D at the end. So now if I do the sine of 180, 180 is really uh, a, a, an integer, so it's going to do that properly for me. That is a zero. And just in case you were wondering, you can also just very easily calculate the hypotenuse of a right angle triangle. If one side is 3, the other side is 4 of the right angle or orthogonal sides, it's going to work out the hypotenuse for us, which is very simply 5. One more thing for this uh, part of the lesson, I'm just going to show you how to use signs, the sign of a value. If it's a positive value, it's going to return plus 1. If it's a negative value, it's going to return negative 1. And if it's a 0, it's going to do that. So let's say, what is the sign of the sine of pi. So we know it's going to return a positive as opposed to a zero because of what we saw upstairs, that the sine of pi is not going to return a zero for us. But if we just simply said what is the sine of 180 degrees, but remember it's the sine in degrees, so we have to use the SIND function, that's going to return a zero for us because it is neither positive nor negative.
you know, numeric comparisons. That's actually quite a bit of fun in, in writing computer uh, code and writing loops and decision making trees. You're going to have to use comparisons all the time. And when you compare something to each other, you're either going to have a true or false uh, as a return. So this is called Boolean logic. Um, which is just going to look at whether things are equal or, or unequal, and with unequal we mean they're greater than or less than something else. So it's got to be countable in some way. And the first comparison is this equality comparison with double equal sign. So I can just say the following. 3 equals equals 3. So I'm not assigning 3 to 3. This is not an equation with the left-hand side or, or right-hand side when I put two equal signs there. This is asking a question, is the left-hand side equal to the right-hand side? And if I hit uh, shift enter, it returns a true. It is true that 3 equals 3. So I haven't assigned anything. I haven't written an equation there. I'm asking a question. Just as much as I can say, is 3 greater than 3? And that, of course, is going to return false for me. I can ask, is 3 greater than or equal to 3? So it's either got to be greater than or equal to. If either of those things, if either of those things are true, it will return a true value for me. Indeed, because it is equal. The less than, I can say is 3 less than 3. Of course, that is not so. But if I say is 3 less than or equal to 3, yes, indeed, it is equal. So it's one of those things are true. It's going to return that for me. I can also say is something not equal to. So 3 uh, not equal to 3. Of course it is, so that's going to return a false for me. So comparisons, you really, these type of comparisons come up in code all the time, and it's good uh, uh, to know about them. Now there are these special, uh, there are these special cases in, or special values in, in computer language, and Julia is no different. Specifically, uh, in Julia, we have this NAN, not a number. It's a, it's a type and uh, usually comes up when you have missing values. Say, for instance, in a, in, a, in a spreadsheet, you have missing values. That missing value, in amongst all other values, is not a number. It's just nothing. It's not, it's not empty, really. It's just, it's just not a number. And then we have positive infinity, of course, and negative infinity uh, as values. So let's look at this curious thing called not a number. Let's say type of what is this? What what kind of uh, you know what what kind of type is it? Well, we see it's a 64-bit floating point value. Now remember, floating points are decimals. As I said, we're going to get into what what uh, types are. But we see it's classified in Julia as a 64-bit float. Now we can ask the question: Is a not a number equal to? not a number. What do you think that is going to return? Well, it's going to return false. It can't, it can't evaluate these things because not a number is not a number. So how can you say that not a number is equal to not a number? It is not a number. It's impossible for the computer to evaluate that. I can also ask, is not a number larger than not a number? Again, that's going to return a false for me. Let's look at infinity. What is the type of infinity. Well, it's also a 64-bit floating point value, but infinity, now I'm going to show you, 64-bit uh, floats have a maximum and a minimum value uh, above which the computer can't deal with, and infinity is well beyond that. Infinity is, is something very special. Um, but it is classified as a 64-bit floating point system because the computer will have to deal with floating point values when it does calculations. So what if I add 1 to infinity? Let's do that. Infinity, oh, let's do this. I'm going to say infinity plus 1. Is that larger than infinity? And that is false. Remember, infinity is a very special mathematical um, concept, infinity. And adding more values to infinity doesn't make infinity bigger. It is the still infinity. So it really is not bigger than, or adding 1 to infinity is not really bigger than infinity, even though it is held as a floating point value, which actually, if you do add 1 to that, something should be happening there. We can very quickly just look at something else. Is infinity plus 1 less than infinity? No. And there's a little reason why I put that in, and we'll have a look at that later. If you add 1 to a maximum value, that a variable can hold or a type can hold, something funny happens. But in this case, 
understand that that infinity is a specific uh, mathematical entity and uh, uh, we, we really uh, uh, we really have to deal with it as a as a, a mathematical concept now we can also do logical tests using functions just as we had plus and minus and multiply and divide as functions we can also do that over here so we can compare va values um, but this time we have to use words so we can say is equal that is our little function is equal 3 comma 3 and indeed that is true they are I can ask if something is finite is finite now stupid example here I'm just going to pass an integer there is an integer finite indeed it's true it is it is really I can ask if something is infinite is infinite now is 3 infinite uh, definitely not that's going to return a false for me now what about NAND values I can say is NAND and let's put in a not a value and indeed that is true not a number is not a number now I just want to show you something very peculiar let's have 0 0.0 negative 0, 0.0 is that equal to 0 so here I'm just using the normal uh, boolean uh, comparison here and it's going to say that is true I just want to show you this though if I were to say if we were to say is equal and those same things let's have a negative 0, 0.0 and we have just a zero there uh, let's see what happens there that returns a false so we had it as true when we used the operators here but if we use a function it returns false now there's reasons why that was coded to do that you can create your own kind of comparisons you can write your own code to develop new ones and there's a reason why these had to be uh, separate uh, for reasons that we we needn't uh, really be concerned about here just for you to be cognizant of the fact that you are going to get true if you do this and for the same values you're going to get negative if you do that now uh, we used words but we could really also just do this 3 comma 3 so I can really just use those signs just as we did with plus and minus it's still going to be a function and in this instance it's going to return a true for us Let's have a look at how Julia just handles these special roots like square root, SQRT would be the function square root and the square root of 9 of course is the 3. We can also do cube roots. So let's say the cube root of 27 that's of course going to be 3 as well. We have the natural exponential the value E so I can say EXP now in uh, ex the value e to the power 1 is just going to be itself so this will be a way for us to see what the value is that uh, does hold 2.71828 etc etc so that's just e to the power and I can put in any power there I like if I want a more accuracy when x is near 0 in the co case of the exponent of x so that x minus 1 if, if say 0 minus 1 that's going to be negative 1 if I want to, for, well, Julia was written such that you can have more accuracy there if you didn't do that. If I were just to type in the exp of something that's very close to negative 1, in other words. So if I put 0 in there, 0 minus 1 is negative 1. Something very close to 0, not 0 exactly, I'm going to get a bit of, I'm going to get into a bit of a problem. So uh, it's not going to be that accurate. So for that reason, we have exp in 1 which if I put in now I, I mustn't put the 0 minus 1 the negative one in there I must put what the value of x would have been in there so say 0 0.0001 if I put in there I'm going to get a more accurate result now we have the log function which is the natural log so base e so if I were to put in there the uh, log of uh, 100 just to show you that it's not log base 10 that we're going to get back but we're getting back this log base e now I can specify the log that I want. Say I want log base 10, comma 100. So if I do two arguments there, I put the first one in, it's going to force the first value there to force the issue. It's going to be log base 10. And now we're going to get back 2 because 10 to the power 2 gives me 100. And you see here, there's also log 2 and log 10. These are special functions that will do log uh, base 2 and log base 10 without you having to specify 2 or 10. But doing it this way, you can specify any base. 
And just as we had uh, for something that's uh, accurate when you get close to, to x being 0 here, so 1 plus 0 0.0001, so the log, if I were to take the log of 1.00001, it's going to be slightly inaccurate uh, in, in, in its calculation. So I have this special function called log1p, and now I have to put in the value of x in there, so 0 0.0001. To that gets added 1, and it's that 1 plus 1 1.0001, which log, natural log I'm taking, and you get a much more, you get a, a, an accurate value there. Lastly, for this little section, there are numerous special functions, which you can just use. I've just listed a few here. The error function, the inverse of, um, the, the inverse function of the error function, or to the error function, the gamma function, the beta function. There, uh, there are many, many of them. If you're interested in advanced mathematics and eventually in this uh, series, we'll get to using some of them. We'll get to know some of the more common special functions, but there are indeed quite a few of them. Let's have a look at how Julia deals with complex numbers. Now, the complex number in Julia is... I m. So I can simply construct 2 plus 2 I m. So that's 2 plus 2 i. And uh, if we execute it, it's 2 plus 2 i. So that I m is Im imaginary number, the square root of negative 1. I can also construct it with a function called complex. So I can say uh, uh, complex uh, 2 comma 2, and that's going to give me the same complex number. Now I can ask what the real part is of a complex number 2 plus 2 i m. Of course the real part of that is 2 and the imaginary part I can ask for that as well plus 2 i m. And I see the imaginary part is this 2 just to show you if I made that into a 4. Of course the imaginary part is 4. I can ask for the complex conjugate c o n c o n j complex conjugate of 2 plus 2 i m now remember the complex conjugate we just take the imaginary part and we multiply it by negative 1 so that's going to become 2 minus 2 m if this was a minus of course it's very simple let's just do that as a minus it's going to become 2 plus 2 m so i take the imaginary part i multiply it by negative 1 and that is called the complex conjugate now the absolute value of a complex number I can do that. What's the absolute value of the complex number 2 plus 2 i m? And there you see. I'll give you a little clue if you don't know what the absolute value is. Let's put in sneakily a 3 and a 4. And that's going to return a 5. Because remember, we construct the complex numbers, or we can represent it on what is called the argand uh, diagram. That is just an x and a y axis, where the, where the y axis becomes the imaginary part. So if I were to draw a line from 0, 0.0 to the point 3,4, you can well imagine I can make a little triangle there, and that would be the hypotenuse. So it's the square root of the real part squared plus the, uh, the square root of the real part squared plus the imaginary part squared. So it's the square root of 3 squared plus 4 squared, and indeed that is just going to be 5. Uh, I can also just ask for it to be squared automatically. That means it removes the square root sign uh, of the hypotenuse by just using this, um, this 2, 3 plus 4 i m abs 2, and that's going to return the square of that 25. It can also do the angle for me in radians. Now that's called the argument. So once again, imagine it is on a plane, the, the, the point 3, comma 4. If I draw that line up from 0, 0 up to 3, comma 4, it's going to make an angle with the x axis, and that's called the argument. So I can say angle of 3 uh, plus 4 i m, and that's going to return in radians for me, that angle between the x-axis and this line. We can calculate the square root of negative 1 uh, doing this. So let's do that, the square root of, let's do that, the 1 i m, 1 i m. So that is just i, and remember what is i squared? i squared is negative 1, and if I take the square root of negative 1, I get i back, 0 plus 1i. So that was just how to calculate uh, the imaginary number. You cannot say the square root of negative 1. If I were to put in just negative 1 in there, you're going to return an error. It won't work. 
But if I if I cheat a little bit and I take uh, the imagined number squared, which is negative one, so I'm asking what is the square root of negative one, but I am classifying it as an imaginary number, it's going to evaluate the square root of that for me and now give me back the fact that the square root of negative one is just i, the imaginary number. In this section we're going to look at some plotting, just as a bit of fun. <coughs> now, Gatfly is a plotting library, actually a package. Now that's the way Julia works. You can use Julia to uh, add to the language, writing some program which extends the functionality. It's not part of the base uh, Julia itself. You have to import it and we use, do that using this command, using, using Gatfly. Now, I just want to go back to our start page here. If I go to this little uh, uh, section there, you're going to see Julia images pre-compiled packages. So uh, it's uh, already compiled inside of Julia Box. So when you import, it's going to be quite quick. When you render your first plot, though, it might still take long. Now, if you're running Julia off of your own computer, you've installed it. When you inst when you uh, import a package using this using command, it's going to take quite a bit of time. But if I execute this line of code, you see it's going to be quite rapid. Now we're going to get to how to do functions. So don't be too worried about this. I'm just using the function f of x and the function g of x being the sine of x and the cosine of x. So don't worry about it. We'll get, uh, get to how to construct this and how this works. Uh, plot itself, we're going to have a big look at Gatfly and how to plot all sorts of interesting things. We can just use this plot function. Now, it does not exist in Julia. It only exists because we imported Gatfly. We imported this package Gatfly. It takes these three arguments here. The first one you see is inside of these square brackets, it's very specifically so. Don't worry about it, we'll get to it. And these two values here is the range on the x-axis from negative 2 pi to positive 2 pi. So we're going to plot sine of x and cosine of x over those values. As you can see, the little star there, that cell is executing. And I warned you the first time that a plot is being rendered. Uh, it's going to take a long time, be even longer on your own, uh, doing, it, doing this on your own system. So uh, at least the importing of this package was quite quick using using uh, Julia Box, but uh, you'll see now that the rendering, all all the, the compilation of this uh, all this code and doing the render that takes quite a bit uh, quite a bit of time, and it's going to be a while before that plot appears. But there it, are, there it is. It was really worth the while. You can even zoom in a little bit once you've zoomed into it. You can actually drag it around a bit zoom out but beautifully there we see uh, we see the sine of x and the cosine of x from negative 2 pi to 2 pi and we see the graphs there f sub 1 f sub 2 because we haven't told it what to name these so it's just doing that all on its own there's another way to construct it i need, need uh, i needn't have constructed it just as two functions i can just inside of these square brackets say do for me the sine and the cosine uh, of pi and you see the second time this now renders a graph it's actually quite a bit quicker but that is really beautiful indeed and look it's right inside of your notebook so my notebook has nice text formatted text it has code it has graphs in it these notebooks really are phenomenal let's do x minus one cubed plus one let's just play with that so i'm going to create that uh, function called h it's going to take an argument x and this is what the function does. It takes a value x and it renders that for me. I can say now plot h from negative 5 to positive 5. If we ran that, we're going to get this beautiful uh, cubed uh, graph there. I can also do this. I can uh, don't need to put in a function there. I can say make this a function of x. But look, just be mindful for now. At the notation, it's this minus greater than sign. So it's just like a little arrow of 1 over x from negative 4 to positive 4. The reason why uh, I showed you this is not because of the construction of this, just to show this ugly little line up and down the middle. This is a hyperbole uh, 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 um, that should be on either side here, uh, but it does draw that. So it's a little bit of, little bit of an issue there. Uh, most computer algebra systems, plotting systems, are going to do that. So what we can do is let's just constrict ourselves, constrain ourselves, I should say, from 0 
to positive side. So we're only going to plot the positive axis there. And if we do that, we see that that line disappears here and we can see it's a hyperbola. Okay, we can just look at the error function, for instance. So I could have called this a function itself, called a function then, but I can just say x with this little arrow sign, the error function from negative 3 to positive 3, and we'll see this almost distribution function, the error function here, beautifully plotted. So that's just to whet the appetite a bit, the beautiful graphs that you can do in Julia, rendered right here in the notebook. So quite a bit of things we've gone through. I think you get a good understanding now of at least the mathematical capabilities, and we've really just touched on it. I mean, it gets a lot more uh, in-depth than this. But you've got a good feel for Julia, for the notebook itself, how beautiful the notebook is. It really is phenomenal. And how you can write your little cells, uh, code cells, and execute them. Uh, uh, we can write quite complex code, multiple lines of code inside of the cell, execute them, and it works beautifully. Here we are in lesson two, and we're going to look at types. We in Julia box, we in the folder that we created to uh, put our lesson files in. You can either download this file, which I'll make available, or you can just say new and create a new Julia notebook. So let's go into types, which is our second lesson. Once again, remember these are all cells. If I double click in the cell, first of all, you can see it is a markdown cell. And I've marked it as a, a heading one, the largest uh, type that can be uh, displayed in HTML code there. We'll look at the second cell there, my two little hashtags there, two little pound signs indicating this this is a heading two introduction so types variable types now i've written a few things here let's just go through them remember just as in uh, mathematics we have numerical values and they are of a certain type if i just have the value three i could call that an integer if i have a value three over four this fraction i can call that a rational number 0 0.75 now, the computer variables can also hold different types. That's how a computer uh, language is structured. Now, remember, it's actually the object that's inside of the variable that has the type, but we'll get to that. In computer jargon, specifically in Julia, these things are also called types. Now, every time we create a variable, uh, that variable holds something, and that something is of a type. Say, for instance, we were to say x equals 3, then the name of the variable is x, and it holds an integer value, which is 3 in this instance. Now, this value uh, that it holds is called an object in, in Julia, and all object, uh, everything that's held inside of, of, in, uh, of, of uh, variables in Julia is, are, are objects. Now, Julia has a dynamic type system. What does that mean? It means you don't have to explicitly declare a data type when you create a variable. Now, in uh, languages with what we call a static type system, you will have to do something like this. This comes from a different programming language. I would have to say integer x equals 3 in this semicolon to end that line of code. So I would have to declare that this variable is going to hold objects that are of an integer value. And here I've assigned the uh, one, ob one such object and I, I called it 3. You don't have to do that in, uh, in Julia, although you can, if you wanted to, you can declare a type. And sometimes this is quite good to do because it, 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 uh, when you declare a type, it holds that specific uh, area in your computer's memory and it makes for quite a bit of faster code execution. Now, the types that are available in Julia are formed in a, in a hierarchical stru structure. And uh, that's what we're going to have a look at next. So let's find uh, out a bit more about types. Now, there is a key word called type of. Type of and um, let's do that let's see what the type of three is the line of code executes the cell there executes and we say it we see it as a 64-bit integer a 64-bit integer 
Now let's do type of 3.0 that'll indicate something else that is a floating point, a 64 bit floating point. Let's carry on. Let's look at something else. What is the type of pi we had here in our example? And we see that's a math construct pi, a constructor with one method. So that's a bit odd, but we certainly will get into that. The same is going to go for something uh, uh, like a fraction here. Let's do that type of type of 3 over 4 and remember we hold down the shift key and hit to return on a Mac or hold down the shift key and hit uh, the enter key on Windows and uh, Linux and we see it says rational there of type integer 64 also constructor with one method let's carry on what about values such as this type of now we are going to get to strings anytime you write some text that has got to go into quotation marks and it's got to be double quotation marks in Julia. Julia makes use of double quotation marks. So if we just typed in the word Julia there and we see that is an ASCII string, a constructor with two methods. So you can play around with this, type in all sorts of things you want, uh, all sorts of values and Julia will tell you what type that is. Now before we sign off, I want to tell you about supertypes and subtypes. I mentioned that this is a hierarchical system. And we can find out what a type's parent is and what its children are. So let's look at float64. What is the supertype? What is the supertype of float60 of a float64? And for that we can write um, super <coughs> and we put float. Remember when we said 3.0, it said float64, float64, and we execute that and we see its parent called its supertype is floating point. So that means floating point must have you know, more than one, one, than, more than one uh, child. So float64 will just be one of the children. So let's look what the parent is of our floating point then. And this is how you can play around so that you can learn more about the the structure that's going on here. So let's say floating point and we execute that and we see well ooh, that's part of the real numbers. Let's see what the uh, let's see what the parent of real is. And we see that the parent of real is number. Uh, let's see what the parent of number is. Number and we see the parent of number is any. Now any is as high as it gets. Any is like the old great 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 grandfather of all of the types in 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 julia so from any it goes all the way down so if you don't declare uh, uh, the type of objects that a variable will hold it's going to default to any and then as you execute the code julia will figure out what type of object this is and uh, it will uh, it will it will put it into a bucket that holds that kind of object and that bucket is actually just a space in memory. Now, just as we had the parents there, we can also very quickly look at all the children. So I can look at what um, what uh, subtypes uh, we have here. So let's type in subtypes, subtypes, and let's put in any. Now, of course, any is going to have quite a few in it. Uh, it won't be able to list all of them here, but you can see you can see this these little uh, dot 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 there. So it means it's just showing us the the, the start and the end of this whole long list uh, of uh, children that any has. But let's look at number specifically because number we saw that uh, any was the parent of number. So let's look at the children of number itself. So subtypes of number. Let's see what kind of children it has. We see it is it, ha it only has four. Complex, dual four, dual and real. Let's look at the real. Uh, well, let's look at complex first of all. So subtypes and let's look at complex. And we see, well, that just stands all on its own. So complex there uh, um, stands on uh, stands on. Uh, 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 on its own there as far as the uh, bottom kind of of this hierarchical tree is concerned. Let's look at real. Subtypes of real. Let's have a look at that. And we see ooh, we get fixed point, floating point, integers, 
and we see uh, these others. Let's go down floating point. So let's say subtype subtype of floating point. Uh, floating point, see what I did there? I typed in FLOA and I hit the tab key and it shows me what it can do to finish that word off for me, code completion. And I just used my up and down arrow keys to the bottom one that selected, I hit tab, uh, uh, I hit enter or return and that finishes the line off for me. And I see we get big floats, float 16s, float 60, uh, 32s and float 64. And let's look at integer then. Uh, just an, as an example as well, let's see the subtypes of integer, integer, and we see we get big integer, boolean, char, that is, says, uh, that means character, a single character, A, B, C, signed and unsigned. So you can play around with this hierarchical tree and you can figure out quite a few things, how these types are put together. Now every type in Julia is one of two types. It's either abstract or concrete type. Now at the bottom of, of the hierarchy that we spoke about, we have the concrete types. And they are the ones that can hold an actual object. So something like real or any cannot really um, uh, have a, a specific object. I can't put an object in there. I've got to go right down to the bottom. And those types are called concrete types and they can hold objects. Now. Every, everyone, every type inherits something from its parent. That's a, a proper way to construct a programming language, and Julia works phenomenally well in that regard. Now, the abstract types that cannot be instantiated, and instantiate is just a fancy word. It just really means you can't create an instance of that type. I can't say, I can't say real x equals 43.58. I've got to go right down to the bottom. Float 64 equals 3.46758. Now, these types, what, what they are, these objects, they hold space in memory. Now, a, a computer has a finite memory uh, capacity. And we place these values inside of memory so that, we can, so that it can interact with a processing unit and we can do all sorts of things. But this allocation of space inside of the memory, that is really dependent on what type this object is. So something like an int 8 will hold much less memory than something much larger than, say, a 64-bit floating type, uh, 64-bit floating uh, type value. And we can find out what these minimum and maximums are by this type min and type max. So let's have a look. What is the type min of int 8, 8-bit uh, 8 integer? And we see it's negative 128, and the type max would be plus 128. So quite a small bit of memory will be held uh, for 8-bit integer values. And for that reason, I can't put uh, big values in there. I can't use something like uh, negative 130 will not fit inside of an 8-bit integer memory allocated into, or space allocated into memory. Let's go up, type max. Type max uh, 16, let's have a look at that. Um, no, I should not have said that. In 16, let's do that. And there we go, we see it's 32,767. So that's the maximum value in type min will be negative that. So within that range of values, I can, uh, I can place them inside of a 16-bit integer space inside of memory. Now, not only are there this whole variety of concrete uh, types and their parents, the, the abstract types, you can even create your own. And you can crea create both abstract and concrete types. Let's start by creating our very own abstract type. And we're going to use this abstract keyword, abstract, and let's call it abstract type 1. So we've given it a name, and it's going to be an abstract type. There we go, it's created. We've created our very own. Now, if we want to see what the super type is of something that we've just created, um, <coughs> let's say abstract type one, 
the one that we've created, if we don't call it anything, let me just not misspell it, if we don't uh, allocate it some way, it is going to have any. It's automatically just going to have its parent any. But I can uh, do something else. If I want to, it to inherit something from the number abstract types, I can do that. So I can create abstract. Let's call it abstract, abstract type 2. And I want that to have a parent number. And that would be what I do. It's the less than equal, less than sign, and the colon. So if I if I were to do that, I've created another abstract type, and it has a parent number, and it will inherit from uh, from its behavior from number. So let's just make sure. If I say super abstract type two, and execute that code cell, I see it has a parent number. Now let's com let's uh, create our own uh, concrete type. So that one's going to be at the bottom of something. And um, let's have a look at this. So I'm not going to use the keyword uh, concrete. I'm going to use the keyword type. So conc uh, and I'm going to call it whatever I want. I'm going to call it uh, concrete type one, as I've uh, uh, said there in the example. And it is going to have as its parent abstract type one which you remember its parent was just any now i can go further i can give it some fields so let's call this one field uh, one and i'm giving it a field now i can call this whatever i want i needn't have called it this but i'm going to say that field two must be an integer it must be an integer and we're just going to end so not only have i constructed this uh, uh, concrete type so I can actually make an instance of it and we're going to create an instance of it I'm also given these properties it's got these two properties that it can hold uh, field 1 and field 2 and field 2 must be an integer or something that be, can be converted to an integer so I can't put a string in there I can't write the words TWO2 that can't be converted to 2 but I can put in something like 2.0 because 2.0 can be converted to an in integer 2 I can't put in 2.1 because 2.1 cannot be converted to an in integer. And there we go. It says, uh, oh, let's have a look. Field 1, field 2. And it says there for me that the function argument names are not unique. Uh, it's a parent of abstract type 1, field 1, and I should call it field 2. So I can also not have these fields uh, obviously name the same thing. There we go. It's executed well. Now I can create an instance of, I can instantiate this type because it's a concrete type. So I'm going to say my variable 1 equals this concrete concrete type and um, 1. And remember I said I can pass these two arguments to it actually. So uh, let's say hi as I said there in the example and the other one's got to be, it has to be an integer or something that can be converted to an in integer. And uh, <coughs> concrete type, I see, I just named it concrete and not concrete type one. So there we go, we just have to keep things correct there. Now I can access those fields with this dot notation. So I can say var one dot uh, field one, field one, uh, field one, there we go. And it says it can it can return the value that's held in, inside of that field one, which is what I passed to it, which was just high. And um, um, since remember, since field one was never it was never uh, specified, I can actually put anything inside of there, and we can actually check that for this instance type of what is var one dot field one, and it says at this time I put in. A string. Now, uh, just in conclusion, there is a lot more to know about types, uh, really a lot, lot more. But we're going to come across many of these topics as we cover future lessons, and specifically when we start talking about arrays, which is coming up next, and functions, creating functions, we can create and use types inside uh, of, of, uh, of those functions to really speed up the execution and uh, write proper Julia uh, Julia Code.
In this lesson, we're going to look at flow control. Now think about Julia as a language in which you write lines of code and every line gets executed one after the other. You might want to write a piece of code though that you don't want every line to be executed. You want some lines to be skipped or you want some lines to be executed only under certain conditions. Now think about a little raft going down a river. The river forks and the raft can go down one of the forks and you can force it to go down one or the other. Uh, this is a very special kind of river because we can also have tiny little loops where the little raft just goes round and round. Now th this is all called flow control. We can control the flow of execution. And let's have a look what we're going to uh, see in this lesson. We're going to talk about the easiest one perhaps, uh, just... Uh, branching our code through ternary operators, executing something or, or not executing something, or at least executing something else, by a ternary operator boolean switches. We're going to have a look at the very useful if, else, if, else, end uh, conditions, the four end loops. Uh, we're going to have a look at compound expressions, and then while end loops. Let's start off with by looking at the ternary expressions. Now we're going to use what is called the ternary operator, and you can see there it is a question mark. Now, in this, uh, for this lesson, you'll see the code's already been written out. Uh, it's just that in some places we're going to get to multiple lines of code, and I don't want to have to type all of those and uh, waste some of your valuable time that way. So we're going to have the code here, uh, which you can work along with. So first of all, I'm going to create this variable called A. Computer variable is going to call, be called A. It's this little space in memory. And inside of it, I'm going to put a value, which is 10 at this moment, which is an integer. So if I run that line of code, what Julia will do in the notebook, it's going to print to the screen this output 10. Now here comes the ternary operator. And it works like this. First of all, there's my ternary operator. You see the question mark. And there's the colon. So what does it do? To the left of the ternary operator is the question that we ask. Is A larger than 10? Now, remember, A is just a computer variable. It holds a value. And at the moment, that value is 10. So the question there is really, is 10 larger than 10? Now, after the ternary operator is the two branches that the program can now take. So the first one is if this question is true, and then the colon. And what comes after the colon is what to do if the ternary operator returns a false so you can well imagine that this is false. 10 is not more than 10. It's actually equal to 10. So it's not going to execute this first lot. It's going to execute the second lot. At the moment, by this lot, I mean it's just a string of text. I can have, I could put anything in here. Some more code, code to be executed, etc. I'm just using a string here as an example. So let's run this line, this uh, cell of code. And indeed, it's no, it's not. That's what's executed. And it's just because it's a string. If I put other words in there, those words would have been printed. It's just that the second lot or the lot after the colon gets executed if this is false. So if I change this to A is larger than or equal to 10, well, 10 is equal to 10. So it's the first lot here, the yes it is string, that is going to be executed. And indeed it is. This is a different way of doing it. Um, I can write everything in one line, r equals 1 and s equals 2, so two computer variables, one called r, one called s, and each of them is going to contain an integer value with r uh, um, having the value 1 and s the value 2. I've put these the semicolon there just to write everything on one line, and the semicolon there is going to suppress the output to the screen. Look what happens. If I run that, we just see a change to 4. There was no, the, Q, the, the code was not written to screen. So here we have this print line statement, print ln. It's not particularly useful perhaps in the notebook, more useful in the REPL, in the terminal, uh, in a terminal window if you, if you run uh, Julia there. But again, whatever is in these little uh, brackets and the parentheses are going to be executed, or it's going to be printed at least, and it is a ternary operator that is going to be executed here. It asks, is R less than S? Of course it is, so it's going to print this first thing uh, to this to the screen if not it's going to print the second one and indeed one is less than two so we we know it's, it is less that is going to be executed and there we go just look at the difference though because it's print line it's printing it without the quotation marks whereas here it did print as quotation marks again as i say not a not a huge difference here in the in the notebook 
is r greater than s and of course no it's not going to be if i run that line of code um, just to show you here basically the print line output that gets rid of those quotation marks when it does print to the screen next up we're going to look at boolean switches So let's have a look at Boolean switches. We have these Boolean operators AND and OR. So that's this AND sign, which is uh, Shift 7 on most keyboards, and uh, Shift um, backslash on most keyboards for these two little upright signs. So let's use uh, these just an example so you can quickly see. I'm going to create the computer variable A. I'm going to put inside of it the integer value 7. And here I ask two questions on either side of this AND sign. And they, they've got to return either true or false. So is prime A, that's true. Is A equal to 7, that's also true. So they're both true. And if I, if I uh, execute that, that is true. So now, I've asked these questions on both sides, but they might be lines of execution of some function, etc., or the, the value that gets returned by a function. It needn't just be these straightforward questions that I'm asking. On the left-hand side here, is prime as a keyword. It just evaluates whether a value is a prime or not. Now, let's do this. A equals 9. Now, is prime A? Now, 9 is not a prime, so this is going to return false. And on the right-hand side, we're asking the question, is the value that's inside of A at the moment, is it 9? Yes, it is. So I'm going to have a false and a true. But they both have got to be true because that is an AND sign. So if we run this piece of code, it's going to return false because they both have to be true for us to return a true. That's opposed to the OR, which one or the other being true will give us a, a true return. So is prime A... Now, A is 7 at the moment, so that, that part is true, but A is 7 is definitely not equal to 9, so that part is false. But if I execute this, I am going to get a true, because one of the two is true. And it needn't just be this, the first one, because look at this. I can say A equals 7, so is A equal to 9? So this is false now, whereas the second part is true. But if I execute this line of code, again, it's going to return a true, because it's an OR sign. One OR the other, OR both. As long as one of them is true, it's going to return a true. And look at this again, a equals 9. It is not a prime, so it's a, it's a false on the side. And again, a, a true on that side. And the code executes to a true because either one of them, we only need one of them to be true. So those are Boolean switches. If we, uh, uh, in the next section of this lesson, we're going to take a look at the for loops. So let's have a look at for loops. Now these loops are phenomenal and they almost read like English sentences, quite easy to follow along. So they are constructed like this. Let's have a look. We have for and end. You've got to tell this little loop where to end things and it's going to run around and around. This is our little raft running around and around in the river. We create inside of this for loop a computer variable and this time I've called it I. I can call it whatever I like within reason. I can't use uh, Julia keywords and um, you know, can't use plus or minus signs in between, etc. Uh, but I've called it just i for i in 1 to 5. Now this 1 to 5, note there's no brackets around it, there's no square brackets, parentheses around it. So that makes this, and we'll look, have a look, closer look at this later, it's just a range object. It's just going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Print line we've seen before, it's just going to print a single line of text and what it's going to print is inside of these parentheses and at the moment it is the value that's inside of the computer variable called i and then end so we're going to run through this through this through this what this for loop does is it just evaluates whatever's there one to five so when it gets to five that's when we actually get to to the end of the of the code so the first time it runs through it's i is going to be one and it's going to print one it goes run to, through it again and because this is just a range object it's going to go to two all automatically you don't have to do anything but the inter integer value it jumps by an integer value let's run the code and you see a, uh, as you expect one two three four five to the screen this little tab that you see there julia does that automatically for you or at least the, the notebook here does 
if you write the for line and you hit enter, it does this little places this little tab to keep things nice for you, no issue. Now have a look at this. Now this one to five didn't have any brackets around it, but now I'm putting these square brackets around what happens here. And it's these strings, these and R and words separated by a comma. So these are three separate things and they just happen to be strings inside of this, these square brackets. And I'm saying for word in this print word, that's not print line, just print, comma, and this backslash T, that means that a tab, it's just going to leave a bit of space in between. I'm going to execute this line of code so you, just can, you can just see what happens. So there's this computer variable called word. Each time that it runs through, it's going to take the one, then the next one, then the next, next one. As you can see, it's these tab, R, tab, words. You can't see the last tab there. Now, we do this in, uh, in teaching com uh, computer language by using these words that make sense. I just want to show you, it doesn't really matter what you call this. I'm going to call it WRT. Don't know why, just did. WRT. Doesn't matter, it's not the word word, doesn't mean anything. It's just a computer variable that I came up with because if I ran this code again, exact same output. So it doesn't matter what it is. And this for loop is clever enough to see that these, this is a list of things actually called an array. And we'll look at uh, these kind of things in the upcoming lecture. And it's these three. And every time it's going to take one, then the next one, then the next one. The print is this. And I didn't say uh, a print line here because I wanted everything on the same line. If you just give it one string and there's no brackets around it, it's actually going to be clever enough to take each letter on its own. And again, I needn't have written letter there. I could have written any computer variable name there within, with it, that are within the rules. So it's J with a tab, U with a tab, L with a tab. And it just iterates through each of those characters. Now have a look at this. Now I'm iterating through something that's in within curly braces. So let's see what happens there. And I'm calling my variable stuff, just to show you that I can use any word there within the rules. So for stuff in this stuff that's inside this curly braces, a 10, a 20, the word 30, and the square root of 1600. Print line, and I wanted to print stuff. So whatever's in that computer variable stuff through that loop, then a tab, and then the type of stuff. That should be interesting. So we can see what 10, 20, 30, and square root of 1600 are and that's quite nice so this print line so each is going to go on a separate line 10 is a 64-bit integer 20 is a 64-bit integer 30 is a string and 40.0 is a 64-bit float now i want to show you something we created this, these computer variables first i called it word let's change it back to word just looks better it's good to write code so that the code makes sense but i just wanted to show you it's not the, the actual word itself. So I've created this variable called word. You have created a variable called letter. You have created a variable called stuff. But it's inside of a for loop. Now this is called the scope of a variable. Where does it exist? I just want to show you that if you create a variable inside of a loop like this, it does not, it ceases to exist outside of the loop. Unless, unless something, I'll tell you what that something is. So yeah, I want to show you that it doesn't exist because I'm going to say stuff and it's going to return an error. Now, I don't just say stuff here and hit shift enter or shift return because I know it's going to cause an error. And sometimes you might know that something's going to cause an error, but you don't want your code to stop executing because that's what happens when there's an error, it just stops it executing. And you don't want that. In, in those cases, put it inside of this try catch in statement. So try and then try something stuff. If I just write the variable, it's going to output what that variable is, but it doesn't exist. It's scope. It only exists inside of this for loop. If that returns an error, I catch that error and I put the error inside of a variable. And here I've called the variable X and I want to print two things. I print, want to print a line where I tell what is the type of it, the error. And then there's this keyword show error in standard output and then the error itself and end. So this is a try catch uh, sort of block of code that I am running. And just to show you, 
So print line, the type of the error, it's an undefined variable error because that variable does not exist. It only existed inside the loop. Once that loop was finished, it was wiped from memory. And this, the show error, standard output, the error is stuff not defined. So it's just the standard way. If, if ever you have code that you're worried that's not going to execute, place it here. Remember this little block of code. You can, this is pretty standard stuff. You can always have that in your code and put whatever you, you think might not work in there. And then the rest of your code can go outside of this. Now let, let's create stuff and put a string in it. I exist. If I just put stuff, it says I exist there. I just put stuff and it threw up an error, but I put it inside of this little try catch statement. So it's still, con if, if, if this happened, the code wouldn't stop executing, it would carry on. Now it exists. Now that it exists, I'm using it inside of the same for in loop there. Let's do the same thing. So it went 10, 20, 30, 40 with the types of, this is what we had before, but what is stuff now? Does it still not exist? Does it cease to exist because it was in this? No, it actually doesn't. Because it existed before, it has a scope that lives outside of, its scope is I exist outside of this for loop. It is an explicit variable. It was explicitly created before this for loop. And now if inside of a for loop, its value changes as it does. First it was I exist, then it was 10, then it was 20, then it was 30, then it was the square root of 1600 it will keep the last value that it had as it should. So that is just the scope of a variable inside of a for loop. Just to show you one more thing about for loops, uh, you can nest for loops inside of for loops. So I'm running an outside for loop where A just iterates from this range object from one to three. Inside of that is another for loop that goes from one to two. And then I want it to print line A and B. What do you think is going to happen? It's going to say a equals one, there's my one, b equals one, and then prints it to the screen, one and one, but it stays within this inner little loop, so now it's going to go one, two, before it exits that little loop and goes to the larger outside loops, now moves over to two, one, two, two, and then three, one, three, two. So you can nest many for loops inside of other for loops. So we've learned quite a bit here. We've learned about uh, iterating through a for loop, and iterating through different things, through a range object, through these lists of arrays of text, through single le through the letters of a single word, through this funny stuff that's all mixed up and jumbled of any type. And we've uh, printed to the screen the type thereof. We've shown you that uh, the scope of this variable inside of a loop is just internal to that. It ceases to exist outside. I showed you how to catch an error uh, so that your program doesn't stop running and a pretty standard output as to what to do to print it to the screen. And then to show you if once it exists outside of this, its scope is outside of just this little loop, it actually retains that value. And then lastly, how to nest little for loops inside of bigger loops. Mm -hmm. Let's have a look at this very simple if else, if else, end branching. Also reads almost just like English. So I'm going to create this computer variable. I'm going to call it value. Inside of it, I'm going to put an integer value and that being 10. So I write this if statement. The first line is going to evaluate something. If the value is less than 10, print this. It is less than 10, which of course it isn't. And if it returns a false, it jumps to the next line. Else if. And another else if, you can nest many else ifs in here, but it's going to go down one by one by one until it finds something that's true. If it does not find anything that's true, so the 10 is not less than 10, it skips all the lines of code until it gets to the next else if. If that one was true, it would actually do whatever's written after the else if and jump all the way to the end. If it's false, and indeed 10 is not more than 10, it just skips that line altogether and goes to the next else if, etc, etc, etc. So you can nest many else ifs in here. And then if all else fails, you can always have this last else and have it do something, just in case all of these, that first if and all the subsequent else ifs, if they're all 
uh, untrue, they all return a false. You can always have this last escape, which is just an else, and it'll print out. Once one of them are true, though, it's just going to execute that and then jump out anyway. So in this instance, they're all going to return false. So it's going to just jump to this very last one that says the value is 10 and uh, print that out, uh, print that as a line out to the screen. If one of them was true, though, if any one of these returned a true, it would execute that line of code in between the statements and then jump outside to this end. It won't carry on and it won't do the else either. It's just looking for the very first true statement that it finds, executes that line of code. If it finds nothing, it's going to execute whatever is in the else statement. Once again, you can also nest things in, in each other, but this continued uh, iterative use of else ifs can, uh, uh, can be pretty clear and make things quite easy. And you, can, uh, you can do quite a bit with it. In this section, I just want to show you that you can actually combine different types of loops inside of each other. Here I have a for loop and an if loop inside of it. So it's going to iterate from 1 to 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, between this for and end statements. And what it finds is this, this if evaluation. I have if I, this percentage sign 3, that means it's the remainder. Once I divide 3 into whatever is held in I, if that equals 0, so if I have no remainder, in other words, is this a multiple of 3, I have this continue statement in here. So I'm showing you two things here, actually. I have an if statement, an if question, really, inside of a for loop. So, of course, if I ask if this number is divisible by 3, if I can divide 3 into it with a 0 remainder, what should I do? So if I get to i equals 3, 3 divided by 3 is 1, and there's a 0 reminder, of course this is true, but the first iteration where i is just 1, this is going to return a false. What's going to happen if it is false? It is, has this continue in it, and it doesn't make much sense when you look at it the first time. Does it mean uh, continue, so it is, it's a false? Um, what is really continuing? And the only way to really understand it is to execute this line. So we see that we're skipping everything that is divisible by 3. 3 is skipped, 6 is skipped, and 9 is skipped. But the others are done. So what is happening here? Let's run it line by line. So for i, i is a computer variable in this range indicated from 1 to 10. So the first time we run through, let's have it equals 1. So if... 1 divided by 3 equals 0, and it's not, because 3 goes into 1 0 times with a remainder of 3. So this returns a false. It says continue, though. What is continuing? It means it is skipping. Because it's false, we're just continuing through this. And it prints that line out for us. If it returns a, a true here, this continue means we're skipping these lines. Because when, once we get to 3, 3 divided by 3 is 1 with the remainder of 0, so this is 2. This returns a 2, allowing this continue to be executed. And now this continue says, it actually, what you can see is there's almost there's a jump outside of all of this. It skips the rest of these lines now, this continue. Continue, please with the next iteration. Don't worry about going through the rest of the code and printing this line, printing 3 to the screen. Continue the loop, skipping the rest. I'm actually jumping. I'm continuing the for loop, jumping the rest of this. And you can see the beautiful execution there, skipping everything that is with which 3 can be divided. So two things, I'm, 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 I've got this if statement inside of a for loop, and you can clearly see what this continue does. It says continue with my for loop, basically. Skip the rest when this is true. When it's not, it doesn't skip. It actually runs through the rest of the code, and it prints that line out for me. In the next section, we're going to look at this weird term called comprehension.
In this section, we're going to look at comprehensions. Now, comprehension is not from the word comprehend to understand something. It actually just means generating stuff and collecting them somehow. So look at what we've done here. You see these square brackets. In a future lecture, we're going to look at what these brackets really mean. But I'm running this very compact form of the for loop. It says n for n in 1 to 5. So if I just had the for n in 1 to 5, it was going to loop through. You know, there's going to be an n statement, but it's going to loop through n is 1, n is 2, n is 3, n is 4, n is 5. But I've got this notation of n for n in, in this, uh, inside of this. And if I execute this, I'm going to have this variable called a. And it's going to be an array. An array is just a list of values, really. And that is why this is called list comprehension. Comprehension, I've generated five numbers. And I've placed it inside of this n value, which I've attached to this computer variable called a. Let's make a little bit more sense of it. I'm not going to call it a now. I'm not going to store it anywhere. I'm just going to have this list comprehension. So it's inside of these square brackets once again. And I'm going to say i cubed for i in negative 3 to 3. So it's going to take negative 3 is going to be my first. Negative 3 cubed is negative 27. Then negative 8. Negative 1, etc. Let's just see that that is executed. And again, it's a 7 element array as it goes from negative 3 to 3. There's 7 values that cubes every one. And I've generated. I've generated and I've collected some items. So that is called comprehension. Just to show you, if I say what is the type of this thing that I've just gotten back, and it is indeed an array. An array, we'll look at it in a future lecture, it's just this list of values. And there was my list. Now, just to show you what the curly braces does, I'm doing the same thing, i cubed for i in, and I'm just making it a bit shorter from negative 2 to 2. Let's see what the type of that is, because everything inside there, with these square brackets, was an integer what these curly braces are doing is just making all of the values from negative 27 to negative 28, it is attaching them to the type any. So that's the difference. Now I can combine things, and I can run a row within a row. So I've just called these rows and columns. So two things. Remember I said n for n in. Now I'm saying row comma column for row in comma column in. Let's see, let's see what's going to happen here. So it goes down the columns. Let me warn you like uh, of that first. So it's going to say for row in 1 to 3. So there's my 1. Then it jumps to the second one, the column, for which it will be 1. Now row 2, but we're still with column 1. Row 3, we're still with column 1. Then it goes to the 2 for the row. So uh, back to the row 1, I should say. And then only does it go over to column 2. So we're going to have 1, 2, 2, 2, 3, 2. And then in a row first, we're going to have 1, 3, 2, 3, 3, 3. So you can clearly see the order of execution of placing more than one variable in this list comprehension. Let's have a deeper look at that so you can see what comes after the other. Here I'm using the rand uh, keyword. It's going to generate, take a random value. And I've asked it to choose from value 0 to 9. And I want to place it in a 3 by 3 grid. Three rows, that's the first three, three columns, that's the second, and I'm attaching them to this computer variable called m. There we go. Every time you run this, it's going to give you different values because it'll be chosen at random. So I have 890176280. Now just to show you in what order this was done, that it is down the columns. Remember things have an index. That is the number where it's placed, and then an index is a, is a place if we run a race, someone comes first, someone comes second, someone comes third. That is our index where you are placed. And I can use this enumerate keyword. So I'm going to have this list comprehension i for i in enumerate m. Now what enumerate does is the following. I'm just going to run that line of code so you can see what it does. So it goes through the values. Enumerate is going to return for me the index and the actual values. You see the 8 there? There's the 8. It was placed in position number 1. The 9 is below, and that came in position number 2. So i for i, so it's a list comprehension. I'm going to generate this bunch of things, and I'm going to gather them together in an array. That's list comprehension. But the enumerate gives me 
the index and then the value just to show you that we're going down 890176 being values number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Let's, let's hit it home. Let's have a look at this. Now, I'm going to delete that because we needn't have that there. I'm going to have this computer variable called A, random value selected from 1 to 5, either 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and I want to make a list of 20 of those. So I'm creating this computer variable called A, and I'm putting in a 20 random values, each being between 1 and 5, 1 and 5, inclusive. I'm going to print to the screen this A. Now, the way that A is generated is, again, as an array. Don't worry about an array. We're going to have a look at this. And it's just going to pr print this whole list of 20 numbers for me. Now I'm going to have this create this computer variable called look for first. I can call it whatever I like. Look for first, and I'm attaching to that the integer value four, because I'm going to run this very special for loop with an if statement in the inside of it. But because enumerate here, remember first I had a range operator. I said for i in one to five. Enumerate returns two things for me: an index and then the value. I better have two computer variables because it does return enumerate returns two values. So the first value is the index. I've called that computer variable ix, and the first one is the second one is the actual value, the occurrence. I'm going to just call that currr. I could call it whatever. Now I'm going to have this if statement: if current currr at least equals equals look for first, and look for first is four. So it's going to iterate through all these values inside of A, which is generated there. It's going to say, is this 4? Is it a 4? If not, you know that if statement is not going to be executed because of this break statement. So I'm showing you a lot of things inside of this little code cell. We'll run through it. Let's run it. Uh, it perhaps it would make better sense. So there's my A, and I'm printing it to the screen. And there it is, 20 values between 1 and 5, 1 and 5, including. Now, what I want to do is I want to run through it one by one, and I do it through the enumerate, because the enumerate gives me two things back, an index, and I create a variable for that, and the actual value, I create a value for that. I'm looking at the actual value, and I'm asking, is it 4? If it is, it's going to print this line. Remember, if it's false, it just ends. The index of the first occurrence of the searched value, that's the string is going to print out for me if this is 2. And this is, we look at uh, strings uh, in the future, but if I put this little dollar sign in front of it, it's actually not going to print that text, but it's actually going to print the value inside of that variable. So I, it's a very nice way of putting values inside of strings. Is ix, then break. So look at this, 4 was an index number 2, and that's exactly what it prints out. The index of the first occurrence of the searched value 4 is index number 2. That is what I printed out there using those values, but then I used this break, because once it's found that I don't want it to go on in my if statement, I want this whole thing just to stop executing, because I only want that first occurrence of 4. Good, let's carry on. There's another way to do this iteration, and that is to do, remember, we had before when we created this, let's go up here, when it went through rows first and then to the columns, rows again to the second column, I can do it all in one go with using this zip command, zip keyword, for i in zip, 1 to 10, 101 to 110, 501 to 510 print i. So it's, what it does that, it doesn't go through one at a time, it goes through all of them at once. So we'll have 1, 101, 501, 2, 102, 502, and prints them as such. So that's what zip does. Now what happens if they're not of equal length? So I've made the first one a little bit shorter, so there's only 1 to 4, there's 5 elements there, and there's 5 elements there. Th what Julia will do is we'll just take the shortest one, even if the shortest one is in the second set or even if it's in the last set it's just going to take the shortest ones so a lot for you to look at you can rewatch this uh, section of list comprehension bit difficult to get used to but quite powerful Let's have a look at collecting values. Remember we used this before, we said for i in 1 to 5. 
what if I just said one to five, one colon five? It just gives me back this one to five. If I look at looked at the type of that, remember I called it a range. It's just a range, and it's very good just to iterate through things. But it is not the value. Actual values one, two, three, four, five. I can use list comprehension though to generate a list and place it somewhere. So here, remember, I'm generating this array of values one to five. So I can use this one to five, this range, this unit range, which I use as an iteration, but I can generate something for it using list comprehension. There's another way of collecting though, and that is called collecting, and that's just using the collect keyword. If I now say collect one to five, I'm going to get the exact same thing, a five element array of integers. So instead of doing list comprehension, I can also use collect. And that's very good for this kind of keyword. Yeah, I have permutations inside of this list of values. It's these square brackets, you've heard me call it arrays now. So I have this array of values one, two, three. And all the permutations is in what order can I place them. So I can execute that and it tells me it's going to give me an array. But it didn't actually tell me what they are. Yes, I've got to use list comprehension to get the actual list of things. I've got to generate it. But instead of using list comprehension, I'm just going to use the collect keyword here. So collect that, and now I see all the orders. 1, 2, 3, 1, 3, 2, 2, 1, 3, 2, 3, 1, or 3, 1, 2, and 3, 2, 1. So collect is, also, is almost like list comprehensions. I can also collect, generate and collect lists of values. Lastly, we're just going to do the while statement. It's just going to evaluate and continue to do something while something holds true. So computer variable, call it I, attach in, uh, to it the uh, integer value one. And now that it exists, remember the scope, so it exists outside of. So while I is less than or equal to five, do this. So it's going to loop through this up until this is no longer true. So the first time it runs through, it's one because I've given it the value one. So it takes this value outside, it takes it from outside, whereas with a for loop, I created it within that for loop. So while i is that, we're gonna print i, and the shorthand I want to show you for i equals i plus one, is just this i plus equals one. So remember, this is not algebra. When you write something like this, i equals i plus one, it's not algebra. If I take the i over to the left-hand side, it says zero equals one, that's not how a computer works. It's going to look at the right hand side of this equation and it's going to say well what is in i at the moment? Well it's one. I add to that another one which is two and now I attach that two inside of the computer variable. It's a little space in memory. It's not a real mathematical variable. And the shorthand of write, writing that many computer languages have this shorthand plus equals one means one equals i equals i plus one. If I put a minus there, it'll be i equals i minus 1. It's just a little shorthand, and as you can imagine, it's just going to execute and print 1 to 5. Once again, this i exists outside of that, and the last time it went through, remember i was 5, so it still allowed it through. It added 1 to that, which made it 6. It went around again, and now 6 was larger than 5, so it did not execute, it just exited but i now is 6, as you can see there. So that's it for flow control. A lot to get used to, but very powerful stuff to use inside of your code. Here we are in lesson 4, functions. We're in Julia Box. I've named my file functions04. I've run my first... Uh, cell of code here just checking that the kernel is loaded just using plus two and two and it gives me four everything is working now let's take our first look at functions they are very powerful and they're immensely useful uh, parts of code now there are different ways of of creating functions there are different types of syntax to use and i'm just not going to use a generic one at the start here as many books do to show you you know, how to construct or what is inside of a function. I want us to organically learn uh, you know, what to do with the functions and what functions are. 
the first one that we are going to use is uh, does really look like a mathematical function. You'll note here z or f of x and y equals x squared minus 3y. That's a mathematical function. Uh, two variables there, two independent variables giving us a third. Now, instead of calling these variables, we're going to call them arguments. Of course, in, in uh, most computer languages and in, in, in Julia as well, we're going to call these x and y, we're going to call them arguments. We can pass value to, values to those arguments, and depending on what we pass to it, we're going to get different values. So, what are we going to get up to? We're going to certainly discuss this single expression functions, that is the f of x that I showed you there, f of x and y at least. We're going to look at multiple expression functions. So those will be two different syntax uh, ways uh, of, of, of creating and using uh, functions. We're going to talk about optional arguments. We're going to talk about functions uh, with a, a variable number of arguments. Here in f and x and y, we've got two arguments. I'll show you how to do a lot more. We're going to pass arrays as function arguments. Because here with f of x and y, I can pass two single values, but I can pass arrays to those and get multiple answers back. We're going to look at type parameters, then a look at another uh, syntax called stabby functions and some do blocks. We're going to use functions as arguments. I don't don't uh, always just pass uh, normal values, string values, numbers, arrays, etc. as arguments. We can also pass a function as an argument. We're going to look at nested functions, functions inside of functions. And then we're going to get to the heart of the matter, the heart of how Julia sees and works with functions, and that's called multiple dispatch. Then just for a bit of fun, we'll look at some of the inbuilt functions, and you'll see most of what we do with Julia are just based on built-in functions, already coded inside the base of Julia. And then just for some more fun, it's, it's always good just to have a look at list comprehensions, and even here in the function uh, lesson. So first of all, we're going to start off with in the next section with single expression, expression functions and that will take that mathematical form. So let's start off by looking at our first uh, form of syntax. We're going to use the single expression functions. And you can see that it takes a very mathematical format. f of x and y. So that f is the name really of my function. And I'm passing two arguments to it, two variables we would say in mathematics. And it's going to output by using this equal sign x squared minus 3y. So Let's execute that, and we get f, that's my number, uh, my name of my function, and we see it's a genetic function with one method. Now, that method is all about multiple dispatch, and we're going to talk about that right at the end to really understand how Julia deals with, with functions. So, we have this name f, uh, that's our function name, and it takes two arguments. I needn't have called it f, I could have used a normal name. I could have said uh, function 001 doesn't matter, but I called it f, just to show this mathematical format that it takes. Now, let's pass two arguments to it, or two variables, as we would say in mathematics. But there we go, so two and one. Now, f takes two arguments, x and y. So the first one is going to take the value two, the second one is going to take the value one. So we're passing arguments to our functions inside of these placeholders that we have at the top. And if you think what the answer is going to be, well, two squared is four, Minus 3 times 1 is 3, so 4 minus 3 is just going to equal 1. Let's see if that is so. Indeed, we get the answer 1 back. Let's do it again. This time, we're going to create a new single expression, expression function. We're going to call it G. It takes one argument, and we're going to use the placeholder X. And it's going to return for us X squared. And if I call that uh, 3, 3 squared is 9. It's as simple as that. So it's a very shorthand form or syntax of uh, creating a function. I just give it a name, and then in parentheses, I'm just going to list with a comma all the arguments that it takes, and I'm going to use the equal sign, and just then an expression for what I want it to do. So that's single expression functions. Next up, we're going to look at multiple expression functions if we want to do a little bit more.
So we want to do a little bit more than just that single expression, just that single block of code that can be executed uh, as in the mathematical expression we saw before. But what if we want to do a little bit more? We've got to use a different syntax. And this is what we do. We're actually going to declare this block of code. We're going to declare this function. So we use this keyword function, and then we give it a name. I've called it MLTPL, for short for multiple any name except for keywords and a few other uh, normal Julia restrictions that you can't use but certainly ML TPL is no problem again it's going to take two arguments and I'm going to call them X and Y the first thing uh, that is going to happen when this function is called it's going to print a line and it's going to print a line that says the following in, inside of a string the first value is and then we have this dollar X sign this X refers to that X and this dollar refers to the fact that this is a placeholder. So we will look at strings in a different lesson. But uh, this is how you would use it most of the time, I think. Uh, so just putting in that placeholder and that dollar sign is an escape sign just to say, look, don't print that, but print the actual value that is inside of that variable. And then the second value is that, and which is the Y that comes from the value that's passed there. And then we have this backslash in combination and that is just shorthand for new line so it's just going to be like a enter key or the return key a carriage return and then we're going to have the dollar x again the value that's an x then this x which is this mul multiply i suppose in string format and then the value of y is colon and uh, end and then we see this return keyword and it's going to take the value that's in x and multiply it by the value that's in y and we end all functions have to be ended so this indentation that you see here that happens automatically here for me in i julia and you'll also note there's no colon that we put after that as we might do in other languages such as python uh, this is picked up by this inter by this interpreter itself uh, by i julia itself i should say uh, these indentations forming this block of code. So let's execute that. It gives us back this name. Remember before it gave us back the name f, but this time I've called it mltpl. And it says it's a generic function with one method. Again, method is all about multiple dispatch, and we're going to get to that. Now let's call this function by passing two arguments to it. Now I call the function, this function now lives in memory, and all of its methods actually. As I said, we'll get to that in multiple dispatch. We call it and we pass a value for x and a value for y. It's in that order. These are ordered arguments. x comes before y. The first thing that I pass is going to go into x. The second thing I pass after the comma is going to go into y. So let's see what happens. Just as we expect, we get this string and it says the first value is 3 and the second value is 4. So see that dollar $x sign and dollar $y sign. Those are placeholders. It passes the actual values to it. And then we see this 3 times 4 is... And that is what is returned. It returns the value that is x times y. And indeed that is 12. Now do we always need this return key? Let's see what happens if we omit that keyword. So here we have another function. I'm going to call it mltpl2. It takes two arguments, x and y. Now this x and y, it's, it's, it's just placeholder for, placeholders for what gets passed. So we're going to print another little string, and this time I'm just using blah, 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 multiply, doesn't matter. All I want to show is that x times y, there's no return. So let's see what happens now. It is a function, a generic function with one method, no problem. Let's call it and pass two values, blah, 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 multiply, again 12. So I didn't need that return keyword. But look at this. We go a bit crazy. I've got this new function, I'm calling it mltpl3. Again with two arguments, print more blah blah. Now I have x plus y and x times y. What's going to happen now? So don't be confused by using this name here, multiply or some shorthand for multiply. That was just my choice. I could call it anything within reason. But I'm passing two expressions. I've got two expressions here and I've got no return. What is going to happen? Again, it's a generic function with one method. But now let's see what happens. I'm passing a 3. 4, are we going to see 7 and a 12? No, we are not. This is what we're going to see. Blah, blah, more blah, blah, blah. And then we only see 12. 
So what Julia does is it will just automatically return this last line. It is going to ignore this. It lives somewhere, I suppose, but nothing can, nothing, you can't do anything with it. It's this last line. It will take this last line, which is x times y. Now, it needn't just be the one thing. Remember, it's, it was just one thing we did here in the last line. That's 12. We can actually do some more. Look at this new math function of mine, a and b. Print. So, again, these are just placeholders. Before we used x and y, note that I now use a and b. It's going to print. This function will return addition, subtraction, and multiplication of the values. And then my placeholders, a and b. And, again, this escape uh, backslash and to get the full stop there. And then I'm going to have a plus b, comma, a minus b, comma, a times b. Now, what's going to happen now? Because it's all on the same line. Is it just going to do the a times b? There's no return keyword because anything after the, the return will certainly be used. Let's see what happens. And I'm going to call it with 3 and 4. And there you see my string. This function will return addition, subtraction, and multiplication of the values 3 and 4. And I get this tuple back. A tuple with three values, 7, minus 1, and 12. And that becomes very useful. So first of all, we've learned that it is the last line, irrespective of there being commas in it, will be returned. Now, because there's three things that are returned, I can actually use three computer variables. I've named them ANS1, ANS2, ANS3, for I would say ANS1, 2, and 3. Call this math function with its two arguments. And there we have, we get the return of this string with its placeholders, 3 and 4, and the tuple that it returns. But... Now I can ask what was answer 1, and indeed answer 1 was 7, referring to the fact that I got a tuple back of three values. So if I do this kind of assignment, I'm going, this is going to be 7, this is going to be negative 1, and this is going to be 12. So it, it becomes a useful way of dealing, um, or, or of using functions. Now we've looked at two forms of syntax to create our functions. In the next section, we're going to concentrate a little bit more on these arguments. I'm going to show you how to deal with optional arguments and default values. So before we just pass two arguments, we called it x and y, we've called them a and b, but we can also pass these default values. So here I've got a new function called func, if you in C, <laughs> and it's A, B, and I put C equals 100. And what is my function going to do? It's going to print a line of text, which is we have, let's have that, we have the values A, B, and C, and those are placeholder text, so we're going to pass that. So let's call it, but we only call, we only add two arguments, 1 and 10. So the 1's going to go in the A, the 10's going to go in the B, but what's going to happen to the C, because it's going to try and print C to the screen, and then, as you might expect, it's going to take that default value that I added there. That's not to say that we can't change that default value. Here I'm going to use the same function, I'm going to call it, but I add 1, 2, and I add the third one called 3, which is certainly different from this default value that's 100. So let's see what happens when we execute that line of code. Certainly we have the values 1, 2, and 3. So that is very, very useful. So your someone who uses these functions can omit that C, as we did there, and the default value will be used. Now, what about keyword arguments to pass uh, this order problem? Because think about it now. I've only got three there. But what if I had multiple ones, and I want to use that function, but it's been a while since I've used that function. I can't remember this exact order that it was, because it is going to take that order. Now, that is where we get this very useful, very useful, um, very useful uh, format of, of keywords. Now, look at this function. Function, func2. As I say, the apologies, I have this very ridiculously long print statement here, but it'll make sense in a little bit. I don't know why I put it all in one line. Needn't have done that. Anyway, func2, a, b, c equals 100. So, I definitely, I have this ordered list, a, b, and c. Then I have the semicolon, and after the semicolon, I have more of, of these uh, default assigned arguments. But they are a bit different. I say P equals 100 and Q equals red. So I'm going to print this ridiculously long print statement, and I'm not going to go through it. You'll see what it actually prints, and then it's going to return A times B. Now let's just see what happens to these things. Now I'm going to call 
the function first of all just with two values because remember all of these c and p and q they have default values so that doesn't really matter i only need to pass these two since those are already assigned so i, I only have to do that i can't call it with one though because it'll tell me there's a problem you know what is the second value but certainly i do that now let's just see what this ridiculously long print statement had in it it had the first ordered argument value is three because three came first the second ordered argument is four the third ordered argument was optional, remember, it's there, C is 100. If you see a value of 100 here, you either passed a value of 100, so I could have said 3,4,100, or you omitted it, and indeed I get back 100 because I didn't put it in here, so it just used the default that was there. Let's see what happened to the keyword P. It took my value, 100, and to the keyword Q, well, it took the value red, which was there, so nothing spectacularly happened and oh yes let's also return something useful like multiplying 3 and 4 yielding 12 so that's my that's all of my print statements with the placeholders in it but you can see what happens if we don't now let's start playing now we've seen this before i can add something for c my ordered list a b and c so now instead of the 100 there i'm going to see 5 everything else stays the same now let's change p and instead of p being that 100 that it was i'm going to say p equals pi now what happens? Three is still three. Second one is still four. The fourth one we didn't add, which uh, the third one we didn't add, which was C, which had a default value of 100, so the 100 is still there. The P now changed to pi, 3.141, etc. The Q still stays red, and we're still multiplying three times four, and still 12. Now let's go for the Q. In the Q's place, I'm now going to put hello, and you can see that exactly what you would think would happen. And then instead of the C, there's a two. Okay. But these are keyword arguments, and that is what this whole section was about. We can swap them around. So P and Q needn't be in order. So I'm passing three. These, this is part of the ordered stuff, so it's got to be A, B, and C. But now I'm swapping P and Q around. Let's see what happens now. Still it works, because P is now Euler's number, 2.718, etc. And Q is now, it works, as we passed it there. But the order doesn't matter. So that's very beautiful for keywords. And those keywords came after... They came after the semicolon. So anything after the semicolon is does not require any kind of order to it. You can pass it in any kind of order. And if you don't use it at all, they do have these defaults. So that's beautiful. So in this last bit, let's go really, uh, let's go bananas, as I said, yeah. So we're going to say Q equals 2. So that came first. Then we have 3 and 4. And then we have a P. And then we have 2. So my order is now completely jumbled up, but Julia can handle that. This function can handle that. It saw Q. Now that's the thing. I have to, because it's a keyword, I have to use Q equals bananas. I could not just have said bananas because it would then accept that as the first, uh, 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 the value for the first argument A. So I've got to use the, the keyword's actual name, Q equals bananas. It'll then say three and four as part of my ordered sequence there so a would be three b would be four then it sees the p equals square root of three so again i have to use the keywords actual name and then this two is going to become c so let's run that and you see exactly uh, second time i've run it that's exactly what we're going to see printed to the screen so if you have this long list of arguments use those keywords remember that the keywords you you assign them with defaults but then and if you call them they have to have the name of that keyword passed as well and you can give them useful names so that you or someone who uses your code can remember what it stands for now in the next section we're going to look with functions with a var variable number of keywords so not just me listing how many they are but allowing any number up to an infinite number of arguments to be used that's up next <laughs>
a function that we're going to define. I'm calling it func3, if you uh, c3. And uh, I'm just using this word args. I could use anything I want, but dot, dot, dot. So there's my splat. And uh, my function is going to do something useful. It's going to use the print command, and it's going to say, I can tell you how many arguments you passed. And then the dollar sign, remember, that's a placeholder. And whatever value uh, Julia generates after this dollar sign, that's what's going to be passed, or whatever value is held in there. And I'm going to use this inbuilt length function, which is going to count, counts through a list. So it's going to tell me how many arguments I've passed, args there, and it's going to return that. So let's create this function. You see a generic function with a single method. Now let's call, just call it func3, and uh, we pass no arguments whatsoever. And as you can well imagine, it says, I can tell you how many argu arguments you passed, zero. So let's pass this uh, argument. So there's one, two, three, one, two, three, hundred thousand. So func uh, three, one hundred thousand, but that's just a single argument. So it's telling me I passed one argument. Let's pass a single string. And I say, well, there's still just a single one. Now let's pass two arguments. You can see they separated by a comma, Julia three comma three. Let's run that. And indeed we have two arguments. And uh, we see we don't even have to keep them of the same type. So I'm passing Julia is one in a million. And some uh, two of them at least are just uh, number values and the rest are strings. And certainly it just counts through, of the, through those with the length uh, inbuilt length function. And we see there are seven arguments. And uh, I just created them. I just passed them. Uh, and my function was originally created with these splats. With a splat, I should say. So let's get a, a bit, uh, show something a bit more interesting. I'm creating a new function here, and I pass uh, at a single, there is a single uh, argument, and I'm going to call that argument string array. And what is it going to do? It's going to create a new uh, variable inside of the function called string underscore items, and it's going to join, use the in inbuilt Julia function join, and join is going to take that string array, and it's going to concatenate it sort of, with this comma and this space and space. And it's going to return this print line I like, and then whatever was passed into the string items, remember, which was a join on this string array argument that I passed to the function food. Okay, let's see what happens. And I'm going to pass two arguments, but see here, I'm passing them as an array or a vector. Let's use the term array. So it's in these square brackets, and I have two two values there uh, in my array. So I'm calling this food function. Let's see what happens. And it says, I like Nutella and honey. So beautiful there. We see that it has joined the two arguments that I passed. Well, I actually passed a single argument, which was a an array, and it contained two values. So what happens if I forget these square brackets uh, of an array, so I'm going to forget these square brackets, and I'm just using a string, I'm just passing it a string, what is the join function going to do on a single string, well, you, as you might have guessed it, it's going to do this, n comma u comma t, okay, so that doesn't work, so to get around that, so that someone does not have to pass an, 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 an array, we use the ellipses, so I didn't use args here, I used the word strings, s, 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 strings, just to uh, sort of uh, joke about that this is a splat and I can pass any number of things. So if I were to now create this function and pass this single argument called Nutella, it, it keeps it all together. So that join function is now going to see what I've passed as just a single as a single argument and the join function is, uh, is not going to split the word up. But I can still do that, and now I can still pass more than one. Now it is going to be seen as three separate things. So I like Nutella honey and more Nutella. Good. Now, just for clarity's sake, we can uh, we can really do something else. I'm going to say A, B, and then use a splat. And let's just return printing the values for A, B, and S to the screen. Let's just see what happens there. So let's have this function argues and now look what happens so three and four and then i'm passing all of this other stuff five six seven eight and a string called julia and see what happens the rest is actually passed as this tuple 
So A was 3, B was 4, and then S, which was a splat, could take any number of, of values, but it treats it as this tuple with 5, 6, 7, 8, and Julia in there. So if I just call 3 and 4 and I pass nothing for the S, it's just going to return this empty tuple here. So let's have some uh, a, a lot of fun. So I've got the semicolon in this function of mine and then a splat. So this means that these are keywords. You can pass any number of keywords. Now remember the keywords, I'll just have to uh, give them a name now as I pass them. So let's call this fun function. And I'm going to say var1 is Julia, var2 is language, and val1 equals 3. And lo and behold, look what gets returned. This one uh, column array. And it's actually these uh, a collection of a key and its value. So the key was var1 and its value was Julia. Key var2 was var2 and, and its uh, value was, was uh, language. And the key 3 was val1 and its value was 3. So uh, more so, because I created them like this as a split, and I gave them my own names, they actually what, what are called symbols with this colon sign uh, in front. And uh, this becomes very useful, especially with databases, or at least some data sets. And we'll certainly have a look at these symbols in a future lecture. Okay, so we've learned what splat is and how to create a long list of functions in the next section we're just going to have a uh, quick look at flow control inside of a function, and then we're going to pass some arrays as function arguments. So a quick example of flow control inside of a function. So I've created a new function here, call it flow function, uh, flow func. And I am using a variable number of arguments by using these ellipses or splat. And what I'm going to do is say, print, I can tell you how many arguments you passed. I'm going to use this inbuilt Julia function length again, which is just going to count the number of arguments that are passed. And then remember, this is a new line character. And I'm going to have uh, this variable called i, and I'm going to set it i equals 1. And uh, it doesn't exist outside of my function. Because remember, it's here it's inside of a function. And now I have a for loop inside of a function. So I'm going to iterate over all the arguments that I've passed by using this for n in arguments. Then I'm going to print a line argument. And then i, remember, uh, i is uh, 1 at the moment. And uh, we pass a tab n. And remember that is going to go through these arguments one by one. And then a new line. And then we're going to uh, increment i by one. So i equals i plus one or shorthand i plus equals one. Then we're going to end our for loop and then we're going to end our function. So you see there's a little bit of a problem here with the indentation. It didn't indent quite properly in i Julia. It doesn't matter. It will still work. So let's run that function. Let's create that function. And now let's call it, and I'm going to pass uh, all of these uh, arguments again. Julia is one in a million. Two of them are values. The rest are strings. And look what it's done. So it says I can tell you how many arguments you've passed. There were seven. And then it's going to run through the for loop. So it's going to print argument, then i. Remember, i was one. And because it is looping through this n, so the first time it goes through, it'll be one. So the first argument was Julia. Now we increment i by 1, so the next time we run through, i is now 2, so it's going to print argument 2 to the screen. n is now incremented to 2, so that'll be the second argument that I passed, and so on. So, quite nice. Now though, let's pass some arrays as function arguments. So we've, we've created these functions, we've created these arguments, we've even created uh, keyword arguments, we've created... Uh, Use, use the splat to create an infinite number, possible infinite number of arguments. But what if I wanted to not pass a single value, but I wanted to pass a whole array? So let's create an array or column vector here by the fact that I create this computer variable called xvals. And these square brackets indicate the fact that it is an array. So it looks like I'm going from negative 3 to 3 and I'm incrementing by a half. So that's an array of values. Let's create, there we are, negative 3 to 3. Now let's create a function, and I'm going to call my function sqr, 
and it's going to take a single argument called a and it's going to return a squared uh, uh, and then end so it's a generic function with a single method now let's map let's use the map function that is one way to use uh, to use a function and then as an argument instead of passing a single value we pass a whole array so it's map then I call my function and I don't use uh, the uh, parentheses and then pass an argument I say comma and then so uh, and then the x value so I'm mapping the array to the function and there we go it's going to take every element and it's going to square so 3 becomes 9 uh, negative 3 becomes 9 and negative 2.5 becomes 6.25 etc now I've left this out but you can certainly do get fly to plot this and you'll see beautifully the x squared pattern that you will see now let's just have a look at something map is not always the best thing to do most uh, some of the functions least in 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 uh, in julia the inbuilt functions they have their own inbuilt mapping and i'm going to use this macro called at time which will tell me how much time it takes to execute this line of code and how much memory was used so uh, remember in some older text you will see uh, this using this 1.10,000 uh, with the square brackets that's really been deprecated we it, we now use in julia we use the collect syntax so i'm going to map the sign function and i'm going to do the sign function for, for values from 1 to 10,000 so the sign of 1 sign of 2 sign of 3 sign of 4 sign of 5 sign of 3 I'm going to go through that 10,000 times let's see what happens that took 0.03 seconds and it used 1.29 megabytes of memory now let's time it again but instead of mapping i'm just going to use the inbuilt so sign can map an array to it uh, uh, as part of an uh, its inbuilt ability and look at the difference now it only used 0. it only used 0. 0.009 seconds and only 361 kilobytes a lot less memory and a lot faster and a lot faster than uh, using the map function so maps not always ideal we also have this uh, problem when we part use arrays now remember the arrays the square brackets tuples uh, assist this list with these uh, parentheses if i have a function that takes two arguments and that it returns three times x plus two times y i cannot call that function h with an array or with a tuple i'm going to get an error when i do that now, one way to get uh, uh, around it is the apply function, but uh, that's been deprecated as well. We now rather use the splat or ellipses. So let's create our array three and four and our tuple three and four. Let's have that. And now I'll create our function h, which takes two arguments, three times x plus two times y. And instead of just passing that array or tuple as an argument, I use it as a splat. So h and array one splat and tuple one splat and you can see what happens. It's going to pass three to the x and four to the y. So that would be one easy way of passing these uh, arrays to a function. Now, except for numbers and characters or other plain data, values of arguments are passed by reference only and are not copied, as you can read there. They can therefore be altered. So let's have a look at this. I'm going to create this computer variable called array underscore primes. I'm going to pass it as an array by these square brackets. 1, 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, and 9. And we're going to have an argument as to whether 1 is a prime number or not. Certainly, Julia, it's not. But uh, we can have that argument elsewhere. So there's my array. A nine element array in a single column. They're all 64 bit integers. So let's create this function called add underscore ELE add element and I've got a single argument there A and it's going to use the internal uh, uh, the inbuilt Julia function push with this exclamation mark which means add to the end so it's going to take my argument and it's going to slob on 23 at the end that's what the push exclamation mark we'll use that term for now push exclamation mark does so let's run it and we pass to it the array of primes so I'm again passing an array to I'm passing an array to a function and look what happened the 23 was lobbed on at the back and that's permanent because if I call array primes now it's there it is still there okay so for now we've just 
pass these normal arguments or keyword arguments or split number of arguments but we can be much more precise in what type of arguments we want to allow we can control that and we call that using type parameters or a parametric method and that is up next Good, let's look at type parameters or the parametric method. Now it's certainly possible to limit a function to accepting only certain argument types. So look what I've done here. I've created a function called it m. It takes one argument called x, but I'm using these double colon signs and then int. What I'm saying is this argument must be a, uh, an integer. It's going to return three times x and then end. So let's do that. Let's call it m3 and it returns 9. Now let's make things a little bit more interesting. I'm going to have this uh, if else statement. So if x is more than or equal to 0, it returns 3 times x. If it is not uh, uh, more to or equal to, which really means it's less than 0, a negative number, it's going to return 3 times x. But still it must be, it must be uh, an integer. And I've called my function n, so let's do that. It's a generic function with one method, so I'm going to pass negative 3 to it, and lo and behold, it's going to return uh, a 9. Now let's just look at this method. Now for the first time, we'll talk about what this says. There was one method. I can use the inbuilt methods function and look at the methods, or the single method that this function n of mine has. And it says, look, it's got one, it's one method for generic function n, and that takes in this argument x and it's a 64-bit integer. So, it means if I pass m3,3 or should have said n3,3 or, or, or no, so that is not an integer, that is not an inter integer, that is not going to work. Now, let's have a look at this. This is a slightly different way of doing it. I'm going to use these parentheses and then the argument. So, I have this function arc underscore test. Now, t is what is normally used. It says less than colon real. So it means in our type hierarchy, it can be a real number or any of the subtypes of real. That is going to be our type. And I said x must be of that type. So this is just a long way of saying, well, x must be real or any of the subtypes of real. And I can return x, the value of x by this dollar is of type and then return the, the value that is in, in t. So if I do that, we're going to see uh, the following. If I just pass 3, it says 3 is of type integer 64. And if I say 3.3, .3, it's going to say, well, it's a 64-bit float, because float, both float and in integer are subtypes of the real type. If I pass uh, the uh, Euler's number, it says it's a 64-bit float. If I pass this pi, which is an inbuilt value, it says it's the irrational number pi. And 7... Uh, and I use this two backslashes, it says that's an rational number, it's an integer divided by an integer. And uh, just to remember, there is this inbuilt Julia function called type of, so I can just say type of 7 over, over 3, and it says it's a 64-bit integer, uh, both of them numerator and denominator as part of a rational, or Julia is just an ASCII string. Now, let's play around a little bit more. I can... Uh, uh, do the following. I can say, look, I'm going to have this argument, uh, this type uh, of my argument called T, and there's two arguments, A and B, and they must both be T. So I'm, I haven't specified what T must be, but what I've done here is as long as they are the same. I'm going to use the inbuilt function called plus, and it's going to add A and B. So let's run that. And what I've done there is I've added two imaginary, uh, or, or two... Um, imaginary uh, or complex numbers here, 2 plus 3 plus the imaginary number i, uh, 3 times i, and 1 plus 0 i. So this is just 1, but I am using the imaginary number there, so I am, these two are of the same type, and that will work. So if I just use 2 plus 3 uh, i am and 1, that would return this error to say they, they don't match. The, the type of the two arguments do not match. So we're getting to start to understand what this method is all about, and that is where the real power uh, of Julia is, as far as functions go, and we're working up towards that. But first of all, we're going to look at stabby functions, 
and do blocks. Stabby functions and do blocks. So these are called stabby lambda functions, or also just lambda functions, and they're really quick and dirty ones. Uh, and they're part of, um, uh, or they're an example at least of anonymous functions. Anonymous in that they don't really have a name, so you can't really call them. And uh, we can extend their use by these do blocks, which are also really a form of anonymous functions. What are stabby functions? Let's have a look. They use this minus and greater than sign, hence the, I suppose, the stabby. <laughs> and anyway, here we have x and then this stabby notation. That's a minus and greater than sign. 2x squared plus 3x minus 2. Now, how do we use that? Well, quite easy. We use it with this map function. Let's run that block of code. Now, let's use this map function. So I'm saying map. And then the map inbuilt function, I'm passing an argument to it. The first argument is this stabby function. And I suppose we can read it as x such that x uh, 2x squared plus 3x minus 2. And I'm passing it uh, an array here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So it's going to iterate through all of these, put it into x, and calculate this little expression. And there we go. So 2 times 1 is 2, 2 squared is 4, uh, well, it's going to do that, so, sorry, 1 squared, uh, 1 squared is 1, 2 times 1 is 2, plus 3 is 5, minus 2 is 3, and there we get the 3. But we can also write it slightly differently, so I'm going to map, again with our map function, then the array, and then do x, and uh, there is my little stabby function there just a different notation. You can see that it's going to do exactly the same thing. So, we can do a little bit more. Let's map. I've got 3, 6, 9, 10, 11 here. Do x. And instead of just uh, using my stabby function there, I can use this do as a function all on its own in that I have an if else, uh, if else, if else statement in here. So, if mod x, 3, so x means it's going to iterate through these 3, 6, 9, 11. Mod x comma 3, that means divide 3 into x. And what is the remainder? So if the remainder is 0, I want you to take whatever value is in x at the moment, multiply by 100. Else if, if the mod is 3, so in other words, so for instance, it's 11. Uh, 11 goes into 3 3 times. And what is left? 2 is left. So then we're going to do two and, uh, 200 times x. And if it is 3, so again, 11 divided by 3, that's 3 with a remainder of 2. If it finds that to be true, it's going to execute that line of code. So quite a simple do block, do some do blocks there. And once again, it's a map function, so it gets called. And indeed, we get the 300, because that's just the remainder of, of dividing 3 into 3. Is There's a 0 remainder, so that's going to multiply the 3 by 100. And for instance, this last one, 11 times 300 is going to give me 3300 down there. So stabby functions, if you really just need to run, uh, I suppose, to map, uh, very easy to map an array uh, through a function, and usually a mathematical function as we had here. Good, so in the next section, we're going to have a look at functions as arguments. Now we can also pass a whole function as an argument. Instead of just an argument with a value or using our ellipsis to pass multiple ones, to pass keyword arguments, I can just pass a whole function as an argument. So let's have a function here, call it string underscore func, takes an argument, which I call s, and what it does is it takes that value of s and puts it into this variable called string and then it prints, I love string. Now I have a second function called luv, and I'm not specifying anything in there. There's no argument specified there, but it just returns the string called Julia. If I now call string func and love, so this luv is a function. So that is a function passed as a argument. So when I call this function string func, that's it up there. It's going to do that. And uh, it's going to look for what the argument was. And this argument was love. 
it'll then execute that love which just returns Julia which is actually just putting Julia inside of the string of mine and if I print that string it should just say um, it should just say I love Julia and off we go I love Julia so I've passed a function as an argument we can also nest functions let's have a quick look at that so uh, other than it just being an argument in a function I can put a function inside of a function so here we have our function called nest let's just get there we have our function called nest pass a single argument x and it takes whatever that value of x is multiplies it by 3 puts it in this computer variable z now there's another function which takes this value z and it also multiplies it by 3 and and then we just uh, output this uh, inside nest z so what's what's going to happen here let's just run this this is run this and pass nest 5 you see the answer is 45 so what happened here we called nest nest is up there it was 5 it multiplied 5 times 3 which is now 15 as a z and then you see down here we call inside nest so this is just a function that has been uh, declared here so it's not going to run that block of code of the function unless we call it so here we call it inside nest with z which is now 15 now it runs this function and it takes that 15 as an argument multiplies it by 3 and we get out 45 hence we get the 45 so remember I can put a function inside of a function but I'm just declaring that function here it's not going to run automatically I've got to call that function and as you can see we've called it after declaring the function itself next up we get to the heart of functions in Julia and that is all about the methods that uh, associate with a function and we're going to refer to the term multiple dispatch So a multiple dispatch. What really happens when we call a function? Well, actually a whole bunch of them are created. Not just a single function. We declare function, function, give it a name, uh, tell about the arguments, but there's actually quite a few of them get created. And each one of them has to do with the data type, the type of the argument that you pass, the type of the value that goes into the argument. So a whole lookup table gets created with every function stored with the function. And when you generate code with an argument, Julia will look at what the type is of that argument. Now it's only for the ordered arguments, only going to do that. And it will decide which one of the functions to use. And those are called which one of the methods of the function to use. So when I create this function CB, uh, CBD for cube, for instance, A, and it returns A cube, I can pass anything into that A, I can post, post an integer and a float and each one of those are actually a different function so there's a whole family of these little functions that are the different implementations of that function and these are really called methods so when I call this function set functions with an integer that Julia will generate code that uses the computer's uh, central processing unit's uh, integer multiplication instruction set uh, or the for the floating point value the floating point multiplication instruction set specific to that computer and um, the implementation of of a function based on arguments that is what is called multiple dispatch and you see it prominently on the Julia's uh, web page on the front page there functions with multiple dispatch so again remember it's only for the positional arguments that it's going to do that lookup of which method to use and when I use that function again and I use different uh, different data type, uh, a new method will be called and that process is called overloading. So let's look at the methods that can be called for the plus function. And again, I can just use the code methods and pass the argument plus. It'll take a while. Look, booleans, two booleans, an abstract float in a boolean, an integer and an integer. So these are all different methods for that plus function. Good. So I can make use of this plus and two and that because the, it's a real number and a complex number and that is one of the defined methods for the plus function. 
If I put plus and I put two strings there though, that won't work because that method is not defined for the plus function. Strangely enough, it is though for the multiplication uh, function that is one of the methods does take a string and a string and it's just going to concatenate them. I love Nutella, just like that. Now we can also do something else. We can we can uh, we can um, call a function and we're going to see which method is used and we use this macro at which. So it's a multiplication two and two. These are two booleans. So we can clearly, well, we can guess at what which of the methods of this multiplication function is going to be used in this instance. Two and two. Those are both booleans. So x is a boolean and y is of type boolean. I can also ask what functions have integers as at least one of their at least one of their methods. And that's going to take a while because there are many inbuilt Julia functions and. Uh, 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 quite a few of them, so I would uh, suspect uh, almost, uh, most of them at least will have an in integer in them. And we see 730 element arrays take integers as one of the methods. So that's beautiful. So how can you use that? It's very powerful because you can constrain, put some constraints on your function. So I'm going to create this function, my underscore func, and you see I've created it one, two, three, four times here. And every time it's a function with an end, and it returns something. It's the same name though, but it means I'm going to, it's, it's an overloading really. I'm, 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 I'm using multiple dispatch to create multiple methods of this function so that when I pass these as arguments, there is a method for that. So if I just write a comma b, that is generic and it really implies that master uh, type called any. So any of the subtypes of any can be passed and if if Julia finds that when I call this function for my two arguments, it's going to just return this print function generic case. I'm doing uh, my func again, and I'm going to say A is a real number, B is a real number, and then it'll say both arguments are real numbers. A is real, just comma B, B is then any, or A and B, uh, B being real, A being any. So let's run that. Let's run that, and let's pass two numbers, my func pi comma three, my func pi comma three, let's do that. And it says both arguments are indeed numbers. So that came from here. Both arguments are numbers because they're both real. It's going to find whatever is more appropriate. So they are both real is a subtype of any, but real is like the first hurdle that it gets to. So that's what it's going to return. If I return this, which is a number, and uh, Julia, which is just a string, it says the first argument is a number. And that's what it did here. It said A is, is real and B could have been any and string is a subtype of any. So that's the closest method or the method that was used to execute the calling of that function. And uh, if I pass Julia and then exponent one, it says the second argument is a number. I love Julia. Now I did not have a method that was string string, but I do have this generic case where it could be anything and string is definitely, or ASCII string is a subtype of any. So it was going to use the generic case. And now for this, if I just look at the method, it says it's a generic function, my func with four methods. Remember, we've always just seen generic function with one method. Now you know what it's all about. Now, usually we just pass some uh, ordered arguments and it was just any because we didn't specify, that's how we landed up with one method. But here we've created this function and it actually has, we have created four methods for it. That is lovely. Now, let's just look at a few inbuilt Julia functions, functions just, for, for, uh, just for pleasure. And we've, we've done it before. I use it every time. Plus is a function, so I needn't write two plus two. I can call the function plus and I can pass two arguments to it. We've seen We've seen uh, what that is. And just to prove the fact, I can ask, what is the type of plus? Indeed, it is just a function. Filter is another nice function to use. Just show you, oh, there are so many. Let me touch on one or two here. Filter. I is now the stabby function. And it's just going to filter for is even. Is even is also, is also a... Uh, an inbuilt function. It's just going to test if a value that's passed to it is even. And I'm going to pass to it to this filter. Now remember the filter is just going to return booleans. So yes or no. And then if it is true, uh, I should say true or false. If it is true, then it's going to return that value that's held in I. 
and that takes the stabby function and the second argument which is my array my array is from 1 to 20. so it's going to go 1 it's going to ask is it even it's going to return a false because it's not even and that gets ignored when it gets to 2 it says is even yes it's true and the filter will then let it through so as you can well imagine it's just going to return for me 2468 until 20. Find an is prime is to another very useful one. So I'm going to define this function called prime underscore numbers. I'm going to say uh, it, it should be of type uh, integer or any of integer subtypes uh, such that I have this argument a which is an array of t values and it's a one column array as a one column vector. That's what it's saying there. Okay, so let's do that. And it, what it does is it uses this inbuilt function called find is prime a bit difficult just to look at it like that let's see uh, let's just see there let's just run that and then i'm going to call prime numbers and i'm and i'm going to run it from 1 to 20 so that you can see so that's why i say julia doesn't think that one is a prime number and is is one a prime number it can divide by one in itself but one is itself so is it a prime number um so it's going to go from 1 to 20 and it gets passed there this is a, uh, an array with just one column. So all of them are 64-bit integers. There's just one column. It's a vector, actually a column vector from 1 to 20. It's not a matrix of 2 by 2, 3 by 2. It's just one single column. That's what that one is for. They're all integers, and it's an array. And that is what, what is said there. It must be an array, and uh, it must only be one column. That's the only thing that it's going to accept. And each and every one of these elements, as specified by the type there, has got to be an integer or subtype of integer. So it certainly couldn't pass a bunch of, of um, uh, irrational numbers there, a bunch of floating point values. And the function prime uh, uh, is find. So again, it's going to return true or false. True, then it will give me the value. False, it will just ignore. And there is this is prime, uh, uh, is prime function and just running through each of one each individually of those values now there's uh, we can simplify that function actually we can just call it function easy primes and a is an array such that it's all into the 64 elements and it must be a single column array and it just find is prime a as we've seen before in our function and if we run easy primes now again we're going to get exactly the same result very lastly, let's just uh, do some list comprehension. Not really part of functions, but um, always fun to do. They really crop up everywhere. We've seen them before, but let's just take a quick look, right, to end off this very nice section of uh, functions. This as, a, as an added bonus. So I'm cre creating this matrix. Uh, and what does it do? I'm going to call it matrix 1. And it is x plus y for x in 1 to 2 and y in 1 to 3. Let's just run that and you're going to see what gets returned, this 2 by 3 array. So what's happening here? So x is going to be this 1 and two, one to 2 and y 1, 2 and 3. So it's going to say 1 plus 1, that gives me the 2. Then 1 plus 2, so 1 and x, the next 1 and y. So you can see the order in which this gets ex executed. That gives me 3 and 1 plus 3 is 4. Now it's going to jump to the 2 and the x for the next row. So 2 plus 1 is 3, 2 plus 2 is 4, 2 plus 3 is 5. So that is lovely. Now just to remember, you don't have to use this in keyword. You can also use the equals keyword. That's going to give me exactly the same thing. And for a bit of fun, let's create back to school, create the 12 by 12 table. So it's x times y for x in 1 to 12, y in 1 to 12, quick and dirty. If, uh, if someone comes to you asking for the, uh, very quickly for the 12 times 12 table, there you go no problem at all so there's a bit of a mix of less comprehension that's building up values building up an array building up a matrix um, uh, uh, you can use it as part of functions here but we've had a good nice look at functions now they're absolutely powerful and there's this multiple dispatch of various methods in the function that really make them powerful and you can take absolute control of that I really hope you enjoyed this lecture. Have some fun, create your own functions. Uh, they are really powerful in Julia. In this section, we're going to look at collections. Now, collections are really just groups of values. 
uh, like lists of values and those values could be numbers and they can be strings so they can be both uh, numerical and take on some form of category so it's just lists of uh, of values now as per usual we're going to just see that the kernel has loaded properly and we see 2 plus 2 equals 4. Another thing that I want to introduce uh, in this lesson is this very exciting uh, section of code here where we're going to load a cascading style sheet file just to stylize our notebook a little bit. Some people like that. It's quite easy to do, uh, for instance, using the uh, IPython kernel for uh, the Jupyter notebooks, but you can also do it right here in Julia. So I say file equals open. Uh, and just it is in the current or present working directory this file style.css i'll post these uh, on github uh, and other places as well so you can see what this cascading, cascading style sheet looks like it's going to lo load that i'm going to create this computer variable called style and i'm going to say read all files so to read everything in this uh, open file and then i'm just going to call html and then uh, in uh, in uh, quotation marks here the dollar style so that just means read this variable which is just going to output this cascading style sheet to html so if this doesn't make a lot of sense don't worry about it you can copy and paste this and just keep it at, uh, at the top of all your files and as i say you've got to have this cascading style sheet uh, we're going to use some google fonts that are freely available in the style sheet uh, uh, and as i said i'll give you a link to that let's just run that block of code and voila look at this isn't this uh, a thing of beauty so i've rendered a specific uh, font for uh, my writing my code here i've also got a specific font just here for my markdown output and if i double click on this you'll see it's still just i'm not using markdown i'm using html tags here doesn't matter uh, heading one this says collections but it is rendered in a specific text as it is stated in this cascading style sheet this cas cascading style sheet also gives this white background color, this light gray background color. You can change almost everything about your notebook just in a cascading style, se style sheet. So if you know uh, HTML and uh, CSS, you can really render some interesting notebooks. So uh, apologies if you don't like this uh, font. Uh, I just chose it just because it's quite different from the default. Uh, as you can see, I've colorized it as well. Just a bit of contrast so you can see what this all uh, is all about. So this chapter this lesson on uh, collections lists of uh, numerical or categorical values the most common form of these are arrays as you can see there so in this lesson we're going to look at these arrays we're going to modify them we're going to take uh, add another dimension to them to uh, have matrices we're going to do a bit of set notation we're going to look at tuples and um, uh, we'll circle back to arrays uh, if we will bring it all together in the end. So without further ado, in the next section, let's start off by looking at arrays. So in this part of the lesson, we're going to look at arrays. It's quite a long section. I'm going to show you a lot of uh, what arrays are all about and what you can do with arrays. Now, in most instances we're going to perform some functions on arrays and that's exactly what we're going to do in this lesson i'm going to show you quite a few julia functions and how they impact arrays just to showcase what an array is now first of all here's our first array i'm going to call it arr call it whatever you want within the constraints of uh, the syntax that is allowed in julia and you see i um, in, enclose this in square brackets and I put commas in between the values. So I have 10, 12, 14, 16, and 18. And when I output that to the screen, uh, lo and behold, we have the five element array, the all inter integer 64s, and you see this comma one. Comma one means we're talking about a column. So uh, if you use other uh, development inter uh, interfaces, such as uh, development environments, I should say, such as a light table with a, with a Juno add-in, It'll actually be called a vector, a column vector, because this is indeed just what it is. It is a column. Now let's just do a row vector. So I'm going to call this array underscore ARR, at least underscore row. And you see 
I've still got my square brackets, but I've omitted the commas as the spaces in between. And if I run this section of code, you see the output there. It is going to be a one by five array, one row, five columns, all 64 bit integer values and C comma two. This is, now I don't really want to call it dimensions because it gets confusing as far as math is concerned. But as far as Julia at least is concerned, this two refers to this as being, this is a row and you see the one there meaning that that's a column. Now, let's just use a function to populate an array. What I want to do is I'll just say cell all output toggle, so we just get rid of what's to come. Keep it as a surprise. So uh, array arr underscore rand, and I use this rand function, and it says five, give me five values, and there I have a five element array. They are 64 bit uh, floating numbers, values, and they are columns. It's down a column, and you see what RAND does. It chooses values from 0 to 1 inclusive, and there's a pseudo random selection of these values right there. Let's create an array in a different way by using the fill function. Fill takes two values here, 7, 10. I've called uh, my array 7s, and if I uh, execute that, you see it's a 10 element array of 64-bit integer values in a column format, and they're all sevens. So the argument was what to fill your array with and how many elements you want. So 10-element array there. I uh, can also use it on strings. So yeah, I have a string, I love Julia, exclamation mark, and I want three of those. And lo and behold, this is a three-element array of ASCII string type. Again, it's a column array. Now, let's use this bang uh, equivalent to our full function so it's full bang and we're going to take LVE which was our array there and this is what we're going to append to the end and now uh, I will have if we just select that section run it we see we have a three element array now adding a bang to permanently change so that is still three let's run this again I have a three element array, I fill it and I add a fourth one and I still get three back. So clearly you see here this fill with the bang has not really changed this array and we'll get to that. Now Julia can repeat more than just a single value. Here we have rep mat function. I have my array here, one, two, three as a column vector and I want it repeated three times. Let's run that. There we go. We see a nine element array now of 64 bit integers in the column 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. Now using line space or LIN space and log space. So it goes like this, lin space, start, stop, and how many elements you want. So you're going to break this up, the values 1 to, 21 in, uh, 1 to 10 in 21 equal uh, bits. And, uh, well, I shouldn't say bits, I mean little uh, ranges type of you see is a lin space of 64 bit values so that's a bit different from just being an array now let's print each of those so for i and lins print line i n print line means it's going to all go in its own line and there you see it starts at 1 it ends at 10 and there are 21 of these little elements so it's taken it's gone between 1 and 10 and it seems to have uh, added 0.45 to each step log space takes these two arguments two and four and it says divide uh, uh, divide up some values between 10 to the power 2 and 10 to the power 4 now it's going to do by default it is going to do it is going to do 50 50 uh, arrays 50 elements there so 10 to the power 2 is 200 10 to the power 4 is 10,000 there and it's got 50 uh, equal uh, uh, well there's a uh, uh, equal difference between each of these elements and there are 50 of them in total let's do a few other things we're going to create two arrays of random values remember rand's going to choose between zero and one inclusive and i want 20 of them for both of these computer variables vals1 and vals2 i'm using semicolon just to suppress the output to the screen well in this case it doesn't really work um, in iJulia here um, it's still going to output a, uh, one of the two arrays for me at least doesn't matter maximum vals1 let's run let's run that i want the maximum 
of all of those. Now, every time you run this, you're going to get something different, but it seems that value 0 0.9586, etc., <coughs> was the largest of all the values uh, of all the values in in uh, in one so you can clearly see this was vals 2 that was what was printed to the screen because vals 1 certainly or uh, vals 2 certainly doesn't have this number in it uh, vals 2 here as displayed i can say find max that returns the maximum value and its index so it says in vals 1 this number 0.95861 etc was the largest value and it was in position number one. Same goes for minimum. This is going to return the minimum value and min, find min will return that minimum value and its position. Extrema goes through an array and it's going to give us the minimum and the maximum values in that array. Now just some descriptive statistics quite easy as well. You can I just ask for the mean of vals one It'll give you that 0.551085, etc. Remember the equation for the average or the mean is just summing all the values and dividing by how many values they are, how many elements they are. And to count the elements in a, an array, we just use the length function. So sum all the values divided by how many they are, and it's just going to give us back exactly the same as what the mean did. We can also ask for the median, and we can also ask for the sample standard deviation. Now I thought let's just include, let's just include a bit of fun. Remember the equation for the standard deviation, sample standard deviation. The population standard deviation just divides by n, but the sample standard deviation remember, divides by n minus 1. So you take the average of all the values and you're going to subtract from it, from it each individual value and square that and divide it by n over 1 and it's the sum of all of those. The sum of all of those. Now let's just create that in a little function. So I'm going to create a function. So this just for fun. I'm going to call my function sample standard deviation. And it's going to take an argument, x. I'm going to implicitly have these little uh, computer variables here. I'm going to have total. And I'm setting that equal to 0. So this is the local variable with respect to this function. Won't exist outside of the function. n is the length of whatever array I pass to it. So that I know how many elements there are. And I'm defining this function average. And the average is going to sum all the elements in the array that I'm going to pass this function, divided by n, which is the length. Now I'm going to run through a little loop for, for, uh, for i uh, in 1 to n. Remember, n is uh, the, the length of the elements. So it's going to run through all of the elements. It's going to total, which is 0 when we start. It's going to update the total with the average minus whatever element I am at the moment and square that so that's going to be this numerator bit here and run through all of those so that I have a total a new total now total existed outside of this for loop so it is explicit as far as this for loop is concerned but it's still implicit it's still a local variable as far as the function is concerned but I can return something the square root of the total which is now updated all these differences between each element and the average and divide by n minus 1 and take the square root of that so there's my function it's a genetic function with a single method because I uh, which is any because I really didn't specify anything as far as uh, limiting what x should be now let's use our uh, function stand sample standard deviation and I pass it the vowels 1 and it returns 0.314. What was the standard deviation? 0.314. Let's just make doubly sure. I'm going to say, is Julia's standard deviation equal to my sample standard deviation function? And of course, that's going to return a true. Now, we've seen maximum and find max and minimum and find min. I just want to show you what max and min does. Max and min will look through uh, uh, more than one array, and it will go element by element. And it's got to be of equal length, these elements. I have so that they've got to have these pairs and it'll just return the maximum of the two and same for minimum it's going to return the minimum of the two now we can perform element wise operations so i can ask this boolean question for vals one and vals two dot smaller than so it's going to compare the first element in vals one and the first element in vals two and see if it is smaller and then run through all of them and it'll return this boolean. Uh, it'll return this boolean um, values here. So false if it's not smaller than, and true if it is smaller than. Now I can perform this little uh, 
change the value. So I'm going to say in vals1, and then, then these square brackets, if vals1 is less than vals2, set that value in vals1 equal to 100. I'm just using a large number. Now if I ask, is everyone in vals2 less than vals2, and they will all be false, because the ones that did return a 2 were now suddenly changed to 100. Uh, almost getting to the end of this section of the lesson, let's do a few more things. Remember the collect. It's going to start at 1, increment in values of 2, and end at 21. I'm going to add that to odd. And you see odd is now OD, I shouldn't say, just OD I called it, as an uh, 11 element array. 1 there, it's a column vector 1 to 21. Now I can use the find function, and that's just going to return the index value. So find is odd in that. So which of those are odd values? And it says 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, all of them. All of them were odd numbers, and they were indeed all odd numbers. So the find function here is going to return just the index value for me. Uh, return all the prime values for me in that, and it gives me that, but it's the index of that. So if you wanted the actual values, you have to do this. Give the variable name, then find is prime in odd. Because... In this square bracket, it's just going to return an index, so it's going to show all the values in this OD that are actually the prime numbers. And you see them there. Remember, 1 is not a prime number. We can just use this normal start stop instead of collect. So I'll call it nums. But just remember, this is a unit range. It is not an array. If I use collect, it's with start, step, and stop, I can create an array. But if I just use this uh, range notation here, 80 to 100. It's going to have the values 80, 81, 82, but as a unit range. Now I can still iterate through it because I can just say any is prime numbers and uh, it says true. So the any is just going to return a true. It's just asking the question, are there any prime values between 80 and 100? Yes. Find the prime numbers between 80 and 100. Four, and now you say 4, 10, and 18, you see there. So once again, you can see what it returned. It returned the indices for me. So if I wanted to return the actual values, I've got to have the indices. Since these are the indices, I specify them four nums, and that returns for me the three element array 83, 89, and 97 are prime numbers. Filter. It's going to do the exact same thing for me, but just give me the values all in one go. The all function on an array, all is in integer nums. Yes, indeed, they all are. So they've all got to be true for this to return true. So if I ask, are they all even, it's just going to return a false. No, they are not. Now, just for a bit of fun, I'm going to go to the type max of my 32-bit integer values. I'm going to sub subtract 10 million from them and then have this unit range from that till type max. I'm going to have this 10 million values and uh, so you see there from that value to that value and i'm going to use this macro at time to time finding all the prime numbers going through this list of very 10 million very large values now the first time i run this it's a bit of a cheat because uh, julia's got to compile and everything not just execute it so the first time that you run this it's going to be very slow the second time the code has been compiled, optimized for the uh, uh, for my CPU in this computer, and it'll show the proper timings of all of this. And uh, the first time, as I say, this one is going to be very slow. Remember, I've got 10 million very, very large values for it to go through, and there you go. You see it found uh, 465,817 elements, so that's prime values uh, in uh, those last uh, in those last. Uh, uh, values and you see the runs took how long they took and you see the 0.72% uh, uh, GC time that it took so you can play a bit with that run that code again you'll see you'll see what happens see the large memory allocation that was required to do that so let's just have a small little array one two three four five and uh, very last thing in this, I just want to show you combinations and permutations as it can be used on arrays. So collect for me all the combinations in CH and make three. So take three of any of these and see how many combinations we can come up with. Let's run that and it says you can have 1, 2, 3, 1, 4, 1, 5, 1, 3, 4, 1, 3, 5, 1, 4, 5, 2, etc. You'll see it's a 10 element array. 
Permutations works a little bit different. You can't choose how many of the elements you want to choose. It's just going to go through all that one, two, three, four, five, and come up with all the different permutations. And if you know the equation for permutations, you'll 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 uh, you can calculate that there are exactly 120 permutations. So quite a long uh, section of this lesson. This is going to be a very long lesson because I'm introducing both collections and what just giving you a showing of what can be done with them. Next up, we're going to modify our arrays. So let's modify the arrays. We can create them now by just adding values or strings. We can generate them by either filling them, running a little for loop. There's all sorts of ways to, to uh, generate an array. But let's see, once they exist, how can we change them? We're going to look through a few functions, built-in Julia functions that will change them. They come in two varieties, basically, one with and one without the exclamation mark. That exclamation mark is usually referred to as a bang, and when you add a bang, it makes uh, the changes that that function uh, makes to the array, it makes it permanent. So let's just create an array. We're going to use the collect function uh, through this unit range. I'm not putting a step in, so the default step is going to be used, which is one. So we're just going to jump one integer at a time. We've got a five element column array of 64 bit integers. Now let's add a value to the end. And there we're going to use this push exclamation mark or push bang. The arguments that it takes is the array that you want to, uh, to uh, act on and the value that you want to add. So let's add that and lo and behold, we have a six. It's permanent. That mod underscore array is now permanently changed. What if I want to add an element at the start of the array? Well, there is the unshift function. And we're going to add a zero there. And lo and behold, we have zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. What if I want to remove the last element? Okay, let's use pop and mod array. And it removes the last value, which was a six, and it returns that value. Let's call mod array again, and you can see it is just P0 to 5. What if I wanted to remove that first element? Now we're going to use this shift function. So shift is going to remove the first element. Unshift will add a first element. So it's a bit confusing. There you go. It returns what it will remove. If I run mod array, call mod array again, I see it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Let's create a new one called mod underscore array, and we just pass the values 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15, because I want to show you what if we wanted not to add or delete something at the start or the end, but somewhere in the middle. So let's choose an index. So I'm going to say delete at mod array comma 3. So this delete at with a bang, so it's a permanent change. On the mod array function, please remove index value at uh, index number 3. Julia starts counting from number 1, so 11, 12, 13, 13 is going to be removed. And it returns for me the full, sometimes some of these functions return the full array, sometimes it returns what it removes, you just have to watch out. So delete at is going to return for me the new array. So what if I wanted to add or, or to put the value 13 back at position 3? Now, it's not as simple as that. What is at position number 3 now? If we were to call mod array now, we're going to get 11, 12, 13, and 14. What is in position number 3? Well, it's the 14. And in that place there, I want to put a 13. So if I run this, what do I get? I get 14 back. Uh, that might be a bit confusing. But what it is returning, the splice function, is the value that it is removing to make place for the 13. So it's this 14 that is going to be chucked out, because if I call mod array again, it's now 11, 12, 13, 15. Now what if I want that 14 back? I didn't necessarily want it replaced. Well, then I have to pass more than one value. So replacing the value in position 4, what is position 4? It's 11, 12, 13, it's the 15. So go to splice, the mod array, position 4, and add to it this unit range, 14 to 15, with an increment of 1. And if I do that, is this going to say 15? That is what was removed. It was spliced there, and the 15 was removed, because if I call mod array now, it's going to be 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So you've got to be very careful when, when you want to try, when you want to uh, add things in the middle of an array, or at least not at the start or the end. Now let's sort arrays. Sometimes that's a very necessary thing to do. 
So let's create a 10 element array. I'm going to use the rand function in this unit range 10 to 20 inclusive, and I want 10 elements back. So between the values of 10 and 20 inclusive, please give me 10 values at pseudo random. So there's our 10 element array, all of them 64 bit integers in the first dimension. That means a one column. I can ask for it to be sorted. So I'm just going to use sort and just a string array. I'm not passing any other arguments. And that is just going to go in ascending order. So 12, 12, 14, 15, all the way up to the 2020. But I did not use a bang. I just said sort. So if I call string array again, nothing has changed. It is still in the order that it was before. So if I want to make that permanent, I've just got to use the bang version of the sort function. And if I now call uh, str underscore array, it is still sorted. So that's a few ways just to modify, the common ways to modify an array. Next up, we're going to just increase the uh, dimensions, or we're just going to uh, have more than one column or more than one row. We're going to talk about matrices. So let's talk about matrices, the wonderful, very uh, useful uh, mathematical form of a matrix. So a, bit of a few differences uh, between the matrix and computer science, or at least here in Julia and uh, the mathematical variant, but in the end it all works out nicely. Now the first thing I just want to get uh, uh, to talk about is this, this, what is a vector and what is an array? So I'm asking this Boolean question, is an array of 64-bit integers in a column format, is that equal to a vector of 64-bit integers? And the answer is going to be true. Let's just toggle all of these so we just get rid of uh, all the output there. There we go. There we go. There we go. Where are we? Where are we? Where are we? There we go. So if we run this again, we see that it is true. So an array and a column vector there is exactly the same thing. But now let's ask an array of 64-bit integers in this row format. Is that equal to a matrix? And indeed, we are going to get the true back. So even though we've referred to this as the row initially, it actually means that we are talking about two dimensions. And I'm not talking about the dimensions of a vector. If I have a column vector with 10 values in the 10 elements, that's a that's a 10-dimensional array. Yeah, we're just talking about rows and columns, referring to the two. But as soon as you have a row, I mean, a row does have a row does have columns in it, so it is going to say a, a two there. So if it is an array, uh, it doesn't matter if these are floats or, or integers, but the two there actually means it is a matrix. So let's create our first matrix, and we're going to do it this way. Remember when we did not put any commas in between, that meant that it was a row. So this one, two, three is going to be a row. I use the semicolon to jump to the second row, four, five, and six, semicolon to jump to the seven, eight, and nine. So there we go, it's a three by three array, and you see 64 bit integers, all of them, and the two again. So even if we just had one row, that will still be a two. So now we have three rows and three columns. Now, there are other ways to go about this. Look at doing this. I have these square brackets on the outside. I have the semicolon separating the two, but inside of that, instead of not having commas, I do have commas now, but I also have these inner square brackets. What do you think is going to happen there? Well, we get this, a six element array as far as just a column is concerned. Okay, so that is the output that you're going to see from there. Now let's go on. Let me do the exact same thing. So I still have the commas, I still have the square brackets inside of the larger set of square brackets, but instead of a semicolon, there's just a space. So that's another way to go about it, and look what it did now. It took this one, two, three, and made column vectors, a column vector out of it. One, two, three, and then four, five, six. And that is just because there's a space there now and not the semicolon we had there. So remember that little difference. Now let's mix things up. Now I'm going to have the inner brackets with the outer bra uh, square brackets. 
I'm going to still have the semicolon, but now I'm not going to have the commas there. So what's going to happen there? Now this is all for version 4, or anything after version 3, I should say, up till now, that uh, is up to 0.4.2. I get these as two rows. The 1, 2, 3 will now be across a row, 4, 5, and 6 will be on the next row. Now, once again, we're going to do this, no commas, no semicolon, but still the inner brackets, inner square brackets. And this will be almost the same as doing this with everything in. This one with nothing in is just going to give me this one long row. So beware of your notation in Julia. You're going to get different things depending on your use of square brackets, your use of commas, and your use of a, a semicolon or a space. Now, let's repeat some rows. These are obviously going to be rows. There's spaces in between. So take this 1, 2, 3, which is a row vector, and repeat it three times. So we're going to get 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. What about this? So that was doing it along the rows, but what about doing it like this? I can specify row and column. So if we do this, it says... We make one row of it and three columns. So there's my first one, two, three, my second one, two, three, and my third one, two, three. Good. So what will happen if we specify do it over two rows, rep mat, two rows and three columns? I think you know what's going to come. So I have the one, two, one, 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 two, 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 three, 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 one, 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 two, 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 three, three, three. So what it did was it did this one, two, three, one, two, three because this was specified as a column vector. So that's what it wanted, and it wanted two rows of that, because there's a one, two, and a three, a next row of one, two, and three, and make three columns of all of that. That's a column, that's a column, and that's a column. Good. So if I had one, two, three with the spaces in between, and now make two rows and three columns of that, there's my one, two, three, another one, two, three, and another one, two, three, so three columns of that, and then two rows of that. Excellent. Now, a matrix uh, is indexed by its row and then by its column number. So if I call uh, a computer variable here matrix, MAT, remember that what that was, we created it way up here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, a 3 by 3 matrix. If I were to just refer to its to it, MAT, and then the square brackets, this is going to be the row value, that's going to be the comma value. So give me the element that is in row 2, column number 3, and then indeed that was the 6. Now, we can almost get the same thing here, just get index matrix 2, comma 3, and we're going to get back that 6. Now, Let's just make a new column. I'm going to use the RAND function, and I'm going to say 6, 5. So between the values of 0 and 1 inclusive, I'm going to get a, a, a pseudo-random selection of values uh, in 6 rows and 5 columns. So there we go, a big 6 by 5 matrix of 64-bit floating values. And I've called that mat underscore RAND. Now let's make a rand n function. So that's slightly different. So that means it comes from the standard normal distribution. That means a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one create for me from that a three by three matrix. And there is my three by three matrix. So that's the use of rand and rand n just to create a matrix. Let's create a tensor. Well, let's call it a tensor for now. Tens underscore rand, and that is rand 3, 3, 4. That means three rows, three columns, but it's going to be four values deep. And this is going to be the front one, a 3 by 3 matrix. The, and you see this colon, colon, uh, colon, colon, 1. So that's the front one. Behind it stands this 3 by 3 matrix. Behind it stands this 3 by 3 matrix. Behind this tens a 3 by 3 matrix. You can almost think of this as this elongated uh, or, or rectangle at least. 3 by 3 on the front side and 4 deep. Just to show you what the type of this is. And it is a, an array, 64-bit floating values. And now for the first time we see something else. It's not 1, which was just a column, 2, which was a row, or then a 2 by 2, uh, or, or row and column matrix. 
Now we see we've added this third dimension. So let's create these two matrices just to show you how uh, Julia handles matrix multiplication. So I have these two uh, matrices, 1, 2, 3, and 2. So 1, 2 would be a row, 3, 2 would be a row, and 1, 3, 2, 4, 3, 2. And it's the second one that is printed to the screen here, the 2 by 3. Remember uh, the rules of matrix multiplication. The number of columns in the first matrix must equal the number of rows in the second matrix and the result, the result in size. So there we go, the 2, the 2 there is equal to the 2 there, and the result will be this outside bit. It will be a 2 by 3 matrix. So you can only do it when this column size is the same as the second one's row size. So I'm saying matrix A times matrix B, and there we get uh, the, uh, oh, well, let's just run that, and, and then run the multiplication, and there is our, uh, our uh, uh, multiplication. We can also do element-wise operations, so that was matrix multiplication. So I'm going to create these two arrays here, let's print them to the screen, or I should say just the uh, matrices. So there they are, two 3 by 3 matrices, you see them there, 64-bit integer values in both. And instead of multiplying them, I'm using this dot multiply uh, for uh, syntax. That means it's not normal mathematical uh, matrix multiplication, I'm taking one element and multi multiplying it by the same uh, element in the uh, in the other matrix. So it's going to be 1 times 2 to give you 2, the 3 times 3 to give you 9, etc. So it's element by element. And indeed there we see the 2 and we see the 9. Now we can ask element-wise questions. Let's just use the RAND function. So between 0 and 1, 5 by 5, 2 5 by 5 matrices, and I'm asking... On an element-for-element element basis, is the value in matrix R smaller than the uh, correspondent element in matrix S? And I'm going to get this matrix of Boolean values when it is smaller. Again, as we did with the column vectors, I can say, well, take the first one and check element by element. If its value is smaller than what is in there, that's going to return something for me. And if that is if, if that is, is so, I'm going to add the or that's uh, values is true. I'm going to attach the value hundred there. So I can now do that element wise operation again, and we should see false everywhere because everything in in the mat R is now going to be larger. Let's just look at the dimension sizes etc. of of a matrix. Now remember a matrix B. I can ask what its number of dimensions are by this n dims. Uh, function and it returns two there were rows and there were columns for the tens underscore and remember there were three we had this depth to it size returns this tuple and we'll talk about tuples two comma three so it's got two rows and three columns see the difference between the number of dimensions there and the size of it and if we ask for the size of this tens underscore and of course we're going to get a three comma three comma four I can ask for the size of the number of rows in map B, and that is what rows refers to. Rows is the first dimension, and it tells me, well, there were two of those. I can ask how many columns there were. Well, there were three columns. And I can also ask the length of the matrix, six, because it's two by three. And that gives me all of those. Now, let's have a look at how Julia counts these six. Where do they go? So I'm going to have this for loop inside of a for loop. The outside is going to run from 1 till the size of the rows. So first it's going to run through the first row. And in the first row it's going to execute this little for loop and then run to the second row. And inside I'm going to have for the columns. So it's going to run from 1 till the columns. So I'm printing element in a row with an I and column there is the value at that position ij. Look at that uh, section of, uh, of a for loop and you see very quickly how it runs. Element in row 1, column 1 is 1. Element in row 1, column 2 is 3. Element in row 1, column 3 is 2. So let's check that. Let's just run that. And there we go. We can see the rows are 1, 3, 2. The columns are 1 and 4, 3 and 3, 2 and 2. So you can work out exactly where uh, the element these six elements are so we've got this end to sub function that returns the row and column values of an element specified by its index 
So now I'm going to run from 1 to 6. Remember the length of the matrix was 6. And I'm going to say element i is matrix bi and is row and column value uh, of such. So this is how it's going to work. Element 1 is 1 and has a row and column value of 1, 1. So that is what this int to sub uh, returns for me. So if you look at these two, these two, this uh, for loop inside of a for loop and this for loop down here, it will show you exactly how Julia goes about numbering uh, these elements in a matrix. Now remember I said the size returns a tuple, so I can actually give each tuple a computer variable. So I'm going to use RWS and CLMS for the size and remember that was a 2 by 3 so RWS is now 2 and CLMS so that would be rows and columns is 3. So I can print the number of rows are 2 and the number of columns are the number of columns uh, the number of columns is I should say per proper English there. Uh, there you go you can uh, work out from this tuple or you can give each of these values in the tuple its own computer variable. So let's just have some special matrix functions, the identity matrix, I, and we're going to make it 5 by 5. There we go, 1's along the main diagonal, 0's everywhere off of the main diagonal, that's a 5 by 5 identity matrix. I can make a matrix of all zeros, specifying the number of rows and columns, there we go. A matrix of all 1's, specifying how many rows and columns I want. I can do a diagonal matrix and I can tell Julia what I want on that diagonal here. I want to use a collection of these uh, of this range from 1 to 5 with a step of 1. So along the main diagonal, along the main diagonal, I'm going to get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I can also specify when I, what I want on my main diagonal by just using an array of values that should go inside of, and then I'm using pi there, that should go inside of the main diagonal. And there we have 3, negative 2, 3, and uh, this um, a, sh a, sh a shorter version at least of the value of pi there. So count the number of zeros in something that has a main diagonal with values of 1 to 5. That's going to return the count of the non-zero numbers. And remember on a diagonal matrix, everything is zero except everything on the main diagonal, and there are only five values. So count the non-zeros, I should be clear. Now, a matrix of Boolean values, indeed, we can have that. So just 3 by 5 set of true values, a 3 by 2 set of false values, that's all possible. Now, let's slice up an array. That's quite a useful thing to do, and but can be a bit tricky. So let's make this matrix, mat underscore slice. It's a 5 by 6, 5 rows, 6 columns, using the rand function. So that's values from 0 to 1 inclusive, it's pseudo random selection the 5 by 6 matrix we can uh, look at it there. Now I'm going to slice only by the first column that's all I want to see and remember it's rows comma columns so and I use these square brackets because I'm asking the value at that index. Now we can see the column value is 1 so it's certainly going to be this first column but I want all the values in that first row, and I can use shorthand for that by this colon sign. So it says all the values in row 1, comma, uh, um, uh, or, or that's the row and the column values there. Let's have a look what it returns. So it says that's rows, so all the rows. So that would be a row, that would be a row, that would be a row, that would be a row. You can see how quickly one can get confused between the two in column one. So all the rows just in column one. Now another way to look at it is to say go from one to the end that would be same as just having used that colon sign but I can say go from one to the end so that's all the rows so that includes all the rows but just for column one and we get the exact same thing back. Now let's go from row one and two for all the columns. Just row 1 and 2 for all the columns. And there's row 1 and row 2 for all the columns. Now let's take the transpose of a matrix. Remember transpose makes all the values in a row, makes them column values, all the column values in a row value, and we use this apostrophe there. Mat underscore slice for that apostrophe. 
that gives me the transpose and that's exactly the same thing as calling the transpose function on this matrix we're going to get exactly the same thing back there's an inverse of a matrix so I can have this matrix 1, 2 in the first row, 3, 4 in the second row, and I can just ask for its inverse, and you see the inverse there. Now remember, we can solve a, a, linear, set, a linear system of equations in this format. I'm going to make this matrix A of coefficients, my matrix of unknowns X there, and my solution column matrix there, column vector there, I should say B. So let's cheat a little bit. You can have a look at this. So um, 3 times 2 is 6, minus 2, uh, plus 8, that gives me 12. But you can see all these values in brackets here. They're 2, 2, 2, 1, 1, 1, 4, 4, 4. So I've cheated a bit just to make a set up like this. But imagine I put x in the place of 2, y in the place of 1, and z, or z, in the place of 4. So it will read 3x minus 2y plus 2z equals 12. And I have the system because the x's are the same for all three equations. The y value is the same for all three. So from that, I can make this matrix of coefficients. So I just take the coefficients 3, negative 2, and 2. There they are, 3, negative 2, and 2. 2, 0, negative 2, 2, 0, negative 2. 3, 1, 3, 3, 1, 3. There they are. And the solutions are 12, negative 4, 19. 12, negative 4, 19. Now I can write it like this. A, which is this, times x. Now, this x is not just x, it is a column vector which states x, y, and z. So if I take a, which is this, times x, y, and z, so it's a 3 by 3 matrix times a 3 by 1 matrix that equals a 3 by 1 matrix, and there it is. So I can divide both sides by a just to get x on its own, which is x, y, and z, but in matrix format that means taking the inverse. So if I take the inverse on both sides, I'll end up with this x equals a inverse times b and that will give me the values for x, y, and z. So let's do that in, uh, in Julia. So I've got my matrix of coefficients here, 3, negative 2, and 2, which makes up a row. So there's the spaces in between. The next row comes after the semicolon, etc. And I have my column a vector of my solution. So I have A and B there. There they are. And instead of taking the inverse... There is the shorthand, the shortcut in Julia that you can get used to. So A, and then there's this backslash B. And that gives me my solutions, which should read 2, 1, 4, just as I had them there. 2, 1, 4, it all works out. But that is exactly the same way, which, which takes a bit longer uh, with the Julia code to say the inverse of A times B. Uh, that looks like that's still 2, 1, 4. So this is just the shorthand notation for in A inverse times B. Now, arrays of, uh, uh, of a vector or matrix form uh, can be concatenated. Let's do that. So I've got uh, matrix A and matrix B here, mat A, mat B, 2 by 2 matrix, 2 by 2 matrix, and I'm going to horizontally concatenate them. First matrix A and then matrix B. You can well imagine what's going to happen. There's my 1, 2, 3, 4 there, my 10, 11, 12, 13 there, and it's concatenated them horizontally. Okay, that would be the same as just doing that. Remember, there's a space in between the two. In other words, this is a row that is being produced, and you see we get exactly the same. We get VCAT, which is a vertical concatenation. You see what happened there, which is the same as using a semicolon uh, 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 in the array format there. Good. Reshaping. Let's take a, a linear and just an array of values. We're going to collect from 2 to 12 uh, in increments of 2. So there we go, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. And I can reshape them. So reshape the array as a 2 by 3. So this 2 by 3, 2 times 3 equals 6. So it better work out to have the 6 elements there. And it will reshape that for you into a 2 by 3 matrix. Not a bang, so this is not permanent. So we can sort, remember, uh, let's make a, a matrix, we call it sort underscore mat, and it's going to be a rand value, choose from 1 to 10 in a 4 by 5 pattern for me, please. There we go, 4, four by 5 matrix of random integers, pseudo random integers between 1 and 10 inclusive. I can sort them by dimension 1. What does that look like? So just let's just have a look at it. So we had 758885, 55, 
10, 10. And what has it done here? Look at the differences between these two, uh, between these two matrices. So it went down every single column. So we have a 7, 5, 3, and 8, and it put them in order 3, 5, 7, 8. 5, 5, 3, and 7 down this column, and it made it, it changed the rows. So it goes column by column, but it changed the ro changes the rows in that column. So that's what, what I mean by rows here, even though we put a 1 there. So if I use the 2 there, it is going to go this way out. So let's just go back up so we can see our matrix there. It was 7, 5, 8, 8, 5. So for each of the values in these five columns, I'm going to sort them in ascending order, which makes it a 5, 5, 7, 8, 8. So don't get confused between the way that this sorting is done. Let's use rank, determinant, and trace of a matrix. Let's create this 4 by 4 matrix very quickly. We're going to rank the matrix which is something we use in linear algebra. It has a rank of 4. The determinant, which is a difficult thing to work out in a 4 by 4 matrix, doing that by hand takes a phenomenal amount of time. And very quickly in Julia, we see the determinant at least as not 0. And then the trace just adds the values on the main diagonal. It can work out the trace for us very quickly, 25. Now we can do the trace by hand. I've just put in, just for fun, a little bit of a... Uh, some script here. Remember size returns a tuple to me, so that's going to be the number of rows and the number of columns. I'm making this global variable, variable it's out, it exists outside of the for loop, call it my underscore trace, and I'm setting the value to zero. So my trace, which starts off at zero inside of this loop, and remember the loop is going to go from one to the number of rows, and we're just going to choose the value at index ii. So at the initial it's going to be index at row one, column one, then a row 2, column 2, then row 3, column 3, and we're just going to keep on adding them with my trace. My trace is uh, something that existed outside, so I can just call it directly in this print statement. Please print my trace for me. And lo and behold, we see it is also 25. So that's a lot of fun with matrices, and obviously gets a lot more powerful than that, just to give you some idea of how to work with a matrix. Now, next up, we're going to look add just a bit of set theory and its calculations as far as Julia goes. In this short section, let's have a look at some sets. Now, I can just use normal array and do a bit of set theory. Here, um, I'm going to do the union of two sets. Remember, it's uh, two sets here, uh, a sub 1 and a sub 2, and I'm just going to get the union. So you see the two sets here. They are just normal arrays separated by commas, all these values, a1 and a2. We can execute, um, uh, execute this line of code, and uh, we have our two arrays. Now I can use the union function. It takes the argument of all these arrays that I want the union of, and that just means putting these two together. But uh, there you see, for instance, there's a 3. There's also a 3. So that would be uh, only represented once when we do the union of these two. And there you can see the two of them together. Remember the intersection. Uh, those would be elements that are common to both uh, common to both of these, uh, of these arrays. Then you see the elements 1. There's a 1 and a sub 1, there's a 1 and a sub 2, there's a 3, there are 3s in both of them, there are two 3s here in a sub 2, and there's a 4 that is mutual to the both of them. The difference, it takes away all the elements that are uh, in the second set that are also represented in the first, and it takes them out of the first. Remember the Venn diagrams uh, from school, that's exactly what is going to happen subsets that is going to return a boolean value for us it just asks is a1 contained within a2 so do we find that all of the values in a sub 1 are also in a sub 2 and of course uh, in this uh, in this instance it is false because there are values let's go up there are definitely values such as an 8 here or the 7 
all the six, all the five for that matter, that are not represented in A2. So definitely A1 is not a subset of A2. Now we've represented these as uh, we've represented these as uh, as uh, arrays, but we also have this set notation, the set function in Julia. So I can very specifically say that something is a set. It still takes the square brackets, so there's still this array form inside of, and uh, and uh, the. Uh, what happens with this set is the following. Let's look at the numbers as one, two, one, two, three, two, one. So there's certainly repetitions of the twos and the ones. And when I use set, it is just going to get rid of all the duplicates. And that is why you would use the set function here as opposed to just using a normal array. That is really for just getting rid of all of the duplicates. And certainly in sets, we are interested in these, uh, in, uh, in the values as they are, not as they are. Uh, multi or, or used multiple times as we as we want them in an array. So if that is uh, your requirement, use the set function. In the next video, in the next sec uh, section on this lesson, we're going to have a look at tuples and how tuples different, uh, how they are different from arrays. Let's have a look at tuples. Now, tuples are also lists of values. But instead of being enclosed in square brackets, they are closed in parentheses. So these normal round brackets. Uh, bra uh, brackets. Now, tuples can be heterogeneous. In other words, you'll see here I've put the numerical values, integer values, one, two, three in here, and a string, hello. But what they are is they are immutable. Immutable means they cannot be changed once they have been created. So you have created the computer variable called TUP, and once I've created that, it cannot be changed. I cannot change a value as I could with arrays, and that's one of the big differences between arrays and tuples. Let's run this code, and we see two, uh, our tuple there, two, three, one, two, three, and the word hello. Just to make sure the type of it, it is a tuple. And it found a 64-bit integer, a 64-bit integer, another 64-bit integer. That would be the 1, 2, 3, and then an ASCII string. Now, we can look up the value and the type of each element. So let's go for i in 1 to the length of tuples. So we can still, the elements can still be counted. We're going to print new lines for each time there's this for loop. And we're going to print out to the screen the value of the tuple at index number. Now, $i because the first time we're going to be at index 1, the next time the for loop runs, it's in index 2, the next one. And then we're going to use this tuple, and in square brackets, it's index value. So that would be exactly the same as arrays. They are still really just uh, indexed uh, starting from 1. And then we're just going to uh, use the type of what uh, that tuple index, at, or at least the value at that index is going to be. So quite a simple for loop there. And we clearly see the value of the tuple at index number 1 is 1, and the type is 64-bit integer, until we get to index number 4, uh, and the value is hello, and the type is an ASCII string. Now, another difference is we can actually name these indices. Now, let's just run that. Let me just show you what I mean. Now, we have the values 1, uh, 1, 3, 5, 7. You see that I have enclosed them in parentheses, so this is going to be a tuple. There are four tuples, and I've given each of them a name. So in index position number one, we have the value one, and I'm calling it A. So A is going to equal one, B is going to equal three, C is going to equal five, and the word seven, which is just a normal computer variable, is going to be the number seven. So we run that line of code. Now I can say for I in each of A, B, C, seven. So that actually is just an array of all of these names, these computer variables that hold these indexed values in the tuple for me, and I can print them. And there we see the values 1, 3, 5, and 7. Now, tuples can also be sliced. So if I have tuple 2 here with all of these values, we just run that, there is our values, and we can uh, use the index keyword end, so what would be the last element. We can slice it from number 2 to number 4, so index 2 would be the 3, Index 3 would be the 5. Index number 4 would hold the value 7. 
I can also reverse the order, all these kind of things that we just did with uh, with arrays. So end in steps of negative one to the first index. So that's just going to reverse the order for me. But remember, they are immutable. So I can't use something like tuple tuple two here, tup two index number one. I'm going to set that to the value five. That is going to give you this set index. There's no method matching set index. Uh, um, error here so you can't do that you cannot change it while uh, once it has been uh, created now the next thing just to remember something else about tuples i can have these tuples inside of tuples so there's a tuple one two three inside of the its parentheses but that is just one of some other tuples so it's a tu tuples of tuples and you can see them there at index number one, though, of tuple three is that whole tuple one, two, three. It makes up that whole index at index number one. But I can, well, what you would see then is this one, two, three would be index number one. The one would be index two. The two would be index three. And four would be this index. But it has a sub-index. So if I say TUP three, four, index four, that would be this three, one hundred and one. And from there, I want index 2. So what we do is we have these two sets of square brackets. Just the order in which it follows. And that is going to give us the value 100. I think that's about enough for uh, of tuples. In the next lesson, the next section on this lesson, we are going to have a look at dictionaries. Let's have a look at dictionaries. Now, dictionaries are collections with two elements. Uh, so they build on what we had with arrays and tuples, and they really have a value. And this idea of an, of an index uh, gets expanded to this value of a key. Now, the best way to do that is let's just create a dictionary. So the dictionary is actually a little function called D-I-C-T, capital D there, dict. And uh, functions always are encased in these parentheses. And I have this one this equal greater than sign so it forms this nice looking arrow sort of and then 77 so that is my key and my value my key is one and the value it holds is 77 here i have a key of two and its value is 66 and a key of three and it holds a value one so that'd be a first example of a dictionary and if we run it we see there it's a dictionary and what it found was was these in 64 bit integer key and value values if i can put it like that now, we can use a different notation than this equal sign and uh, greater than sign by using the pair function. So if I pair 1 and 100, that means the 1 will be the key, the 100 will be the value, only because it is inside of a dict function. So let's run that and we see we get exactly the same kind of notation on the output the key 2 has a value 200, the key 3 has a value 300, and the key 1 has a value 100. Now let's uh, uh, do something else. Let's have a look at this. I'm going to create this new dict. And it is a dict, but I'm going to specify the data types, the type that it can hold. And it's any, any. So the key can be any, and the value can be any. So I have three keys here, two, three, and uh, one, two, and three, and I have values 77, 66, and then the string three. And all of that is legal because I have specified the fact that both the key and the values can hold uh, any type or the type any. Let's look at dict three. I'm doing exactly the same thing, but look at this. I've got keys now. Again, it's any, any as I've specified, but here I've got a string as a key. And here I've got a tuple actually as a key. So all of this works. I'm going to have, let's just run that and you'll see. So I have a tuple as a key and a string as a value. Here I have a string or at least it is a string because it's in double quotation marks and not in single quotation marks, which would make it a character. So there's a string and it holds a, a value one, which is a, a 64, well, at least an integer. Now, there are other ways to, sp uh, to specify what key values are, and this is the symbol notation where I use colon and uh, a word or a, let uh, a letter as we've done here. And if I execute that code, we'll see this symbol notation.
that C, the key C, holds the value 309, B, 305, A, 300. And I can s assess the, the value in a dictionary by just referencing its key. So the key is in the symbol notation for dict4, which would be colon C, and again I get back the value 309. Now, have a look at this, using the get function for keys that do not exist. So, we have dict4, remember, there it is, so it only has the symbol values a, b, and c for the keys and the values 300, 305, and 309 respectively. But now I'm going to use this get function, takes the arguments dict4, and then uh, an h here as the key, and I'm using symbol notation, so it's colon h, and just in case it doesn't exist, because here we called C and C did exist, but what if I called something and I'm not sure whether that key actually exists, I can build in this error code that says that key does not exist. You could put anything in those quotation marks, of course. So if I do call that, it says that key does not exist so that I don't halt my execution. I don't get an error back. I've actually allowed for this. But for that, you have to use the get function. Now, the B does exist, so in this case, Julia will ignore this, this does not exist because the key B in symbol form does exist and it just gives me that value back. So I can check if a key value pair exists and I use the in function. So I've got to use this whole key and value here inside of parentheses. So in symbol form, the key A is 300. And I'm checking whether that does exist. So the whole key value pair, if that exists, and indeed it is true, I can check to see if a value if a value actually has a key, uh, or at least the other way around, to check if a key exists. So I can just the has key dict for, and the D there that's going to return a false for me. And I can add a key and a value to the dictionary very easily. I just reference the uh, the dictionary there dict for. Give it, give a, a new key value, a, a key name, I should say, and add a value. As simple as that. I can just add it like that. And if I have dict4 now, we see that the D does exist. Now, dictionaries are mutable, i.e. Their, their values can be changed. So remember, we had C before, but now I'm going to set the value to 1,000. And if I do that and just check, we'll see that C indeed now holds a value of 1,000. I can also use the delete function. So I can say delete, and that's a bang, so that makes it uh, permanent. So dict4, please remove key with a value A. And if I do run it now, that key and its value is gone. It is gone. So I can find out a little bit more information about a dictionary. So I can ask for the keys that exist in dict4. And there we go. We see it's C, B, and D that are left after my bang deletion there. And the values in dict4. It also has a length, just as tuples do and just as arrays do, a length of dict, and at the moment that is 3. But it has no size and it has no uh, dimensions, so we can't do that. So what we can do is say for k and v in dict4, because remember there are two values there. There's a key and a value value, so just using k and v in dict4, print line the key has a value, and I'm using the dollar notation there just to reference those values. So, the, so that just tells you every time we run through all the elements in dict4, if I can call them that, there will be two values, a key value and a value value. And we can run through that simple for loop to get that. Now, a for loop can also be used to populate a dictionary. So here I have uh, an array of names, June, Mary, and John. It is string values, square brackets, this makes it an array. I've given it the computer variable name called name underscore vowels. And I'm crea creating this dict, and uh, it is a dict by using this dict function. I'm giving it values, so the, the key can be of abstract string type. And the values can also be abstract, abstract string, and then actually empty parentheses, so it's an empty dictionary as it stands. Then we're going to uh, run through this for loop. S and N in enumerate name vowels. Now, what's happening here? Name vowels is a dictionary, so we know it can take two values. Hence, I can run a for loop with two values. And in enumerate, enumerate just means run through this. First, the first element, the second element, and the third element. We've seen enumerate before. 
then name dict, then pass its index as the name x underscore dollar s. So that's going to hold the value for the key. So it's going to be x underscore the key value. And that equals n. And n is the value that is passed there. Let's have a look at what this code does for us. We've run it. Let's call name dict and look at, look at that. So we have x underscore and dollar s. Now s is just, it runs through. So don't get confused. I think I almost got, got I did get confused here. So it's the s. It's just running through the indexes of this 1, 2, and 3. The n is going to actually hold those values. So the name, dict, I'm going to have keys now named x underscore 1, 2, and 3. And they are going to hold the values that are listed here, June, Mary, and John. So look clearly how this is structured and which way around the keys and values are used in this instance. I can also iterate through a dictionary by key, by the key value tuple. So I say for k in keys, name dict. So only the keys in name dict, I'm going to just iterate through them and I can go into print k is and then name dict and use its key there so that I can get the value back. So x1 is June, x2 is Mary, x3 is John. Quite easy. I can also iterate through a dictionary by key and value separately. We've done this before. K and V separately. Run through that and print that to the screen. So really nothing difficult there. I can also sort a dictionary. Let's do that. So I've got dict5 here. That's a dictionary. It holds key values that are all abstract strings and integer 16-bit integer values for the values. So I have A being 1, B being 2, C3. You see that, etc. Let's run that, and we have dict5 there. But you see the entries are all jumbled up. They're certainly not in this order that I've done them. And, but I can use the sort function. So I'm going to loop for k in the sort of the collection of the keys of dict5. So this is almost, uh, almost functional coding that I'm using here. I'm using a bunch of functions to extract this uh, list of values through which I can iterate my for loop. Let's execute that and see. And that gives us an error at the moment. It says that this value for dict, or while loading in, in, in this line, the expression starting on line 2, it says undefined error, dict is not defined. Okay, so dict is there, but it should be dict number 5. There's our error there. Let's just execute that again. And now we see A is 1, B is 2, C is 3, D is 4, E is 5, F is 6. So I had to sort all of those values. Now let's dissect this for loop a little bit because it is, as I said, almost functional notation. So keys in dict5, those are just going to be the keys A, B, C, D, A, B, C, and D, E, F. But I want to collect those, so we run through the values, uh, each of them, but I want them sorted, and because these are A, B, C, D, E, F, that is how it's going to be sorted. So the keys are going to give us back F, C, E, B, A, D. But if I now collect those, it goes from, look at what happened. If we look at the type, this is a base key iterator for a dict. But if I use the collect function on that, it becomes a six element array, which means I can now iterate through it with a for loop. And if I sort it, it's going to do an alphabetical sort for me. So you see how I used function upon function upon function to create this uh, array of A, B, C, D, E, F. In the last section, we're going to bring everything together. I'm just going to do a little bit of text mining just to, to show you how we can use the concept of collections just to, uh, to do a bit of uh, text mining. In this lesson, we're going to look at working with characters and strings. First, let's just make sure that our kernel has loaded. As usual, I just make use of that little function. I'm just going to add 2 plus 2, and let's wait for it. We get 4. Everything seems to work. So working with characters, letters, and strings. So we are interested here in words and sentences. 
and letters, um, anything that you can that you can write that makes uh, sense as characters. Now, Julia can do both ASCII, that's the American Standard Code for Information Interchange, and the Unicode characters. Now, remember, the ASCII um, set of characters, they just map the integer values of 0 to 127 to a specific character, say A, B, C, a backslash, a full stop, a space. All of those uh, things on your keyboard, they just have an integer value. And then the Unicode set of characters, many, many more. There's about 120,000 characters from, as you can see, there 129 modern and uh, not so modern scripts. Because really, when we talk about characters, when we talk about sentences, we talk about language, and a computer has to be able to represent uh, most of those. So what are we going to look at? We're going to just introduce some strings so you can become comfortable with how Julia deals with them. We're going to look at substrings. We're going to look at individual characters because Julia can deal with individual characters. It's a different data type, a different type, I should just say, than a full string. We're going to split and join certain strings. We're going to convert strings into integers. And we're going to look at some other conversions. We're going to find and replace characters and substrings inside of other strings because that's what we ultimately care about. We want to get some information uh, that we can use, say for instance in data science, out of uh, the characters. And then lastly, something uh, which uh, some people love, some people hate, but certainly, certainly quite interesting, we're going to get to grips with some regular expressions or the use of regular expressions in Julia. Let's get started. So let's have a look. In Julia, we enclose strings in double quotation marks. You see here, one, two quotation marks, everything inside. Because we're using the notebook here, it does this red color for us. And we just type in anything we want. I've typed in, this is a Julia string inside of these double quotation marks. And indeed, if I execute that cell, we get the whole lot. This is a Julia string, and we get those quotation marks. Now we can add that to a computer variable. I've uh, introduced a variable here called str1. And inside of that variable, inside of uh, that space in memory, I'm going to put the string. This is a Julia string. I'm using the semicolon there, so it does not get uh, printed to the screen. And now note the difference. I'm going to do two different things. I'm just going to call that computer variable str1. And then I'm going to print str1. Now look at the difference. So if I do that, I get back exactly what we had before with the quotation marks. But if I print it, uh, let's see what we get back there without the quotation marks. So let's have a look at that. So if we print it, it loses those quotation marks and we only have the text. Now you might ask, what do we do if we want quotation marks inside of a string? For instance, here, this is a Julia string, and I've put the Julia inside of quotation marks. Well, one way to get to do that is to use these triple quotation marks. It tells Julia that we might use quotation marks inside of our string, and it is these triple quotation marks in the beginning and the end that delineate the actual string. So I've got the new variable called str2, and look what happens when I call it. There are these backslash. Now, these backslashes are what we call escape characters. It actually tells Julia that whatever follows this is not part of the code. You have to escape it and use it as you would in a regular language. So let's print this and just have a look. See the difference there? This is a Julia string and the Julia now has quotation marks. So see the difference? This up here is what Julia is doing. It's inserting these uh, escape characters. Now, you'll remember from when we did functions... Let's just execute, uh, let's execute the cell, a equals 100. And we use this uh, shorthand, this placeholder, dollar $a, and then a was uh, equal to 100. So this is going to say this value is 100. But what if I wanted to include that dollar? That would be akin to using the quotation marks that we did with uh, Julia before. So uh, l what, do we, what do we do? And in fact, this is what we do. Here you see the escape character. So escape dollar, whatever comes after this escape, 
it says, well, dollar is used for something else. It is actually used as code. But in this instance, don't use it as code. Don't use this as code. Just use the literal meaning of what is there. It's just the dollar sign and then dollar A, which was 100. And if we execute that, you'll see this value, the value of this item is $100. Now it prints this dollar here is this dollar here. It has just escaped to tell Julia to ignore its use as code. A better way to perhaps to do it is to use this notation where we use this placeholder variable, the dollar, but just put whatever the variable is in parentheses so we know that you know we know what this is all about and we know that this is the escape. Now we're going to get exactly the same thing. So there's your introduction to two uh, strings in Julia. Next up we're going to look at parts of a string or substrings. So let's have a look at substrings. So I'm going to introduce this new computer variable called str underscore subset just by my choice and inside of it I'm going to put the string I love Julia exclamation mark I use the semicolon so it does not there's no output to the screen first things first let's count the number of characters in our little string and we use we've seen this before the length function and inside of that the argument is this computer variable str underscore subset if we run that we see there are 13 and indeed if we count it we notice that we have to count the spaces so it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. 13 characters. Now let's do a little loop just so that we can see what happens. Now what I'm going to do here, let's just bring that up a little bit. I'm going to say for i in 1 to the length of str underscore subset. That means 13. So for i in 1 to 13, so it's going to loop through 1, 2, 3, 4 until we get 13. Print the following. The following that I wanted to print is a string and the string says character and then it is this placeholder dollar i so the first thing is going to say character one the next next time it loops through it's going to say character two and then is a space colon space then a tab remember this column this comma concatenates all of this into one this is a tab so that is code for a tab comma and then the subset string subset i now this is notation for the index of that so this i love julia exclamation mark it, each and every character in that sentence has an index and then comma we're going to have this is a new line so i've just told you there the comma concatenates the whole the commas concatenate the whole lot the backslash t, t is a tab and the backslash n is a new line let's execute that so we can see what happens and indeed there we go so it says character one is an i character two is a space so space counts and that's how we get to 13 with the exclamation mark so we've seen this index thing let's let's uh, slice things up a bit so i've still got this computer variable string uh, str uh, underscore subset and I want from uh, index 1 to 6. So note these are square brackets and 1 to 6. And that is I love. So it's 1, 2, spaces 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 1 to 6, those characters. Let's see what happens if we take 8 till the end. I know the end is 13, but in case you didn't know what the length of your string was, you could just use end. So 8 to end was just going to be Julia exclamation mark. Let's reverse the order. That's a bit of fun. So this says go from end to the first one, but go back in steps of negative one. So we're going to take our string and just reverse it. And that's quite clever. <laughs> I think that's quite clever. So I love Julia, exclamation mark, all in reverse. Now just note the following, just in case you do run into this. Let's uh, correct that spelling mistake there. That looks a lot better. Now note, if we just use one, we're just going to the index one, which is just going to be I, and see it has single quotation marks versus if I say one to one, I'm going to get the double quotation marks. Now we're going to look at this a bit later. The single quotation marks refers to this as a character, a certain character, and this is just part of a string. 
by the double quotation marks. Later on we'll see these single quotation marks. They are all about characters and that is up next. So let's look at characters. Now where before we used the double quotation mark for single characters, we're going to use this single quotation marks. I'm using a new computer variable called str underscore char, char, and I put this single character in there. Let's just see what the type of this is, and that is of type char, character. I can ask what the integer value of this character x is, and I get back 120. So this is ASCII text. Remember, everything in your keyboard would have, uh, almost everything would have an integer representation. And the integer representation of the character x is 120. So look, let's, let's just look at what the zero is. That is this backslash zero uh, character that will be character number zero in the ASCII text. Now, let's just run this again. I love Julia. And let's just see. We're going to say from one to the length of, subs of, of uh, str underscore subset. This is as I love Julia. Again, say character number. We're going to loop through from one to 13. So it's going to say character one, character two, character three is a tab. Then we're going to run through that index from one to 13 with an ASCII integer value of, and then we call it the int, as we did upstairs, string subset i, and then a new line. Let's just run that. We'll quickly see how the code is put together. So character 1 is the i, and with an ASCII integer value of 73. The space you see is 32. There is a space again after the love. It's 32 again. So you can see the integer values in the ASCII text by this simple little loop. And we call that integer value of every character just by this int. And inside of that, we put the computer variables uh, string uh, underscore subset and call its index. So we go from character to character. So let's just do this from for i in one, from i 97 to 104. So we're going to loop through 97, 98, 99, 100, 101, 102, 103, 104. And we plan, print the character value, so char, and then the index i, and then a tab. So let's get see what we get. So from 97 to 104 in ASCII text represents lowercase a, b, c, d, e, f, g, h. Lovely. Now you can do all 0 to 127 then. Uh, you can just take these uh, uh, little hashtags, pound signs away. Uh, these are just the comment marks, remember, you take them away, you can run that, execute that cell, and you can see everything from 0 to 127. Now let's do the following, is valid. So I want to know, is character number 10, is that valid? Indeed, that is true. Now just to show you, we are really dealing with integer values when we do have these single quotation mark characters, h minus e, and uh, that's going to be 3. Because h has an integer value, e has an integer value, they're 3 apart, so we're going to get 3. We can say, is h less than e? No, it's not, because it has a higher integer value. And if I take e and I add 3 to it, it's h. So, Julia is seeing these single quotation mark characters as integer values, and it can do this arithmetic with it. But when it does represent it, it's going to represent not the integer value, but indeed uh, the character. Now let's step over, away from ASCII, to Unicode. Now the Unicode, this is the way you would write a Unicode character. So not char with its integer value, but this backslash u and some numbers. So this is going to read some character. We don't know what it is yet. X in F. Okay, let's run that block of code and we say, oh, it's this upside down A, which in mathematics, of course, stands for for all. So for all X in this function capital F. Now, just be a little bit careful because this, if we wanted the length of the string now or the index of it, what does this Unicode character, does it take up just one space? Well, the reason I'm asking obviously means it's no. So let's just look at what the index value 1 is. It is this upside down A, which as I say in math stands for for all, for all values of. Um, but if I were to ask for 2, I'm going to get this error. Try it out, you'll see you get that error. 
Now we can see what is next, what comes after this in this after value number one in the string that contains uh, a Unicode character and we use this function next ind let's look and it says the next value is four that tells us that that took up three spaces this upside down eight took up three spaces and this first space here is actually index number four so that means we've got this difference between We've got this difference between uh, length because length is going to be false because that single character takes up more than one space. So we can look at this end of this and we can look at length of and we see it's two different things. The length is still going to just count for us. That is going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. But end of of counts those three values for the upside down a for for all sign and takes up three spaces so if you want to run through something be careful for instance in the loop be careful what you do if you do include unicode characters great stuff next up we're going to look at splitting and joining strings Let's carry on by looking at splitting and joining strings. Now, the method for the plus function in Julia cannot handle strings. There's no method for strings. In some languages, you could say string plus another string to concatenate those two. But you will remember from the lesson on functions that we can use multiplication. There's a method for strings with the multiplication function. So if I have, I love times Julia. Now I have to put this little space there because uh, the concatenation here will not, by, mul by the mul multiplication function, will not put a space for you. But if I were to just run that, I'm going to have I love Julia all in one go. Now there's also this string function, and it takes all uh, different arguments, and the arguments here are two strings. Again, I've got to put my little space there because this concatenation is also not going to put in an automatic space for me. So I can certainly do that. Now let's repeat strings. What if you want to write out a few thing, uh, things a couple of times? Here we just use uh, the powers. So I love Julia the string to the power three. And uh, if we do that, it's going to repeat three times. I love Julia, I love Julia, I love Julia. So that is the power function. Now how do we split things? There is the split function. And what the split function is going to do with... Uh, uh, with, without uh, any arguments except for the string, it's just going to look for the space character. So let's run this. Let's see what happens. And if I split that, it's going to have I, Love, and Julia. So it split on the three, on the two spaces, and it made three different substrings here. You can see this as an array, a three element array of substrings of ASCII strings, and there's just one, one dimension, one column. So there, I, have, I love Julia, so the space, spaces, as you can see, are removed. But I can put a second argument in, and that is where we just look at what we want the split to be. So instead of putting no argument and it using space, we can say, well, please split for me on O. Let's see what happens there. So I space L, the O is gone, and that's where the split is, and then VE uh, etc. And then the split is at, there's a space there, the split is at the O for obviously, and another O in obviously. Uh, let's see what happens if I use the split function, and instead of just a single value there, you can see there that I use double quotation marks, so that's actually a string, not a character. And if I, what, what would happen if I put uh, something uh, more than just a single uh, character in there? And as you can imagine, it splits on that word love and it removes that from our array uh, that is the solution. Now, what if I want to split everything? Well, I just use this double quotation marks that is empty inside. And now I have everything split. Remember, as we did before by the index and just using a little for loop. Now, we're going to look at regular expressions a bit later, but in the meantime, have a look at this. I'm going to create this computer variable called str underscore r, and I'm going to 
put into it this string. This is going to be a fairly extended sentence. Let's run that. I've put a semicolon there, so it suppresses the output. Now look at this. I'm going to say split this string, which is this is going to be a fairly extended sentence, but do it this way. So instead of just a uh, whatever single letter, I'm, I'm using this R function here. That tells Julia that I'm dealing with a regular expression here. As I said, we'll have a look, an extensive look at that. And an A, and then this upright bar, which is usually shift and backslash on, say, on the Mac OS keyboard. But anyway, A, or E, or I, or O, or U. Let's see what happens now. So whenever it finds either an A, or an E, or an I, or an O, or an U, so all these vowels that I've selected here, it's going to split. And look at that. That's quite an extensive split. Now, once we split them, something up like this, we can join it up again. So this means I'm going to join this split, which is just going to give me the sentence without the, with all the vowels removed. So this is going to be fairly extended sentence. <laughs> I see. I think you can see what this is getting at. So what I want to show you here is the split function. And once you split, you can recombine them with a join function. Next up, we're going to look at converting our strings into, into uh, integers and some other uh, conversions. Now let's convert strings into integers. Uh, uh, you might have a situation where you're importing some text and it is uh, in a string format, but what you were actually, actually interested in is, is the actual numerical value. And for that, we can use this pass function. So I'm going to create this computer variable called numb and I put this text in it and the semicolon just uh, suppresses the output. Now let's take a look just to make sure that this is indeed ASCII, an ASCII string. Now I'm going to create a new computer variable called val and I'm going to pass as an integer this piece of string. Let's go for it. And now let's look at val. Indeed, it is 1001, which now looks a bit different. And indeed, we can check the type of it. And it is now a 64-bit integer. So that's wonderful. We can import a bit of text and we can convert it into a number. Now let's go in the other direction. So we have this val underscore f floating point value 1001.123. Let's run that. And just to make sure it's a 64-bit float. And instead of pass, I now use string. And it's just uh, this one type of string. So where we used the integer before just to say what we want to pass it to. Here we just say the string function. And we pass uh, that argument. We're going to put this inside of a new computer variable called str underscore f. Let's just do that. Let's print it to the screen. And you can see the quotation marks there. And just to make 100% sure, let's check the type. It is now an ASCII string. So we can go from string to, to numerical value and from a numerical value into a string. Sometimes we're going to import text and it is going to have uh, a matrix like this. 3, 4, 5, 2, 1, 2, 3, 8, 1, 0, 2, 1. Now it is written like this because it might be so in the text file with the uh, Julia notebook, because we've uh, used the carriage return here to go to a new line, it's going to do this uh, green color, which might make it look like a number, but it's all inside of these quota the quotation marks, so it's all just a string. Let me show you. There we go. You see the new line character there. So this is, we can well imagine we've just imported this from a text file. Now just make sure what this file underscore data is. Indeed, it's just a string. But imagine in your text file it was um, typed by someone to represent a, a matrix, a 3 by 4 matrix. Now I can read that in as, as, as an actual matrix. Let's have a look. I'm going to use this read DLM function. It takes this argument IO buffer, which takes an argument this string. I'm going to put this inside of a computer variable, which I've called data. So let's look what data, see what data looks like, and indeed a 3 by 4 array of 64-bit floating numbers, two-dimensional, in other words, there's rows and columns, just to make sure it is now an array of 
64-bit floating point elements two-dimensional. So that's some common use scenarios where you've imported text and you want to convert it to values or imported something that looks like a matrix and you want to convert it to a real matrix or taking a number, going the other way and making a string out of it. In the next section of this lesson, we're going to look at finding and replacing characters and substrings inside of strings. Let's have a look at this. Finding and replacing characters and substrings inside of strings. Now remember, the variable we had before, str underscore r, let's just have a look at what it was again. It says this is, a, this is going to be a fairly extended sentence. Now let's look at this in function. It's going to look for specific characters. It can look for specific characters inside of a string. So in takes the following arguments, what you're looking for, and you see the single quotation marks I'm looking for, character, and inside of this computer variable str underscore r, which is the string, this is going to be a fairly long sentence. And it just returns true. It could find an if inside of that string. So in helps just for Boolean returns, but let's use this contains function. Now for contains, we're going to look for strings. Now just, just watch out. The order of these arguments are the other way around now. So it contains the string that I'm looking for and the string inside of that string I'm looking for. So I'm asking is fairly inside of that string of mine. And indeed, it's true. It's right there. Now, let's look at the search function. So there's quite a few of these, and, and don't get confused between them. Keep these notes handy. So the, note the if is in double quotation marks here. So search, which is the same order of these arguments as the contains, so the string I'm looking for, and if, which is now in double quotation marks. So there we go. It says it found an if. It found only one in position 25. So remember the index of a string in position 25. Now let's do the following. Instead of just looking for an F, I am now doing a search, but I'm doing it on this uh, array of characters. It's characters because I'm using single quotation marks. Let's see what happens there. It just returns one value. Now this is going to be a fairly long sentence uh, where do I have it? This is going to be a fairly long or, or fairly extended sentence. So certainly there are G's in there, there's an I in there, there's an F in there. But it just looks down that array and it looks for the first thing that it can find. And in position 3, there was an I for this, in this. There we go, an I there. So it's the first thing it finds out of that array it's going to return to us. Let's just do this search again, just on this uh, string. And now we're going to put a whole string inside of it. And it says, yes, it found fairly. And it took the index from 25 to 30. A bit of regular expressions using search. And I said, we're going to get to that. Uh, I'll explain to you what this is all about. It says, this is a regular expression. Anything that has it starts with an F. And this dot here is just uh, for anything that follows. It's like kind of like a wild card. And that means right to the end. So the first effort found was a 25, and then everything after that was included. Uh, I'll get to exactly what all of this means. You needn't have put that, but it will get to all of that. Now, replacing substrings or characters using the replace function. So I'm going to say replace inside of my string the word fairly because we know now it's there, with the word very. Let's see what that is. This is going to be a very extended sentence. I can also replace it with an uppercase. So there's, I'm going to take the string, I'm going to replace fairly with its uppercase uh, equivalent. So this is going to be a fairly extended sentence. Now, note what happens now. If I were just to call the string again, even though I've changed it, it's still the same. It is still the same. The very, which we replaced it with, and then the fairly, which was capital, is gone. Because strings are what we call immutable. They cannot be changed after we've created them. So there's no replace with this bang, this exclamation mark. So that certainly does not exist. 
So you'll have to create a new version of that string, a new copy of that string, uh, if you've changed it. Next up, and that is the last section in this lesson, the very exciting world of regular expressions. Here we are, the exciting world of regular expressions. Now we've seen a little bit of regular expressions when we use the search function. And uh, as you can read here, the expressions are, are used to find patterns inside of text. So you can import a bit of text and you can look for certain patterns, which makes for wonderful uh, kind of data mining from text. A lot of things are, are possible. Now Julia implements a pull compatible regular expressions. You can see there, you can Google this, look it up. And uh, the one syntax that I'm going to use here is just this R and then the quotation marks. Let's have a look. So I say here, this is not swearing. I'm just going to show you. I have this R in front of a string. Let's just execute that. There we go. It's there. But let's see what the type of this is. And it is this regex, a reg regular expression. So th uh, definitely a specific type inside of Julia. Now, let's have a look at this. I'm going to have a string, and it's called I love Julia. And I'm just going to ask, is there a match for the word Julia? And I use this regular expression. So it's not going to do a normal search as we, as we had up before. It's going to do this uh, method of using this regular, I shouldn't say the word method here. It's going to use this regular expression to look inside of that and indeed it is true that is there now regular expressions are obviously case sensitive so if i had to if i had put a, a, a lowercase j there obviously that is going to be false now let's go one step further than just boolean returns so what i'm going to do in the next example because this is really what i want to get to i'm going to use split and match combined now let me not give it away Let's have a look at what we're going to do. I'm going to say text one equals, and I have this ABC, ABC, DEF, ABC, DEF, and then BCD, BCD. You can see what we have there. Place it inside the computer variable called text one, and there we have. Now I'm going to use the split function on text one, and I want it to be split on the spaces. Let's do that. And indeed, there we have it ABC, ABC, DEF. We have all of them. Now look at this nice little for loop for me. You can use regular expressions on a for loop. So I'm going to say for i in split text 1 and then the space. So what I'm actually saying for i in this element so it's going to look at ABC, then ABC, DEF, then ABC, DEF, GHI, etc. It's going to say is match the regular expression R, ABC. So it's going to look for this ABC. Just that, ABC, and it's going to say does it match in there? And then this double ampersand sign that means if this was true, then execute that. If this first one was false, don't execute the second bit. That's what this double ampersand signs mean. And then end. Let's execute that. And it's going to look down that list one by one because it's a for loop for i in this split, which gives me this array. So the first one definitely there was an ABC. And the second one there was an ABC. And the third one there was an ABC. The BCD it left out. So this bit returned false for that iteration, so it did not execute this uh, the second part. So it found all the ABCs. Now you can imagine how, how uh, powerful that can be if you imported a bit of text and you were just looking for all certain words to bring them out, or substrings of, of little bits of text. Quite powerful. Now how would you go about... Uh, expanding on this. Now I'm going to use this dot or full stop as a wild card. Now let's have a look at this. I have text 2 and this is a sentence. For this sentence I only want the words with a dot in them. So a dot is this full stop. So I'm looking at the word, finding the word sentence and finding the word them. That could be a very nice thing to do because I might want to not split by word and the spaces between but I want to split by sentence. So let me show you how that works. Now Again, we're just going to split. Let me just run that. Again, we're going to split the text on the spaces, just for now. But you'll see where we'll eventually get to. So I'm again going to split it, and I'm going to find for this match, this dot. I'm only looking for words that, in, that have a dot in them. But remember, a dot is a wild card. 
and I have to, I don't want it at the moment, I just want it to be a real dot. So I have to escape the dot. So escape dot means look for the real dot. Don't use dot here as a wild card. If this is true, it's going to print that line. So as we said, there's only two words with a, with a dot in them, sentence and full stop. Now, let's build some more regular expressions. Text 3 is, this man can fan down with a pan while he ran away from danger. Horrible, horrible sentence, as I said that, my apologies, but for good reason. Think what we're going to find here. So I'm, again, I'm just going to split the text into each and every word by this split function here. Now look at this. Is match a regular expression, and I put this PRD in square brackets and then AND. What this means is find any of these words attached, any of these letters Characters, I should say, attached to these two. So I can have pan or ran or dan. That's what it's saying. This is true. Print that line for me. Let's see what happens. And indeed it found pan, ran, and danger because there is a D-A-N in there, danger. So if you, if you have different words but they have a common bit to them, this is the way that you would build it up. Say, for instance, you want... Not You want a, a result not to have those in. So not pan, not ran, and not dan. You just put this power sign, shift 6, on most keyboards in front of it. So now we're going to get Mac back man, can, and fan. You see why I did that ugly sentence? Just so that I have all these A-N words. Anyway, man, can, and fan. Good, now let's use this wild card thing that I was talking about. So I'm not going to use dot in its real sense. I'm going to use it as a wild card. So again, we're just splitting. We're just splitting. And now regular expression and, and the wild card. It says anywhere where there's an an and anything after that. It doesn't care. So let's just see what it returns. The only thing it returned was danger because danger is the, anything, is the only one that had an and in and something that followed the an all the others remember pan ran man can fan had nothing after the an except a space and the space doesn't count here so an with that and the reason why the space is not counting remember is because we split it split it on the spaces so we just have this array of single words okay let's use some ranges anna and barbara have a cat its name is dan Let's have that as our text. We're going to split it by the spaces. So we're going to have Anna, and and Barbara, and have, and A, and cat, etc. And that cat, obviously, is going to be cat, comma. And the it's, is have, it's going to have this apostrophe S because it's only splitting on the spaces. And the last one's going to be Dan, dot. Now I can say, find this for me. Is match R A to C in, uh, inside this brackets? And they're all uppercase. So see what it's going to find for me. Anything that starts with an A or a B or a C in capital letters. Now let's change this to text 5 and now I'm going to have Anna and Barbara have a black cat. Now I've introduced this black and this lowercase c for cat. And what if I still wanted to include that cat but it now has a lowercase c? Well I'll just say A to B and a C. And it's got to start with these, as you can see by that square brackets. So now I'm going to catch uh, uh, a lot more. Now, at first glance, this might be slightly confusing because it returned a B for black cat, and that's lowercase as well. But this is actually saying A to B and C. Uh, and because that's a lowercase, it's doing the lowercase ones for those as well. So that's one that, that can really catch you up. Just make sure you uh, 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 recognize what is going on there if you wanted to use it. Now let's use this long, 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 long sentence which will end soon. Thank goodness. Now let's find words with at least two O's. So again, I'm going to split this on the spaces and I'm going to use this way. Anything that has an O in it. So there's no square brackets there, so this O can be anywhere, and I want at least two of them, which I put in these curly braces. So let's run that. So it found long with two, two O's, three O's, one, two, three, four O's, and the word soon. It was all of them had two or more 
double O's in them, and that long didn't count. Now this is for intersect. Let's just change this to long go. What, oh, let's put his O there. What do you think is going to happen now? Let's have a look. Because suddenly there are two O's in there now. Let's have a look. And it's still not there because this says two of them in a row. So certainly finding two O's that are separate from each other uh, is not caught by these curly braces. Now let's do this. This long lesson which will end more or less soon. There we go. Now let's look at this. I want these double S's but I'm putting wildcards in front of them and behind them. Again, I'm running down this array of words because I've split them just by the space. So let's look, have a look at that. So the only one that it found with a double S was this lesson, but it didn't find that less because there had to be something after that. And in the array, it was just less, L-E-S-S -S with nothing after the S. This says, this wildcard says there must be something after the S. Let's have a look at using this plus and star signs. What do you think is going to happen here? Well, let me just tell you the plus, see as I've used it here, a double O, find for me anywhere in the word a double O and a plus means at least one or more, whereas this asterisk refers to zero or more. So let's just have a look at that. So look for me for any double O, somewhere where there's a double O or one or more of those. So it found one, and yet found one and two of them actually, and it, yet found quite a few of them, and there's another soon there. So you can use that plus sign. Let's just do this with the SS and just see what happens. It says zero or more, because now it's returning stuff with just a single S in them. There's a single S, there's a single S because that is what the star means. Find something that is zero or more. So it's going to find that S and then for this S, zero or more. Now, it's exactly the same as if we have just done this. All I wanted is to find me something with an S in it. Let's look for numbers inside of text. Now, here is one. There was a significant difference between the two groups. 33 versus 44 p-value was 0.34. Now, this should say insignificant because certainly eh, it's not a significant p-value. Let's save that. This was an insignificant, there was an insignificant difference between the two groups. 33 versus 44p equals 0.34. Now, let's find anything that has a number in it. But if we're going to split on the spaces, we're certainly going to have this as an element in our array. That with the comma as an element in the array and all of that. Uh, in, in the array. Okay, so let's have a look. Let's try and catch this. Catching anything with a digit in it, and I'm going to use this wildcard backslash D, because I've, I've got to use this backslash D. It's a, it's a wildcard for digits. I can't just put D, because then it's going to find, it's going to find uh, the letter D for me. And indeed, that's what we have. We have this open parenthesis 33, the 40, 44 with a comma, and 0 0.034 with the closing parentheses. Now I can do this as well. It's going to achieve exactly the same thing. Find anything for me in this range with a 0 to 9 in it. So it's going to be exactly the same. We're going to do that. Now let's just change this again to insignificant. That's horrible. Let's do that. We have the sentence again. But now uh, we've changed it ever so slightly. You'll see from the one at the top. And I'm going to use this backslash W, uppercase W. And what that's going to do for me is to return these digits. But look at that. The 44 is gone. So it's looking for something that has numbers in them. But these other characters as well. So that is a wildcard for alphanumerics. Find me anything that contains alphanumeric values. So there's got to be both characters and numbers in them. Now, let's look at the substring. We're almost there. Now, there was no statistically significant difference. The p-value was 0.3. The difference was not statistically significant. There was no significant difference. You can well imagine that you're reading a journal article, import that text, and there's various ways of just use three here of writing or stating 
by the use of words that something was statistically insignificant. And that's all you wanted to find in that text. Find me all the sentences that are, find me all the sentences that contain those words. Now, one way that we could split this up is by using this so backslash dot. So that means this dot is not used as a wild card. So just remember that. And then something with a space. So I want something with a dot and a space. That would be one way to split this up in sentences. The only problem that you're going to have here is over there. So it wants a dot and a space. So actually that's not going to cause a problem. So because there's a dot and a space, so it's going to split the sentence off there. So let's do that and let's build up all these different ways. So if you quickly paste through or run through an article, you might find all of these different ways to state things. Sometimes it's even these capitals, this NS. So I'm going to use find for me no stat with a wild card. That means anything that has no stat and anything after that. Or not stat or no sig with a wild card, not sig with a wild card or ns. And if that's true, print that line for me. And indeed it found all three of those sentences. There was no statistically significant difference. The difference was not statistically significant. There was no significant difference. So see how quickly you can find, if you think how you can combine this with a p value and these non significant, you can quickly go through an article and you can find without having to read all the article, the whole article, you can quickly gather this data from a text file just using regular expressions. So I hope that was a, an easy enough introduction to regular expressions. They are very powerful. Play with them. They're quite a bit of fun. So the package that we're going to look at in this lesson is Gadfly. It's a beautiful plotting uh, library, which is data aware. In other words, not only can you pass actual values uh, in the form of arrays or matrices to be plotted, but you can also use data frames. So what are we going to get up to? We're going to uh, just have a quick introduction to Gadfly. We're going to do a few simple plots, just passing our own values. We're going to uh, add some layers to our plots, just building up various layers to add more information to our plots. We're going to use themes to change uh, various aspects of the themes. We're going to add titles and axes labels. I'm going to show you how to save plots. And then we're going to import a data frame, some uh, data uh, database values. And uh, with that, we're going to do some box and whisker plots, histograms, violin plots, uh, my favorite QQ plots, uh, some scatter plots, and uh, vertical and horizontal lines. And finally, we'll just do a few more examples just to showcase uh, a few of the other things that Gatfly can do. So we start off by just uh, importing the package there by using, uh, using Gatfly. If you have uh, not imported it, remember we are still here in Julia Box. If you haven't import imported it, just use the pkg.add and then get fly. So simple plots, there we go. I'm going to create two uh, arrays, uh, column vectors if you want, of 100 values each. I'm going to uh, call it uh, two, I'm going to add those values to two computer variables and I'm gonna call them X vals and Y vals. You can call them whatever you want. And rand is one of the built-in functions of Julia and it's going to generate random values between zero and one. And I want 100 of those. I'm going to have 100 values between 0 and 1 inclusive and 100 values between 0 and 1 for my second vector. And now we're going to invoke plot. So plot is a function of Gatfly. We've imported the Gatfly package so we can just use the function plot. And I'm going to see on the x-axis equals my 100 x values please and for every x value plot its corresponding y value on the y-axis. Now these x and y and its values, they are referred to as the aesthetics of the plot. Now let's run that. First time that we run that, it's going to take a while. We have not, of course, run this first block just to generate that those numbers. There they are. 
uh, we see the uh, array of values and uh, let's do this bit let's plot those it's going to take a while before it generates on the julia box side that plot for us and it will render it to the screen let's have a look and there we go our first plot we see the x-axis we see the y the x-axis the y-axis and you see all those 100 dots each with its own x and y coordinate now the x and y as i mentioned those are the acidic and there's a geometry and the geometry in this instance it was a scatter plot is our points but gadfly can infer the fact that we're using this geometry which are which uh, we call points and uh, you'll see here i didn't even have to add it i just said x and y but i can add the geometry by just specifying it and the keywords there are geom for geometry dot point and if i were to execute that line of code we'll get exactly the same plot if i uh, hover over the plot you see i can zoom in and zoom out of the plot very nice and these grid lines appear uh, on my plot as well so we can not only pass the actual values but we can perform some function on these values as well and here i'm going to sort my x values and then sort the 100 y values before i plot them of course i've lost my initial correlation between the two but just to show you that i can sort from sort we go from the smallest to the largest value from the small to the smallest to the largest so each dot is now going to have a different x y coordinate but they are sorted from minimum to maximum value so i can pass these functions to the values to these aesthetics before i actually plot them now let's create another set of values i'm going to call them x vals 2 and y vals 2 and again just a random function random variables, variables between 0 and 1 inclusive and I want 15 of each and then I'm going to plot x as the x vals 2, y as the y vals 2 I want a geometry dot point but I add a second geometry I want a line geometry as well so both of these geometries are going to refer to these the set of, of acidics so let's run that block of code and there we go so it's done the points for me exactly the same points of, as we've had before and it adds a line to them now instead of just connecting the dots i can uh, i can do this another geometry called geom.smooth and uh, so that is just going to create this almost polynomial graph in between representing all of these plots and it is not clearly stated on the gadfly website but it does take a, a, a few methods in this instance instead of this polynomial uh, line which is just the default i'm going to specify a linear model now look what happens here it's going to use these squares at least i think it does and it's going to plot this linear model line for representing uh, uh, this uh, uh, all these data points as this single line so that is our introduction you and uh, just to show you how gadfly works that it uses these aesthetics x and y later on we get we can to see that we can add third dimensions of data on two-dimensional plots gadfly is inherently a two-dimensional plotting package but we can add a third dimension by using color if we introduce color we can actually uh, uh, plot three dimensions on a graph or these three dimensions worth of data on a plot we see the geometry and we can add more than one geometry onto each of these plots in the next section we're going to add some layers and play with themes and we can add a lot more to these plots So let's add some layers. So you can see this plot that uh, the function from Gadfly that I've had before, and I'm just going to add these layer functions, and they are separated by commas. So there's my first layer. Here's my second layer. It's separated by commas, and it takes arguments inside of parentheses. So what can I do? Inside of this, I just use what I would have used for my plotting. So I have my aesthetics: x equals x vals two, y equals y vals two. And the geometry I want for those sets of values is the point. And in the second layer, I want them sorted. 
So I'm passing the sort function to the values as the acidic before I actually plot some points on them as well. So two sets of plots actually that I layer on top of each other. And there you see them. Only problem is they're all colored in blue. I can't really distinguish between these two layers that I've added to my plot. Now I can add some extra arguments to these layer functions here, but an easy way to get uh, to get to it is just to to do some themes. Now let's do this. I'm going to have my two layers again, layer and layer. And the first one is x vowels and y vowels as uh, two as far as my aesthetics are concerned, a geom dot point. And my second layer, exactly what I've had before, but I'm adding a theme. And the theme takes a lot. There are a lot of arguments, and depending on the type of geometry you use, you can introduce certain themes, and some arguments to the themes use, uh, work for all plots. What we are going to pass here is default color. And because it's inside of this layer, it's only going to pertain to these little point geometries of these aesthetics in this layer. And I'm passing, passing it uh, this value colorant orange. So there's a certain colors that you can use their words. Other words otherwise, you can use hexadecimal values just with the hashtag. But this uh, instance, I'm going to use orange. Let's look at what the... Uh, what the output looks like. Now I can distinguish between the two layers. The first one was this deep sky blue. That's what this blue is called. In case you were wondering, deep sky blue, all one word. And the second layer is now going to have a default color called orange. So all the geometry, and in this instance, it's the point, point geometry, is going to be colored orange. Now I can distinguish the two sets of points. Now, I want to show you just to add a legend because as you can see by default the default here there's no legend not for these point plots or scatter plots and with that i also just want to show you a different way to use to way to use the layers you can use the layer layers like this just to add a layer to a computer variable so i'm going to call it points one and points two and points one is layer my x and y aesthetics as point and it has a theme and that default color is colorant deep sky blue. That's what it was anyway. And points two is another layer. In parentheses, all the arguments that I would have done before. It's point and theme default color colorant orange. Note there's no parentheses there. It's colorant orange. And instead of orange, as I said, you can use hashtag and then the, the hexadecimal values. Now I can invoke the plot function and instead of layers, I've got points one and points two, which refer to those layers. And this is how I'm going to add, this is how I'm going to add just that little key to the side. And I use this keyword called guide. So that's a new one, guide.manual underscore color key. And it takes parentheses, it's a function, and it takes a various arguments. The first argument that it's going to take is just the the uh, title legend for this plot is what i'm going to call the this the the legend comma and then you see we've got this list in square brackets set of points sorted set of points so i can actually pass string values to the legend that i'm going to use so the blue these blue dots are going to be called set of points because that was the first lot that was mentioned, the first layer that was mentioned. There's a second layer mentioned, so that's going to take this string sorted set of points. And then comma, the last argument that it takes is you can actually specify the colors. So again, I stuck to deep sky blue and orange there, so I passed deep sky blue and orange to my legend. Now, let's have a look at that. So we're going to get exactly the same plot as we had before. But now we have this legend. And I specified this text legend for this plot. I specified this text set of points and sorted set of points. And I specified these two colors, all in this guide.manual color key. So great. Now you can add legends to your plot. Now, one thing is this, uh, this grid that we have here, um, I can actually specify the color of this grid. So I'm going to do just go back to an easy one, just with two layers again, the second one being orange. But inside of the theme, which applies to the whole plot this time, 
look that it's outside of this layer, this layer with its uh, open and close parentheses there. So it's going to apply to the whole. It's going to apply to the whole of the uh, of the plot. And instead, see in this one, I've got these dotted J lines. Now it's all white. The background is all white, and you can pass a different color to it. Now. If I, uh, if I hover over it, it's still going to come up. But when I move away, I've changed the color to white, so you don't see those dotted lines. Later on, I'll show you another way of getting rid of that by just uh, decreasing the size of it really to zero. But you can see the difference. Grid color, that is not the background color, that's this, these gray lines. If I move away, they're white and you can't see them. They are still there. And in this instance, when I move away, they're actually visible as this light gray. So I, I can also change this mouse over color to white as well. That will make them disappear as well. Let's do that. So everything stayed, stayed the same. I'm also changing the grid color focused argument in this the themes argument to white as well so that's one kind of cheating way of getting rid of even if i mouse over now if I, if I did a mouse over there you can see the lines appear if i do now they do appear but they're just white they're the same as the back default background color of my plot now let's just increase a line thickness a bit using another argument that we find inside a theme so we, the aesthetics that we're going to pass is x as x vals 2 y is y vals 2 is point I want a line in there as well, but I want a linear model as far as at least like, like least squares line that I've got in there, linear model line. And I can specify inside of the theme line width, and I want it to be 4px, that's 4 pixel. You've got to put the units in. You can use inches, centimeters, I think there's, there's quite a few things. So we've had this plot before, but inside of the theme, I can actually just make this whole line a lot thicker. Good. Last thing I just wanted to look at uh, were these themes. We'll get to add a lot more things to themes later, but just as an introduction, we can also uh, uh, change the colors. Now look what I've done here. So it's plot with a layer. The first layer is going to be a point geometry with this these aesthetics, and it has a theme with a default point size of 10 pixels. So instead of these small little ones, which are the default, I'm going to increase that. In the second layer, I'm passing the same, I'm passing exactly the same aesthetics, but I'm doing this linear model line called smooth, method equals colon lm for line, and the theme I pass to that is a line width of four pixels and a different color. This time I'm doing default color equals colorant orange. So I think you can well imagine what this is going to look like. So what I've done now is I've changed the default size of this in the theme of the first layer. The second layer is this linear model line and I've made it thicker with line width. So you can see this line width there and the default color. So looks uh, uh, quite spectacular there. Last thing quickly for this, uh, for this section is I'm just going to add some labels. We've seen how to add our legend, but we can also introduce this new keyword called guide, guide.title, guide.xlabel, guide.ylabel. And as you can well imagine, that is just going to put some text, a title and X and Y. So you see the aesthetic that I passed there and the geometry was point, but now I've got my title, my scatter plot. That's the text that I use and X values and Y values were the two strings that I passed here. Lastly, if you want to save your plots, of course, this is iJulia inside of a Jupyter Notebook. I can uh, do various things, but if I want to use Julia just to save these plots, I'm going to import this Cairo package using Cairo. And uh, I'm just going to in, uh, import distributions as well because I've created a little plot here. There you see the plot and I'm using some distributions there. Don't be, don't be concerned about that and stat and all sorts of things that I'm using here. It's just a normal plot function, so don't worry what's inside of there. But inside of Cairo, I have this draw function. Draw, it takes arguments, the first argument P and G, because I want a P and G, portable network graphic file format for my plot, and give it a name. 
and I can specify the size in either pixel size or inches or centimeters. Here I've chosen eight inches by six inches, comma, and then it takes the actual plot. So you can do it all in one as I've done here. And if I run this, nothing is going to happen. But if I were to go back, I suddenly see, there it is, my QQ plot has appeared. And uh, depending on the browser that you use, you can actually uh, print that uh, to the screen. But it will save that for you. In this instance, we're using Julia Box, so I can go into uh, my files here uh, and uh, sync, and I can actually download it to my computer. Good. And the next section, we're going to import a data frame, and that's what we're interested in. Gadfly is data aware, so I can actually plot some data straight from a data frame. So let's get to plot some data. Now I'm going to import the data frames package. And from that, we have this read table. Now I do have uh, video material on the data frames package. You can also watch the first of our mini projects, which was on medical statistics, just to have a look at the data frames package. I'm going to just run through it without explaining much. There is a CSV file that lives right in the folder that I'm working with. There it is, ccs.csv, a comma separated value file, and I'm going to import it as a data frame with the read table function, and I'm going to import that into this computer variable that I just called df. Let's do that. It'll take a while just to import that. There we go. And let's look at the tail of that data frame, and that's going to print out to the screen for us the last few rows. So we see we have the following patient. There seems to be up to num patient number 200, a gender. We have their ages, and then we have variable one, variable two, variable three and four, and category one, which seems to be A's and B's, category two, which seems to be C, X and R's, and category three, which seems to have P and R values, when we're only seeing the last six row entries of this uh, spreadsheet, or this comma separated value file, which is now a data frame. And uh, I do that using this tail function. I can look at all of these columns and I can just look at the uh, type of data that they contain. I see the patient column, see all the list of columns there and the patient is integer 64 data type. The gender seems to be a string, the age an integer 64 bit integer, variable 64 bit float, variable two seems to be an integer. Uh, variable three a float, variable four an integer, and then strings, and we see that we have no missing values. Very quickly, I'm not going to explain much, we can just get these uh, descriptive statistics, describe the data frame, open and close, square brackets, colon gender, that refers to the column name, and we see it has a length of 200, again it's all strings, there are no, uh, no uh, um, empty or missing values there and we and we see it finds two unique entries and I can check what those are by writing this by function it takes the arguments data frame the column and then it in, in inserts this new variable called D such that we create this data frame with a new column name in and it takes the arguments the sign of size of whatever it finds let me show you what that means Remember it said it found two unique types of entries in the gender column and indeed it found an F and an M and the N counts the size of that. Found 100 instances of F and 100 instances of M. So there we go, we can describe the age column. Now the reason why I put it out here is once we start plotting so that you can see if we do box plots, you're gonna see the mean of 46 on those graphs. So describe just gives the summary stats of mean, median, uh, 25th percentile, 50th percentile, the third quartile, which is the 75th percentile maximum, which is the fourth quartile or 100th percentile. And we can do go through age, we can do through variable one, we can go through variable two, variable three. It's all pretty self-explanatory. And we see uh, variable four there. Now remember, we get to category 
and it's going to tell us again that it finds 200 entries, no missing values, it's a string data type, sorry, no missing values, and it finds two unique entries, and by writing this by function, I can create a new small little data frame which will tell me it found A and B, and again, 100 instances of each. Let's just look at category two. It found three unique entries, and I can just look at what those are and how many they are, now this is important to be able to do because if, if we're going to do box plots which just counts, it needs this precompiled information. It needs to know that there is this. So you will construct a bar plot from this new data frame that you create here from the data frame. It won't be able to count the instances in Gatfly itself. Let's look at category, category three. There we see it. And again, the unique entries in it found P, a Q, and an R, 90 Ps, 44 Qs, and 66 instances of R. So let's do our first bit of plotting, a box plot. Again, we have imported, we have imported um, getfly, so we can just use the plot function, but it is data aware. So I can just pass it the computer variable that I uh, used to, to uh, for my data frame. I called it df, so I can refer to df. Now for my aesthetics, I can say, well, look down the gender column um, for the x-axis. So remember that was categorical data. So it was going to do one box plot of f and one box plot of m. And what do I want these box plot values to be of? Well, for my y-axis, look at the age column. The geometry that I want you to do with this aesthetic is the box plot geometry, comma, and I'm going to give it a guide.title. We've looked at that, and a guide.x label, which is gender. So let's run that code and see our very first box plot. And there's beautiful deep sky blue, blue box plots. As I told you, it found. Uh, two unique entries, female and male, and a charts. There we have our median. We saw before what it was when we just looked at our descriptive statistics. And we have these beautiful little box plots. Now I can play around with them in with themes, uh, arguments for the theme function again. Remember uh, uh, the theme there. So again, plot, it's data, data frame away. So I pass it the data frame argument. X is this time a gender this time, Y is age, just as we had before, geom.boxplot, a box plot geometry. I'm adding the same title and X axis label. And but you see it would also do it automatically. We did not specify the Y label, but it took the column name age and it attached that to the Y uh, label itself. So theme. The first argument I'm going to use is box plot space box plot spacing underscore spacing and I'm going to put it at 100 pixels so that's the spacing between these two box, box plots my grid color I'm going to do color and white again and the default color is another argument that it takes and that's going to change this color this deep sky blue to something else and I'm just using hexadecimal code here so hashtag a a a a a a so you know it's going to be a bit of a green and last thing I'm going to do is the middle width that's this line, the median line for the two. I can change that as well. So look how beautiful the, this new plot uh, of mine is going to be. That looks brilliant. I've changed the color to this gray. I've thickened this line up. I've uh, made them smaller by increasing this um, uh, box plot spacing in between those two. So let's play a bit more with this box plot. Let's pass something else we're going to pass uh, the data frame for x we're going to pass category three for y we're going to do a variable two the geometry on this aesthetic comes from uh, the box plot box plot geometry i'm going to add a title box plot of variable two values for category three groups i just give that a name my x-axis is category 3 groups. I don't pass y because this is going to say variable 2, but I could pass a guide.y label. And let's play around with the theme. I'm going to give it a default color of orange. We know how to do that. The grid color, I want white, so I don't see those little gray lines. Now I'm introducing something, grid color focused. I think we had, had a look at it before, actually. It's just when you mouse over that you don't see that, so I'm changing that to white as well. The box plot, box plot spacing 
is 80 pixels this time, and yes, something new, default, default point size. Because there are gonna be, I'm telling you now, I know for, for a fact, because I created that CSV file, that there are some statistical outliers. And I can give them a default point size. I'm going to make that seven pixel. Now look at this beautiful graph. So all constructed there. Um, um, that is that is aesthetically pleasing. Shall I use that term? So there's my title. Y axis was grabbed from the column name. X axis I actually entered some uh, string uh, uh, value there that I wanted. And look, the color's nice and orange. I've got this nice spacing in between, making my box plots a bit smaller. If I mouse over, the grid is gone. Uh, it's not gone, it's just white. And then look at these statistical outliers with quite a large little dots. So that looks beautiful. Now I can add another dimension to my box plot data, and that is going to be done by this Y group. So this was all just category three, but I can add another group. So let's do exactly the same. So, or, or let's at least say category one for my X axis, instead of category three, we had three there. Let's use category one, variable two still, but I'm going to add this new argument called Y group and that's gender. So it's going to do these two rows of box, plot for, box plots for me because they're two unique entries for gender. And then I've got to use a special, I've got to use a special a geometry called geom.subplotgrid. So I've got to use that. And inside of that, I pass the argument geom.boxplot because I want those to be box plots. Next argument, theme. And it takes its own set of arguments, remember. And what are we going to use here as default color? We're going to make it orange again. Grid color white, grid color focused, also white. Let's just see. So it's just adding this extra dimension to our data. Let's have a look at it. Wait for it to, to render, and there we go. So it says variable two by gender. It added that for me, and it found female and male. And category one, it had two unique entries, A and B, and it takes variable two, and it makes all these little box plots for you. So just adding that extra dimension by this Y group. Good, in the next section, we're going to start looking at density plots and histograms followed by some of violin plots. So let's have a look at a density plot. It's another type of geometry. Now remember what a density plot is. It takes a continuous variable on the x-axis and it creates this density estimate so plot again, it's data away, so I pass the data frame, data frame, df data frame to it, and on the x-axis I want age, and the geometry for all the age variables is the density. I'm going to give it a guide.title, age distribution, and again for theme, what I usually do, color grid, color grid focus, both white just to make everything disappear, and then line width, because density plots are lines, and I'm going to give it quite a thick line at four pixels. Let's wait for that to render from uh, Julia Box, and there we see. So it takes this continuous variable called age, and it gives us this kernel density estimate plot. So we can see the, the age distribution of our data set. Now, I can add another dimension to this data by color. Now, it uses the term color, but remember, it doesn't really have anything to do with color. It, it, it just states that I want to to add another dimension. So I'm going to look at age again, but I'm going to break it up by gender. So every gender, male and female, with, will have its own kernel density estimate. Again, the, ge the geometry is density. I'm going to give it a new title and everything else we have seen before. This time I'm not passing a line width argument. So it's going to be nice thin little lines, which is the default. Let's have a look. There we go. So by color, it found it found two different entries, male and female, and it gives us this little key. It found F and M, and it added these default colors for us. Let's carry on. Let's just look at another one. This time I'm going to use category three, just because remember there were some more, uh, there were more uh, categories. There were three different ones, P, Q, and R, and you'll see it'll do for the age distribution, it'll do a kernel density estimate, a probability plot there of, 
of um, uh, density plot, I should say, of uh, all three of these of these categories. Let's look have a look at one more, and uh, this time it's variable two by distribution in the categories. Let's have a look at that. So we can we can have a look. We can see this this is much. There's a uh, as far as variable two is concerned, it has a more normal distribution, perhaps than the age distribution that was not did not follow a, a normal distribution. So it helps us really to have a closer look at this data, perhaps give us slightly more information than just the box plots themselves. So let's move on to histogram, which is basically a density plot. Well, I mean, it's, it's uh, uh, a bit more uh, involved than that, but we're just going to make little bins still out of continuous variable on the x-axis. So it's, it's almost exactly the same. So instead of age, I'm using variable one year on the x-axis, which is a continuous variable. And I'm passing uh, the geometry to it as uh, geom.histogram. I'm giving it a title and I'm using some theme arguments there as well. Let's have a look at that variable one let's have a look at what its just distribution was seems to be quite random variable one's not really following a distribution pattern but it is a continuous variable here at the bottom and it has decided on its own what the size of these little bins are see these are how thin they are that is a count of how many values occur between two sets of x-axis values that's what a histogram is but I can specify the bin count in the histogram geometry. Bin count equals, and I've passed the value of 10 here, which is going to take this variable, instead of having these tiny little bins, we see the bins are quite a bit bigger. Quite a bit bigger. Once again, we can see here that the data is really not normally distributed. So let's have a look at this. Let's have a look at uh, variable two. We saw that it had a more normal distribution. Let's use 11 bin counts. Let's have a look at that. And there we go. We see that normal distribution that we saw on the kernel density estimate before. Let's look at variable two, but we add another dimension to it. I want two histograms. I'm going to split them up by color because I know it's, no, it's two because I know there was male and female. So let's have a look at what Gatfly does there. Beautifully, it will plot one on top of the other. Again, I've specified a bin count, this time 21, and it will plot one in front of the other so that you could see the both of them. So I have both um, histograms there together. Now, violin plot combines actually what we saw in the box and whisker plots with a density estimate. It actually just uh, puts a density estimate on its side and uh, duplicates it on both sides so you get this nice little uh, idea uh, let's have a look at it i'll show you remember category for uh, uh, remember category two that's going to be my x-axis so this is like a box plot and on the y we're going to take variable one and the geometry is violin let me show you what it looks like in case you are not familiar with a violin plot so there we are so on the side here you can see the little kernel density estimate but it duplicates it on both sides, so you get this nice little idea of a box plot, but indicating the density as well. So violin plots are quite uh, quite a nice thing to do. Now let's add uh, something else to it. I've got category three here as a uh, as a as a color. Let's have a look at what happens now. Now. This is density, and that's what I wanted to show you. So if you were just to look at these P, there's P, and you see the shape of that P, and you can well see the shape of it as it lies there. And Q, you see this big dip in the Q, and there's that big dip in the Q, and then you see R, this more, more of a, almost, not almost normal, but more of a normal distribution there to the R variable. Next up, in the next section, we're going to have a look at one of my favorite type of plots, a QQ plot. So let's have a look at a QQ plot. Now, QQ plot really helps you to decide if, uh, if you're going to use hypothesis testing and statistics 
uh, whether to use parametric or non-parametric tests. Let's have a look at that. So again, plot, we are going to pass uh, something new. The stat argument here, stat.qq, statistics.qq. Now let's have a look at what we have for our static. x equals rand. Now, when I showed you how to do the save of a plot, I did import the distributions package using distributions. Chi-square is one of the distributions that it can uh, do, and normal as well. So chi-square takes one argument, the lambda argument here. So it says take random values from a chi-square distribution with a lambda value of 1, and please take 100 random data points from this distribution randomly and attach it to the x aesthetic y equals just normal open close parenthesis so that's the normal distribution with uh, the standard normal with a mean of zero standard deviation of one and plot this uh, as a geometry a point geometry but use the qq statistic on these aesthetic let me show you what happens Let's just see. Oh, distributions. Let's just add that. It seems that, the, that uh, uh, the kernel had stopped in between. So let's insert cell above. And let's do that. Let's say using distributions. There we go. So let's run this code again. This, and uh, there we go. It will work. Now look at this. So on my x-axis, I have my x values and this is a qq plot so it plots every point versus its quantile and but it's using using this uh, normal for the y value if i put in normal here these points should be on a straight line if these data point values were from a normal distribution clearly they do not follow a straight line so clearly these values are not from a normal distribution and indeed they weren't i cheated i put them as a chi square distribution with a lambda of one so this plot tells me if i wanted to use these x values in hypothesis tests i should use a non-parametric test now let's use that on some of our own data so what are we going to do so we're going to plot our x is our variable one but i've got to sort it so i can say data frame the variable one column take all those values sort them and that's my x aesthetic for my y aesthetic i've got to pass the normal function because i just want to see whether this is the whether variable one does follow a normal distribution but i can't just use open and close parentheses not standard normal distribution I've got to give it a normal distribution based on the mean and standard deviation of all the values in variable one. So I've got to say mean data frame variable one comma standard deviation data frame variable one. So it's going to construct the mean and, and standard deviation from the values in variable one. And it's going to construct from that a normal distribution. Now it's going to look at each and every value from the minimum to the maximum value. It's going to apply the statistics, this QQ, so it's going to look at the quantile of each. And what I'm doing here, I am comparing it to a normal distribution. Let's see if variable 1 followed a normal distribution. Indeed, it didn't. Again, these plots, uh, these dots are not on the same line. So once again, if I was going to use variable 1, I should not use a parametric test. Let's do exa the exact same thing for variable 2. So everything is the same and we've just gone on to variable two and indeed it looks like these points do fall on a straight line so i would suggest that this the sample data was taken the, the participants were taken from a from a population in which that variable x or variable two in this instance was normally distributed so if i were to uh, do a hypothesis test i would use a parametric test on this let's have a quick look at variable three at variable three and again i'm doing the q the stat.qq on a normal distribution so i could check it against other distributions i could see whether this was in fact whether it followed a chi square distribution with whatever lambda value i'm interested in so i could have put chi square there and say for instance uh, in parentheses just one for lambda equals one and it will change these if that then becomes a straight line that would mean that this followed a chi-square distribution 
and indeed with this kind of distribution based on a QQ statistic for a normal distribution based on the mean and standard deviation uh, of the values in variable 3, this does look to me like it was constructed as a, as a chi-square uh, distribution. Good, in the next section we're going to revisit scatter plots and I'll show you how much more you can do with the point geometry. Let's have a look at these scatter plots. We've seen them before, so it's plot, it's data frame aware, so I'm passing it the name of my data frame df. On the x-axis I'm going to have variable 1, on the y-axis variable 2. So remember if you do use these aesthetics for a point or a geometry, that you really have to uh, have equal number of, remember when we looked at missing, there were no missing and each of them Variable 1 and variable 2 had 200 entries for each because this is XY coordinates and so you must have pairs for both. I'm going to add another layer to uh, or another dimension to my data by using the color argument and to that I am looking at category 3. It's going to be points but I also want this line according to a linear model so a straight line to best fit all my data points. Now I'm going to do something else. I'm going to pass this color key category 3 and then theme line width remember that's going to be the line of this geom uh, the smooth geometry linear model line I'm going to make that 3 pixels let's have a look what happens just with this color key guide there we go so that was the name remember that we used before takes more arguments but here the name of this legend that we have on the side so I gave it this name category space 3 to give us this legend and you'll also see that these lines are a bit thicker because I used the line argument, line width argument of three pixels as far as that line is concerned. You see the three lines and they're both straight because we're using the linear model as the method for our smooth line. Let's look at something else. We're going to add an, yet another dimension by this Y group. Remember the Y group, we can do that all we have to do this time is remember to pass the subplot underscore grid and then last time we only passed one argument to it, one geometry to it, that was geom.boxplot but I can, I can add more than one. So geom.point and geom.smooth, this time again linear model and I want my line thickness there and my grid color in the theme. So it says variable 2 by category 3 and category 3 had P, Q and R so it is performing this subplot grid and the Y group is split up by category 3. That's why it adds this title, this axis title by category 3. Good. Next type of plot I want to show you, this one example, and that is just vertical and horizontal lines. So let's pass data frame X equals variable 1, Y is variable 2, and I pass a y-intercept and I can pass uh, uh, this list of values 90 and 110. Geom dot point, so it'll take the aesthetics x and y and make points of them. But I'm also passing a horizontal line with a certain color. The color is red. And the h line, the horizontal lines, are going to use the y-intercept argument values. There's an x-intercept, I'm going to do that at 10 and 22, and the geometry of that is going to be a v-line, and I'm passing a size. So you can see I can pass both color arguments and size arguments to h-line and v-line geometries. Let's have a look at that. So my two horizontal lines were indeed red at its default thickness, and the vertical lines they were at the default color, but I passed a size argument so they're a bit thicker. And look at the X and Y intercepts exactly where I placed them. I'm going to finish off just by a few more examples. Just some examples that you might not use too often. First one is step lines. Let's have a look at that. First one is horizontal, then vertical. So i have taking three, 30 random uh, uh, data point values, 30 random data point values, I'm attaching that to the computer variables x and y, and I'm using those as my aesthetic, passing a point geometry, 
But a second geometry I'm adding is the step uh, uh, geometry, and I'm passing an argument direction to it. And you can get HV, which is horizontal, vertical. So look at all, all of these points. The line goes from the point first horizontally, and then vertically to the next point. Horizontally first, and then vertical to the next point. If we do that the other way around, VH, for the direction, it's going to take exactly those same points, but it's going to go uh, vertically first. So from that point, it went vertically down first, the step line, and then horizontal. So you can do that in both directions. B swarm is a very nice geometry. Again, data frame aware, my X aesthetic, my Y aesthetic, and I'm adding another dimension to my data by using color. And if I were to pass that for B swarm, that's very interesting. So all I'm going to get is just the X, Y values. But if it finds two of the same Y value, it's going to plot these little dots next to each other. So instead of making a straight line of them, it'll actually cause a bit of jitter, move them separately so you can actually see each and every data point. So that is B swarm. Let's use continuous color scales. Now imagine this. Think about what will happen if I pass the aesthetic, uh, the X aesthetic variable 1 and the Y aesthetic variable 2. I add a third dimension by variable 3. So I don't have categories. All three of these are numerical values. What's going to happen now? Because I can't have these categories as far as my legend is concerned. It's now got to be something else. And that is where we use this scale.color continuous, color underscore continuous, uh, from a minimum value, comma, a maximum value. And I'm setting my minimum value, the minimum value for variable three. And my max value is data frame variable three column, and I'm using the maximum function, function. So minimum function, maximum function, those are functions in Julia itself. But as far as Gatfly is concerned, the color continues once a minimum value and a min value, max value values. In theme, I'm making the default point size seven pixels. So look at the contrast between these two. Here my key was, uh, was, a, was a category, was categorical. I found male and female, but what if the color that I do use to split up all my X and Y values is a continuous variable. That is when I use this scale.color continuous. And there you see it goes from the minimum value to the maximum value, it adds this gradient to it. So you can now see this third dimension, which is variable three, added as a color to each of the X, Y aesthetic. And that's beautiful, that really looks good. Let's manually choose some colors. This is also fun. I'm going to use the point geometry, but I'm using scale.color discrete menu. So uh, you can look at my color. It is now categorical. Remember before it just chose the colors, but I can force those colors by scale.color discrete manual. And I'm going to pass because I know category three actually has three. You've got to know how many different values there are, how many unique uh, entries there are. So category three, and I'm going to pass it these three colors as hexadecimal color, and I just want the point size and the theme to be seven. So that's going to be, give me nice, uh, nice color plots. So I have forced these colors. They are not those pink, deep sky blue uh, colors that, that, that uh, Gatfly uses by default. I can force the colors, and that actually looks, uh, looks uh, quite nice. And lastly, I promise you, there was another way to get rid of those pesky grid lines. You see these grid lines, they become solid. If I mouse over, they're there. Remember before we changed them to white. All I do do now is instead of making them white, I say grid align width, set that to zero pixels. So that's a, another neat little way of cheating a bit and just getting rid of those grid lines. So exact same thing as before, still forcing those colors uh, that I wanted to but now those uh, grid lines are gone. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, first look at Gatfly. It's a wonderful package. You can do some uh, uh, good uh, graphics. Certainly do most of what uh, you would need in day-to-day, in, -day, in your day-to-day -day work. And I'm sure it will, uh, it will grow. It will, uh, uh, we, we would see uh, more dif uh, different types of plots being added. And 
some more arguments to be able to pass so that we can uh, uh, change these elements a bit more. And then lastly, I hope in the future that as far as the GetFly website is concerned, more examples will be added because at the moment it's a bit thin in explaining uh, all the little subtleties of things that can be added. But as it stands, it's a wonderful package. Play with GetFly. You can do some real professional plots for all your, your reports, uh, papers and projects uh, simply using GetFly. Wonderful package. And here we have our first Julia project, a proper project, and it's going to be on medical statistics. Really a good, nice little project about introductory medical research. We're going to set up a medical research project from start to finish, a real basic project, and then eventually we'll analyze the data in Julia using juliabox.org. And uh, as always, you'll have the files available on GitHub if you do not want to... Uh, to create them all yourself. So what are we going to be up to? We're going to discuss all the basic steps in conducting medical research. So we're going to come up with a research question. Once we have that question, we're going to do a literature search. We're going to see what has been published about our research question. We've got to then decide what type of study we want to do, and then what variables would be required for this type of study so that we can answer our research question. We'll use those variables and we'll set our null and alternate hypotheses. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, doing a protocol and getting ethics approval for our study. Uh, we're going to develop a data collection tool ensuring patient anonymity. We do not want our patient details to become publicly, uh, publicly available. Then we're going to import our data set into Julia and we're going to do our data analysis. So first up in the next section, we'll start off with the research question. And here we go, our research question. Now, we're going to come up with a fake little project. In other words, we're not going to collect any real patient data, and we're going to really oversimplify things. This is really going to be... Uh, the low-hanging fruit that we're going to pluck just to form a basis for you to work from. Now, in many instances, uh, institutions are uh, resource constrained. We don't all live in a fancy uh, first world ivory tower sort of situation. Uh, but these are really the basics from which any kind of project can be built. And if you have these down, you can really start doing your own medical research. So we're going to draw a sample set of patients from a population admitted with skin and soft tissue infections due to diabetes mellitus. So these patients have problems with their insulin regulation, uh, their sugar levels go up in their blood, and they, are, uh, they develop all sorts of infections. So we have our make-believe little hospital, and we admit patients uh, Admission criteria is that they must have diabetes and uh, they are admitted because they have some infection, either skin or soft tissue infection. Now, we're going to classify these infections into two groups. To do that, we do have to have a de definition. We don't have to be rigorous about it here. I just want to set up two groups to compare to each other. And we're just going to call them, for argument's sake, minor infection and major infection. We could say that all the minor infections would be someone who's just admitted short Term, who's just getting some local dressings on their infection, on their skin infection, getting oral antibiotics, and we could say that the definition of major infection would be that they require intravenous antibiotics or some form of surgical intervention cleaning the wound surgically. When we do a proper medical research, we have to be very proper about these definitions though. But for argument's sake here, we have two groups and we're going to compare various variables between these two groups. We've got to define them. And what are our questions going to be? Well, we come up with these as clinicians, as we do ward rounds, as we see patients. As I, I'm a surgeon, as I take patients to surgery, you start wondering about things. And you think, I wonder if there's a difference there. I wonder if I were to do things differently. I've read something in the literature and that might, me, might make me think of doing something differently, something new. 
thought processes that occur other than just the normal care of the patients. So our research question here is really going to be very simple. We're going to compare the difference between these two groups that we formed, minor infections, major infections. Between these two groups, we're going to compare the admission HbA1c and the admission CRP. So in case you don't know, HbA1c is a marker in a patient's blood. It really tells us how good their blood sugar level control has been in the recent past. And CRP stands for C-reactive protein. It's a marker in the blood. Both of these can be tested in the laboratory by a blood sample. It is, CRP is a marker for infection or inflammation. And uh, absolute values are not necessarily that helpful to us as clinician and clinicians, and we really care about the trend. So if we do serial analysis and the CRP level starts coming down, we know we are on top of the inflammation or the infection as it starts rising. Um, uh, we are concerned and we might do further investigation, even further surgery, change our management in some way. But the absolute value is not necessarily that crucial. Uh, but if you have two, two, uh, two patients and, one, and both of them have a CRP of 50, they might have very different uh, uh, severity of the infection. So it's not the absolute value. So just that we're clear about what HbA1c and CRP really means. So in the context of this little project here, we're just using them as surrogate variables that we can co collect data points on and do our analysis. So a nice little research project here. It's not a, a real-world project. We're not collecting any real-world examples. And the question that I'm asking here is, is perhaps not, uh, uh, not really of any, any uh, clinical significance, but it's real nice data to work with. And we've got our two groups defined. We can do our analysis. Now, the next step, is going to be to go to the literature and do a search and see what others have published on this topic, on these research questions. And here we have our literature uh, search. Now, I'm not going to say too much about it. The first place and the best place probably to start when you're looking for clinically relevant, medically relevant literature to read, go to PubMed. You see the URL there that you can uh, copy into your, into your browser and go to PubMed to do a search. Now, it's almost like a Google search. When you just type in a keyword diabetes, you're going to get back tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of results. And to wade through those are quite difficult. PubMed is nice. You can kind of um, sort things on the left-hand panel. But the best way, probably, or two of the best ways to get uh, the most out of PubMed is to use the advanced search or MESH, medical subject heading searches. Now, PubMed is very good. They've got nice YouTube tutorials, two little short videos that you can watch both on doing an advanced search or doing a medical subject heading search. And you see the shortened URLs there, type them into your, into your browser and watch those tutorials if you were ever wondered about doing some good medical uh, literature searches. Once you've done that, once you know what's out there, remember that is going to go into your protocol, that is going to go into your reference list, get some good articles together, find out what is going on on, on these topics before you embark on any type uh, of, of research. Now, in the next section, we'll quickly look at what type of research uh, project this is going to be. So let's look at the type of research. Now, other than meta-analysis and systematic reviews, the, this is a good classification of medical research. And you see the two main uh, classif uh, classifiers there, observational studies and experimental research. Now, in an observational study, we don't do anything special. That is just doctors or surgeons. We just go about our normal business taking care of patients, and we collect data on that and analyze that. That is as opposed to an experimental research where we say, whoa, stop the bus. We're going to design a study and we're going to alter our normal day-to-day -day routine. Now, we usually talk about these as clinical trials or randomized trials where we're going to make groups of patients and we're going to select at random who falls into what group and every group will be managed differently. 
whether we do different surgeries, whether we give different drugs, inclusive of a placebo drug. Um, there's all sorts of experimental research in clinical medicine, but we intervene in an active way or even omit certain actions. That could also be done, but that's an experimental research. That's clinical trials or randomized trials. Observational trials, we're just going to gather data on our normal day-to-day -day business. And you can well imagine what the strengths and weaknesses of both of these main groups are. For the observational uh, types of research, there's four main types. There's case series where you just take a subset of patients, a, sa a set of patients, and we just describe some variables in them. Then we get a case control series. That is really where we're going to compare two groups to each other. And that is what this little study of ours is going to be about. We've got patients with a major and minor infection. Now it says case control, uh, you know, one can be the case and the other one the control. It doesn't really matter in this scenario that we have here. It's just that we have groups and we can compare them to each other. The specifics, though, of a case control series is that um, something happened and we look back in time. So in our little study, we have patients, they already have either a minor or major infection by definition, and we looked at something before that. What is their CRP level? What is their HbA1c? That is opposed to the cohort study, which you see listed uh, fourth on the list there. That is why where we have a point in time and we look forward in time. Imagine we were to admit these two sets of patients, we treat them and we look what happens over the subsequent days or weeks. So that is from a point looking forward. You will also see these referred to as a prospective cohort study. The third one that you see there, that's a cross-sectional study. That's also very common. That's a prevalence type studies, or it's just a flashpoint in time. And it need not be an instant, uh, an instant second. It might be over a week or over a month. These are usually prevalence studies if we're worried about epidemiology or if we hand out a survey for, for people to complete. These are cross-sectional studies, just a snapshot in time. So that is a good classification system to, uh, to uh, memorize, and most studies will fall into either of these groups or be some form of combination of these. Apart from these two main groups, of course, we get our systematic reviews and our meta-analyses. Our research here is going to be a case control series. Now we have our research question, we've done our literature search. We need to know what variables would be required to do our research. Now the first thing would be to do a power calculation. I'm not going to go through that. That uh, is for us to try and determine how many patients we would need for us to be able to have some power in our statistical analysis. That's a very important step and perhaps we'll make some extra videos just on that. We'll have to identify the patients from some sort of register. We might have our hospital register, the ward register where these patients are admitted, where diagnoses are written, and that is uh, the, the set the, where we're going to get our sample set from. And we have to now collect data on the type of infection. So we'll have to either classify it as major or minor, and that is a nominal categorical data type. If I were just to write my data points under the variable type of infection as main, minor, major, minor, major, minor, minor, major, those, those data points, the data type of those data points are nominal categorical. Categorical because minor is a word. I can't do mathematics using a word. It's nominal because there's no natural order to it. Now, major is worse than minor, but there really isn't a, a, a natural order a sequence to these. The next data we're going to collect is gender. Now, that's not part of our original research questions, but you'll see on most clinical research papers, there's a bit of uh, the background information of the patients that we are dealing with and gender and age, usually two of the common things that we do list. So once again, we'll have two data points just to keep things simple here. We'll either classify uh, our sample patients as either male or female, and once again, you can well imagine this is nominal categorical data. Next, age comes up. We'll just make note of each patient's age, and we might use that in a little comparison as well, although that was not part of our original research question. 
And that is a ratio type numerical continuous data type. Ratio type because there is a true zero. Someone can be zero years of age. It is numerical because we can do mathematical equations using those data points. And it's a continuous data, uh, uh, data type. The admission HbA1c, that's also going to be a ratio type numerical continuous data type. And admission CRP, also it's a value also with an, uh, a true zero, so it's a, that would also be a ratio type numerical data type, which is also continuous. Important, when we think about these variables, the data points that we are going to collect for these variables, it's important to think about what type of data that is because that will determine what kind of statistical analysis we can do on those data points when we get to Julia. Next up, we'll set our hypotheses. Very important here, you see that our hypothesis comes before we design our data collection tool, before we collect any data, before we even look at our data. That is such an important point in doing proper ethical research. Now, we, we're going to have our two uh, main questions there, research questions. We're going to compare admission HbA1c levels between patients with minor and major infections. And for that question, we need to set a null hypothesis and an alternate or test hypothesis. Now, null hypothesis will state that there is no difference between the, the, the two sets of patients as far as the HbA1c admission levels are concerned, that they'll be the same. Our alternate hypothesis or our test hypothesis will be that there is a difference between the two, that if I were to take the mean or median, depending, and we'll get to that, of the minor patients HbA1c and the mean or average or median of the major infection groups admission HbA1c, that there will be a difference between the two. Note, my alternate hypothesis does not state that the patients with a major infection will have a higher HbA1c level than the minor or lower than the minor. That would constitute what we call a one-tailed test. And the difference between a one-tailed test and a two-tailed test is really taking your p-value and dividing it by two. And that's a very dangerous thing to do, especially after the fact, after you've looked at your data, after you've calculated your first p-values, now suddenly to change your mind and say, well, I've got a p-value of 0 0.08, but if I suddenly said no, but before and I knew the major would be higher than the lower, and therefore I choose a one-tailed test now, I divide that p-value in two, so it becomes 0 0.04, in essence. Statistically significant, I publish my research, it sounds wonderful, I don't tell anyone about it. That's unethical research. Only at this stage do you set these hypotheses. You do not change them after the fact. And how do we choose here? How would I choose between a two-tailed and a one-tailed test? Why didn't I say, well, I think the HbA1c is going to be higher in major infection patients than in minor? Well, it's about convincing your, uh, your, your colleagues that this is so through logical arguments or absolute proof that exists in the literature beforehand. But somehow you've got to convince your colleagues that it would be proper to look at this from a one-tail perspective. Otherwise, please always default to two-tail and never ever change that after the fact. Now we come to comparing the admission CRP between patients with major and minor infection. Null hypothesis, again, there'll be no difference between the averages or the medians for the two groups. And my alternate hypothesis, again, I'm going to say there's going to be a difference. One might be more or less than the other. I make no judgment call beforehand. I'm just going to call it a difference. And once again, that's a two-tailed test. And you see the little graph on the right-hand side there. Just a simple graph uh, shown there where we do a two-tailed test. So we're going to, from a, if we use a, a, a t-statistic, we're going to see, uh, we, we're going to calculate the area under the curve for both sides of our distribution function there. A two-tailed test. Lastly, in our hypothesis here, we've also actually got to set our alpha level, our level of significance, and if we, we are going to choose 0.05, so if we find a value of less than 0.05, a p-value, or 5%, we're going to call 
uh, this is a significant difference, and we will reject our null hypothesis and thereby accept our alternate hypothesis. If not, if it's more than 0.05, we will fail to reject the null hypothesis. Remember the correct terms, you can never prove the null hypothesis, you can only fail to reject it. So our alpha level here will be 0.05. Next up, we'll have a short chat about protocols and ethics. So, writing a protocol on ethics. Now, depending on where you work in the world, every country, every region has rules and regulations as far as medical research is concerned. You have got to be absolutely aware of what the situation is wherever you conduct your research. Find out as much as you can. Never ever put the patients at risk. That is rule number one, and that is what protocols and ethics are all about. And it really is different in different regions. If I were to do a retrospective case control series as this year locally, I would really have to get ethics approval. Even if, it, even if my data is going to come from a patient file, the patient's already been managed, uh, patients will never be identified, um, it's not going to change any kind of management for those patients because they've already been managed, there's really no danger to them in this situation, I still have to get ethics approval for that. In other countries, uh, ethics approval for a retrospective folder review case control series such as this will not require ethics approval. But it really, really depends where you are. Please be very careful, read up, find out, talk to people about gathering data on human beings for clinical or medical research. Locally in South Africa, we would first have to take a protocol which will involve writing down all the steps that I've mentioned up till now. From the research question to the literature review, everything has to be noted down in a pro protocol, which then also states clearly how you're going to go about it from this step, it goes through a departmental research committee, and if that is approved, then only does it go to an ethics committee, and only after approval of that can you start designing anything, can you go ahead from this step. So please find out what the situation is where you are going to gather data from patients. And now we're going to get to our data collection tool. Now, this really depends how much money you have, how, how you, your unit is set up, uh, how much research has been done there. In most areas in the world, we are severely resource constrained. We do not have research offices, data, people to do data collection, nothing, nothing like that. It's only units that have got a good track record, that has published a lot, or are in big first world kind of ivory towers that have good data acquisition tools and have data available electronically already, etc. In most resource-constrained environments, this is not the case. So what I'm going to suggest here is really the bare bones minimum that you can do yourself, that anyone can do, irrespective of the resources, as long as they have obviously have internet connection. And from this base, you can build and build very fancy tools. So what I'm going to suggest here, you see there, is just using Google Forms. We're just going to use Google Forms. Now be very careful and careful about what you're going to put on your Google Forms because that is putting patient data on unsecure uh, servers, uh, to, to some extent at least unsecure service, servers. So it's, you've got to be absolutely sure that you are allowed to do this, get permission to do this, and it is of so much or utmost importance to protect patient identification if you use a tool like this. And for that ma matter, any kind of tool that you use has got to protect patient anonymity. And this is how we're going to go about it. On the left-hand side, we had our data required. Then you see two other columns that I want to discuss with you in this section. We'll have our anonymity format and you see the data point values. Now, the first thing, of course, we identify patients from the admission record, from the clerk's notes, or from the hospital's electronic record system, whatever the situation is. So we've got to have a patient. Now, that can be a patient name and surname. It can be a patient national identification number, anything. But we never want to capture that kind of data 
in our data collection tool. No matter how fancy it is, it is wrong to do that under most circumstances. So how do we anonymize that, especially if we want to use an open tool like this? Well, we're just going to have a patient ID. And that is just going to be a natural number. Natural numbers we know start at 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So every patient that I admit, it's just going to have a number starting from 1. That would be the easiest way to do it. Very separate from this data collection tool, even if it's on a piece of paper that is, isn't anywhere near this data collection tool, I might keep a record that says patient 1 is John Doe with that hospital number and that national identification number so that I can refer back to it. But that is never captured on this main data collection tool. That is kept absolutely separate. We've got to identify everyone who's involved in this research. We'll identify who's going to keep th those records. And perhaps even in this day and age, uh, as, a, as a basic uh, set of information, is to keep that separate and on paper somewhere locked away. Of course, build up from that. The more sophisticated your system is, you might have a way, better ways of dealing with this. But if you are resource constrained, that's going to go on a piece of paper and that is really going to be hidden away and held quite separately from all of this data analysis so that we know if we wanted to look at something specific, we can go back and see patient number three was so-and-so, and we can go back to that file. But as far as our data collection tool is concerned, we'll only have patient number one, patient number two. No one will know who that is. Next up, remember, is our infection category. We need to know if it's ma ma major or minor. But we will not put in our data collection tool the word infection and then have ma minor and major, mi main, minor and major filled in on our data collection tool. No. We'll write something like CAT1 for Category 1. You can choose whatever you want as long as no one can realize that CAT1 refers to infection or type of infection. No one should be able to draw uh, that parallel between the two. So if someone gets hold of your data collection tool, it just says CAT1. No one knows what CAT1 is. And the data point values that are, uh, that are entered into the cells in your data collection tool, in our instance here we're going to use Google Forms, We'll just use something like minor as A and major as B. So every time it's a minor infection, we might write A, and every time it's a major infection, we might write B. You can come up with whatever you want. You can call it grass and sky. You can do whatever you want. You can have more than one, um, um, more than one things that refer to main, minor or major, and you'll see in the next row there, we're actually going to do that. This is the basics, though. A for minor, B for major. Make it more complex than that. So here we get to gender. In our form, where the data collection goes, we're going to call it CAT2. Call it something that's even worse than that, just so long as you know what CAT2 is and that it refers to gender. And here we see on the right-hand side, so we're going to use either C, X, or R. So if there's someone who's collecting the da da data can either write C, X, or R when it comes to female, and they can write F, L, or B. Now, that's a steady thumbs up. And you can make it much more complex than that. So if someone sees that list of data, they're going to see C, F, X, B, R. It makes no sense. Okay? And as I say, this is just a baseline. Please make it more complex than this. This is just for illustrative purposes in this, in, in this uh, project of ours, Julia project of ours. When it comes to age, we'll, we might write VAR1 or variable 1. You can write whatever you want as long as you know VAR1 refers to age. Now, this can become complex. We can, we can do large studies, with, of, of course, with lots of variables on, on, on which we're going to collect data points. So once again, you can keep separate from your data collection tool what these anonymized column headers are going to be called. For Again, for the argument's sake, just for this little project of ours, we're going to call it VAR2. Now, what you can do, again, baseline, please make it more complex. We can all, everyone who's involved in this project can decide Whenever you dot, jot down a patient's age in the data collection tool, mentally add the value 5. So if someone is 33 years old, make them 38. And so you go for everyone. So that's a little mental arithmetic. So that's one way to anonymize the data. There are uh, the age variable at least. There are many more ways you can make it much more complex. But do not jot down the patient's actual date of birth in any form and not age either, especially at extremes of age. People can be identified because of the extremity of their age. There is not a lot of 99-year-olds running around. So come up with some way of scrambling that data age.
for argument's sake, for the sake of this research project, we're just going to add the value 5 to all the ages, which means when we do our data analysis in Julia, we've got to subtract 5 from everyone's age, and that's very easy to do in Julia, no problem. HbA1c, we're going to call it var1, CRP, we're going to call var3, and in this little project, we're just going to collect the actual data points. Very difficult if you get hold of lab values. A lot of patient, uh, patients are going to have uh, HbA1c values of, say, for argument's sake, 4.4%. And a lot of patients are going to have CRPs of 345. Uh, well, I should I should use a, a more common, say, let's say 55. Um, in the real-world situation, though, I would also scramble those two data values by some simple equation as well. But for this project, we're going to do that. So in the next section, we're just going to go to Google Forms. Most, uh, most of you will know how to use Google Forms. We're just going to set up very quickly a part of this data collection tool before we go over to Julia and do the interesting bit, do the actual analysis. So here we are in Google Drive and I presume you've logged into your Google Drive and uh, I've made some folders and I've navigated to the folder where I want to create my Google form. And it's very simple. We're just going to click on new and under more, you'll see Google forms. That is our Google form and it is going to open a new form for you. See if I've already done one there. So that's what it's going to look like if it exists there. And if data has already been collected, you'll see the little spreadsheet on the right hand side there. But let's go ahead. We're going to make a new more Google form. And it opens up for us there. And this is what it looks like. At the top, just our form settings. Let's increase the size there so we can see what's happening. It says require login to view this form. Of course, you want to be able to log into this. Again, as always I reiterate, make sure that you have permission to do data collection using a tool such as this. You can ask for a progress bar at the bottom of the page as the page has been filled in. Uh, only allow one response per person requires their login. Well, we want to log in many patients, so we won't do that. And we don't want the uh, shuffle order to the questions. We can quickly give it a name. This is going to be our Julia case control series. There we go. Give it a little description. This is our data collection tool. And we're just going to do our first question. Now remember our first question was patient ID. I'm going to try not to use any kind of spaces because that's the way the data frames package in Julia with a data frame refers to the column headers. Um, it will, it will uh, I think, put underscores, I think, if there are spaces, but try it for us not to use spaces here at all. We don't want to put any helper text there. Um, remember, we want to keep things anonymized. I'm not going to say this refers to the specific patient, look them up by the ID, nothing like this. It's not a multiple choice. It is just going to be text and I want it to be required. So just simple text, I want it to be required. I don't want any blank or missing values in the data collection tool. That's very important, specifically when it comes to data frames. Difficult in Julia to handle missing values and you have to do a bit of extra work to deal with that. So we're gonna say required question always. And now we want to add a new item. So I can just say add item or this little drop down box. And the next one, remember, was going to be cat one, but we only want people to be able to select either A or B. So let's say choose from a list. And remember, so for us, this was going to be just cat one. I don't want to do any helper text. I don't want to tell anyone what this is. And I only want people to be able to select either B or A or B. That's it. And it is required. It must be filled in. That's all I want. Next one was going to be cat2, also be able to choose from a list. So it's going to be cat2, no helper text. And remember we said we had a C, uh, an X, or an R, uh, or we had an F, an L, 
and a B. This just makes data entry a bit quicker and it also allows for uh, uh, minimizing the mistakes that someone can make because it's easy to type on a keyboard the D key if you wanted to hit the F key or something like that. But it does, um, it could provide a little bit of guesswork on a part of someone who gets hold of this data to see where we were going with that. So it's a bit of give and take here. But for our uh, accuracy sake, always constrain what someone is uh, able to enter the data on that minimizes uh, the um, mistakes that can be made. Again, it must be required. Next one, remember, that was just going to be text that we want because that was var1, which was just the age. And we are, have told each other, everyone involved in the study, if you do do the data collection, mentally add five to the patient's age if they were 32 or 33 i think was the example i used make them 38 and that is what's going to be entered again it has it is required next one was also text remember that was this var 2 it was required and that was going to be the patient's aba1c and then lastly also just text it was going to be crp which we called var 3 and it's also required and done that's it it's all done our form is ready we can see what the live form would look like and this is what it would look like if someone filled it in these were what they were able to see there we have nicely and it says this is required i can't, can't carry on before that was done end of story now we can change the theme you saw that i had a little made it look uh, look nice these are some themes you can choose from they're not terribly inspiring and really uh, um, sometimes a, a bit overdone we, we don't want any of that we're going to stick to that you can customize it by choosing a different header you can choose your own image you can choose change the title there around when you say choose image there I think you can either drag it from from uh, some uh, examples that are given here uh, that perhaps is not the, the worst one let's select that or you can use your own pictures and if you now view the live form you see it's going to be or should at least be updated your form looks looks a little better okay now what we want to do though we finished with changing the form we're just back to editing the questions now we can send the form electronically to our collaborators so send forms in other words we can put uh, someone who's going to do the data collection for us email address in there that it will appear on in the email inbox and when they open that email they can hit on fill the forms inside of a browser which is usually the safest thing to do when they do that they are going to see this live form and they just fill it in every time when they hit submit it is going to now create in our folder here something like this a spreadsheet and there's our, our column headers there simple as that and we're going to say file download as and remember comma separated values that is what julia likes to work with what the data frames package likes to work with with comma separated values we're going to download it as a comma separated values with all the patient details filled in there are no missing values and it's that comma, comma separated value file that we're going to import into julia box and we're going to use in our data analysis using Julia. So we've done all the hard work. We're going to bring in our data set in a comma separated values format into Julia. Here I am in Julia box where we are going to continue doing our work. And uh, I've logged in using my Google account. At the top, remember, you'll see these tabs, and when you go into Files, you can simply navigate to the folder that you are going to work in, that you are going to get your Julia file in, and you can simply, from your computer, drag onto this area on the right your comma se separated values file. It will then upload into the Amazon Web Services, and you can use it right there. So let's go back to our iJulia. And this is where it is, ccs.csv, you can see it there. That is the comma separated values and case control series is the file, the Julia file that I am going to work with. Now I've already created it here. I've done all the hard work. I've done all the typing so that we don't waste time in that. 
you can either get the file yourself or you can do all your own typing. You see it's Julia 0.3.11, the file is opened up. Remember Julia, the uh, Jupyter Notebook here, if I double click on a cell, you see it is a markdown cell and I can use either HTML tags or markdown shortcuts like this. The pound sign, hashtag sign means H1 or equivalent to H1 in HTML. So that will be the largest text, a heading type one text if I execute that cell, beautiful, nice text there for us. As always, I'm going to start my Julia um, coding just to see if things are working properly. I'm going to call the addition function there, pass it two arguments. So we know that's the same as writing two plus two. And if I execute that line of code, lo and behold, four, I kind of know that everything is working now. So what are we going to get up to just using Julia here? I'm going to show you how to import the packages and the packages that we are going to use to do the statistical analysis on the data that we've worked so hard on to get. We uh, are <coughs> going to show you how to import that data using the data frames package, that is. We're going to change the coded values. Remember, we wanted to protect the identity of the patients. We've changed some of the values. We've used code words. And I just want to show you how to revert that back to something that we can understand while we do the analysis, although you can leave it as such, except for the actual values that you changed. Words, not so much, but the values we've got to bring back. Uh, remember, we changed the, for instance, the ages of all the patients. We can't analyze that because that won't be a true reflection of our sample. We're also going to have a look around at the imported data set. I'll show you how to get to certain cells, how to get to certain columns, only uh, display them. We're going to do some descriptive statistics. That's uh, including some simple plotting using the GATFLY package. Now, we're not going to get into any depth in the GATFLY package, but it's so beautiful uh, just to, to um, plot some of your data. It's a nice way for a human being to get start getting a feeling for where the data is going to go. Together with that, just some easy descriptive statistics. And then we're going to make groups and we're going to compare them. We're going to do some inferential statistics using the hypothesis tests package, um, including showing you how to do a test to decide for continuous numerical data to decide between a parametric and a non-parametric test. So a lot of exciting stuff uh, in this part of, uh, of this lesson. So let's have a look at the packages that we are going to use. Now, when you run Julia Box on your own, you might not have access to all of these. You might have to install them first, just depending on where the uh, Julia Box is at the moment. I remind you, all you could do is to say PKG, that's uppercase P dot add, and then in parentheses and, and, um, and quotation marks there, you're just going to put the name of the data frame in case it is not loaded. Here are all the ones, uh, as I say, load them or add them with package.add. If not, you can just run them as is. So the first one's the data frames. Now data frames is going to take a comma separated value file, which we have imported into Julia Box onto the Amazon Web Services. It's in the same folder as this Julia file, so I can refer to it directly, but data frames is what's going to take that separated comma separated values table and it's going to convert it into something that Julia can work with. So I'm going to execute that cell. It's going to take a while. You see the little star there. It's going to execute those lines of code, uh, which reminds me, let's just increase uh, the, uh, the size of the screen a little bit the, so that we can uh, uh, not get lost in this small type. So that's executed. We're going to use GATFLY. As I say, GATFLY, very beautiful plots that you can get from a, a GATFLY, really intuitive uh, computer coding language that you use for GATFLY right in Julia and producing these wonderful plots. See the little star that's running and uh, we wait for it to, to uh, compile so that we can use GATFLY as part of Julia. It's executed, we're gonna go on to stats base. Stats base, part of statistics package, package that we are going to, uh, to use uh, to do our statistical analysis in, so we really want to import that as well. Hypothesis tests that contains uh, the uh, student's t-test, the main Whitney u-test, all the kind of inferential statistics tests that we're going to use. 
in this, depending on what our data looks like, remember we're analyzing our data, no, we, we can't presume anything, we can't assume anything, we're going to do our analysis. And lastly, distributions, we're going to uh, compare our data to a normal distribution and that's going to help us decide what kind of uh, statistical test to use on our uh, numerical continuous data types. Uh, in future les lessons or in other lessons, I am going to use, uh, talk about Plotly, uh, the use of Plotly in, in graphing, but for the sake of, um, of this exercise, this um, statistical analysis, we're just going to do our plotting in Gadfly. So we've imported all our packages. We are ready to import our data file and uh, start having a look around it. So let's import our data file. The function that we're going to use is a read table, and you see the parentheses there and the argument that it takes. The argument takes the name of the comma separated file with the file extension. For us, it was ccs.csv. It's got to go in these uh, quotation marks. Uh, and because I'm not putting in the file path there, it's got to be in the same folder in Julia Box as this Julia file. So I can use it directly. I'm going to place the content of this data frame. If I say read table, Julia is going to convert a data frame. Read table is a function that's part of the data frames package. So it's going to create this data frame from this comma separated value file. And I'm going to place it in this computer variable that I'm just going to call df. df for data frame, you can call it whatever you want. You see the semicolon after, uh, after this uh, function. That is just to suppress any output to the screen so we won't see the whole data set appear uh, on screen. So if I execute that, it's going to take a bit. Just read that uh, file of ours. It's got quite a few lines of uh, data entry there, and it now lives in data frame, and the type of data uh, DF is a data frame. Now I can use this head function. Head, it's also part of the data frames package, and the argument that I pass is the name of my data frame, which is DF, and it's just going to uh, print to the screen the first few rows. So if I do that, there we have, I can beautifully see on the left-hand side here, we have an index. That is what the data frames package adds all on its own. It's just an index so it knows what row it's talking about. We see our patient ID there. Now we know on a separate piece of paper, well away from our data collection, what patient number 16 or who patient number 16 is. It was never captured as part of our data and data analysis. Category 1, remember, A was uh, for minor infections, B for major infections, category 2 there. Remember, we had our little code, our secret code for what refers to male, what refers to female. Variable 1 was our age, to which we added mentally uh, a value of 5 years. And we've got to subtract 5 from each of these entries. We had our variable 2 and variable 3. So if I just wanted to look at the first few rows, I call the head function. I could also call the tail function, which is going to give me the last few rows. Another way just to look at these column headers, remember these will be my variables and the data point values for each of these variables, is just to call the show calls, the show columns. Now look what that does. There's a few things we can learn from this. First of all, we had six columns, and there they are, column one, two, three, four, five, six. And we see that there are, we have a list of the names of those. There was patient ID, category 1, category 2, VAR 1, VAR 2, VAR 3. A good thing that it does here tells me what data type it finds in that column. So patient ID was a 64-bit integer. And category 1 was a UTF-8 string, a string. In other words, we automatically know that here we're going to deal with a categorical data type. And if we know it's a categorical data type, that limits us to certain types of proportional statistical analysis we can do, for instance, Fisher's exact test or using a chi-squared test for, uh, um, for proportions there. So string tells us what data type we have. Another string for cat1, remember that was male and female. Then we had 64-bit floats, which means it's decimal point values. So we're talking numerical data here. And I know immediately I can do... Um, use uh, some uh, parametric or non-parametric tests for numerical data types there. So that helps a lot in making, uh, uh, helping us in our decision what statistical tests we can do on that on the data points in that in that variable. And missing is very important. Now we set up our data, and it's good to set your data up that you never have any missing values. But missing values do occur, 
Julia handles missing values with uh, the data type NA and it causes havoc. You will not be able to calculate a mean of um, a list of numbers if one or two of them are missing and have an NA type in them. There's a special way that we have to deal with that. Fortunately for us here, we see we have no missing values in any of those columns of values. So that is, that's it. We've imported our CSV file and it lives as a data frame now and we had a good look at it. In the next section, we're going to change all our coded values. We're going to look at changing the variable names we had, cat1, cat2, var1, 2, and 3, and changing those coded values into minor and major infections and to male and female. So let's change these coded values. Before we do that though, we need to know a few things about our data set and I wanted to show you just to how to play around and look at certain cells, how to get to them because those would be the values you want to change, how to play around with your data set a bit. First of all, we have this size function and I pass the argument data frame to it. It's going to return two values, the number of rows and the number of columns. Therefore, I pass two computer variable names on the left hand side there and I've chosen in rows and in columns because that's quite descriptive. So the size returns two values so I've got to have two computer variables on the left hand side. So let's run that block of code and we see 120,6 indeed I have that tuple two values an ordered pair that was returned there 120 rows in six columns. What if I want to know the value of a specific cell? I can use its address, its row number, and then its column number. And I have to do that in square brackets, and it's always row, comma, column. So I can ask the data frame, what is in row three, column number four? Let's look what that value is, 16.02. Now I needn't refer to it as row four. Now remember, there we have row four was var one. I can refer to var one by its name. Now this name does not go in quotation marks. It has a little colon before it. That's how Julia and the data frames package refers to the column name. So I'm going to say in the data frame, row three in the var one column, which is exactly the same as four, so I should get exactly the same value back. I can ask for quite a few rows using this colon separator. Remember we used uh, from numbers one to five, if I want to do a for loop, and we're going to use a for loop very shortly, I can say the data frame, give me rows three, four, and five, comma, and if I just use the colon there, it's shorthand for saying, give me all the columns. To show you, let's run that. So I get all the columns, and but I only get rows one, two, and three. See how the index changes to one, two, and three, but these certainly were rows one, uh, rows three, four, and five. I can pass a list like this, two and four, uh, an array, I should say, two and four. So I want only columns two and four, but I want rows three, four, and five. So you see how you can play around by just selecting certain things. Now this would be the same as saying, give me rows three, four, and five of the columns cat one and var one, that was columns two and four. So I'm gonna get back exactly the same values there. I can ask for specific rows as long as I pass them as an array here, two, five, and 99, comma, columns two to four. So it's always row, comma, columns, rows, comma, columns. Now that we know how to do that, how to get to specific cells, let's change all the A's in the cat1 column to minor infections. So I'm going to change the actual data point values inside. Remember when we imported, when we imported, we saw A, 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 and there were B's uh, further down. I want to change that A into minor infection and all the B's. So I've got to run down each and every one of so I'm going to go to column one, I've got to run through every row. Check if it's A, I wanted to write minor infection. If it finds B, I wanted to write major infection. So this is a little for loop that I'm going to write. So there's my for end, end at the bottom loop. And inside of it, I'm going to do some Boolean tests. Now, remember, we had N rows, N columns. The N rows was 120. So I'm going to cycle through from number one to number 120. So I'm going to loop through all of those rows. And I'm using this um, implicit computer variable here, R. I could use any 
thing there, you could have said i, it doesn't matter, for r in 1 to 120 in essence, and it's just going to run through all of those. First, I'm going to indicate, every time I run through, I want a different cell, and I'm going to give that cell, I'm going to pass its value into this computer variable called temp. It's just easier to work with it like that. So I have this computer variable temp, and inside of it, I'm going to do, so at the moment, it's row 1 in the category column. Whatever the value it finds in that cell now goes into temp. Now, get used to using this first part of the if statement. I'm going to do an if-else end statement here. Always say is na, uh, the temp, and then pass the computer variable temp, which holds that value for the cell. Always test if it has is a, is a missing value, na. Now, we know we don't have any, so I'm just going to comment the line out here saying do nothing. It's going to be ignored because of the hashtag there. Um, but you might have data, uh, CSV files that you import and there's missing values, and you want to be able to do something to them. Else if, so if it's not that, it's going to go to the next if statement, so we have to use the Julia code else if. If temp equals equals, so I'm not equating these two to each other, I'm not saying temp equals, I'm saying is the value that's inside temp, which is that one cell we're dealing with now, if, if it's A, then make that cell, which is at the moment row one in the category column, make it minor infections. If it wasn't A, we'll do the next if, else if, temp if it finds B, we're going to make it major infection. Lastly, else, but I only have the A and B, so I'm just going to write there, do nothing, just to have something there. End, end. So this last end is for my for loop, so it's going to run through 120 times. And then we have the if, else, if, else, if, else, end uh, statements in the middle. So I'm going to execute that section. Nothing happens, but I tell you now it's changed all the A's to minor infection, all the B's to major infection. And I want to do the same to cat2. Remember we said if we find a C, an X, or an R, we want it to be female. If it's an L, a B, an F, we're going to change it to male. Once again, I'm going to use this for end loop, R in 1, 220 in essence. I'm going to do the same thing, put that cell value every time, put it into temp. Now this R in temp is implicit, it's inside of this for end loop. Its scope is not beyond this little loop. So when this loop is, when we finish executing this loop, I cannot call temp and I cannot call R, they are inside of the scope is inside of of uh, of, the, of this loop i'm going to run through exactly the same thing this is good to use this is na for your first if and then else if for the ones you're really interested in and the last else just being empty uh, it's good to learn it this way and as things get more complicated you can start adding things the only new thing here is this these double lines here it's usually shift back uh, backslash most keyboards especially on the mac uh, all we're saying is or so if temp is, is c yes or no or is temp x yes or no or is temp r if all three of that turn return of returns are false it's going to go to the next uh, if else uh, else if statement if any one of them is true, because these are all, it's not and, they don't all have to be true, because remember we used C, X, and R for female. It's going to turn that cell into female. If it finds L, B, or F, it's going to change it into male. So I'm going to run that code cell. The last thing I want to do, the second last thing I should say, I want to go down the var1 column and I want to subtract 5 from every entry. And I just have to do that. I'm going to say var, if I say df in that column, it's going to look at all of those values at once. Well, it doesn't really happen at once, but we say it looks at them all at once. I don't have to cycle through them with a for loop. And I'm going to subtract 5 from all of them. And that's how, remember how computer system works. It, it, uh, um, with an equal sign here, it's going to execute whatever's on the right-hand side and then place a new value inside of that value. I can just do it. And remember, we had 38 for the first age. Now we have 33 for the first age. And because I didn't use the semicolon, it's actually going to print those all to the screen for me as in data array just for that column. All right, lastly, in this little section, I want to change all the column names. And this is how I'm going to do it. Rename exclamation mark. This exclamation mark, it just means uh, do it in place, uh, not just for the sake of the execution of the cell, make it permanent. It takes three arguments, the data frame name, 
the old category number and uh, value and the new category. So cat1, I want to be in fiction. I've got to use those, col the, those little colons there. Cat2, I want gender, var1, age, var2, hba1c, var3, crp. And if I execute all of those, I'm not going to use a semicolon at the end. I want it to print to the screen so you can see. Inf patient ID, infection, gender, age, HbA1c, CRP. Now instead of cat1, cat2, var1, 2, and 3, a minor infection, major infection for the ABs and Cs, and females and males specifically as we've indicated, and 5 subtracted from everything. Now you don't have to do this. You don't have to change the names. Specifically, if, if, if you want to keep uh, the, the secrecy, the anonymity in this analysis, you don't have to do this. I'm doing it here for illustrative purposes so that we, when, we do the, when we do the GATFLY graphs, uh, things are just done automatically. I don't have to put them in by hand. Now, uh, one thing that is permanent that you would have to do is just to change all the values back to what they were supposed to. We cannot do the data analysis on the false ages that is not representative then of the sample that we are dealing with indeed. But that's beautiful. All the hard work is now into a data frame that we can use. And in the next section, most exciting, we're going to do some descriptive statistics where we start getting a feeling for the data that we are working with by doing some descriptive statistics, getting some numbers and plotting some graphs gives us, as human beings, a good feeling for all of these numbers because certainly looking at them like this does not mean a lot. So there we go, let's do our descriptive statistics. The first thing I want to do is just to look down the infections column. Remember, I only have major minor infections, but I might not know that. I might not be the one who's done all the data uh, gathering. I just want to see what data point values appear there. I just want a list of them, and I want to know how many of them there are. Remember, these were words, these were strings. They'll be categorical data. And to be more precise, they're going to be uh, they're going to be a, a normal type categorical data. Um, there won't be any order to minor infection, major infection. I suppose you could say one is worse than the other, but that depends on on your point of view. We're going to create a computer variable called groups because I want to save those numbers. And this is the by by is our function, the data frames function. It takes a few arguments. You see it takes the name of the data frame, it takes the column you want to look at, then it creates this computer variable inside of it. Then it becomes very difficult because I'm going to assign to that, I'm going to use this data frame keyword, I'm going to create a new column called n, and it is going to tell me how many times whatever I find occurs. Very difficult to get used to this, but it's very powerful. Note it down and you'll see it works It works beautifully. Let me execute the code so that you can see. So it is going to create a data frame. It is going to have two columns because it's going to take this infection column and see what it finds. And it only found two things. It's going to create n, which is a new column. And to it, it's going to pass how many times it finds whatever it finds there. So it found 60 instances of major infection and 60 instances of minor infection. Okay, difficult to get used to this line of code. Look at it. Let's do another one. We're going to go down gender and see how many of it we found. Now we set up our data set that we would have these nice numbers. But it goes down. It's a sort by. You can see it as that. It's going to sort by the gender column, how many it finds. It's going to add this new column called n and in it it's going to find how many of the instances of whatever it finds, female, male, it finds. And that's where the size, again, the size function comes in. So now I know I can make, I can almost make a little uh, uh, two by two contingency table of this, and I can do a statistical analysis on this for proportions, can't I? And we certainly are going to do that. I can do simple descriptive statistics. I can say mean. What is the mean or average value? It's a function in Julia. Uh, pass to it the argument, the data frame, the age column. 
which is going to, in essence, be a data array. It's going to be a, an array of numbers, and Julius is going to work out for me the average value. And there it is in the split second. The mean age of that whole age column of ours was 22.96786, etc. years. Simply, I can do the median. I can do standard deviation. That's STD function, STD, and then takes the argument of this data array that I want to pass to it, which pass to it, which is the age column of our data frame. I can do quite a few things at once. There's this nice describe function, pass to it the argument of the column that I'm interested in as well, and it gives me quite a few things. A little bit of a summary statistics. Mean, we saw it was 22.9 or something odd. We get the minimum value was 10 years. The first quartile was at 12.967. The median, the third quartile, the maximum. So we can immediately do the interquartile range. We can start to uh, calculate what uh, statistical outliers would be, etc. We can do this describe function for everything. So immediately I can start getting a feeling. My median, my mean HbA1c was 5.9%. My median was 5.6%. And I can look at the CRP, so nice descriptive statistics. I don't have to do a thing. The only thing that it doesn't give you here, which is always helpful, is just the standard deviation. But sim you can simply ask STD. So we see the mean was 51, the medium 44, so a bit of a difference there. Um, so we know that we might be dealing with a few outliers. Now, I want to stop there because I want to spend a little bit of time, and I don't want these, uh, these sections to be too long, very excitingly, we're going to do some gadfly plotting. Good, so we've described uh, our statistics. Let's do it visually using the gadfly package. Now, a whole bunch of lessons just on the gadfly package. I'm going to show you the basics right here. Plot. Plot is a function and it takes various arguments and you build up what you want in your plot very easily. The first thing, GetFly is data frames aware, so you can just tell it what data frame you are going to deal with. So first argument, DF data frame. Second argument, what do I want on the x-axis and what do I want the y-axis to be? So on the x-axis I want the infections. Now I've got to do this in quotation marks, I'm not going to use the I'm not going to use the uh, the colon in front and just the word. So I could say df uh, um, square brackets and then the colon, but I can because I've passed this data frame argument there, I can just use in quotation marks infection column. So remember the infections we have m m um, minor and major. So those are the two things it's going to put on the x-axis. So those are not numbers; those are categorical values. Those are categorical values. Now, why it's going to be the age. So it's going to go down the age column for why. But now I've got to tell it what I want to do with it because there we have categorical data on the x-axis. On the y-axis, I've got numerical data. So one of the things that you can plot in that way, of course, is a box plot, just box and whiskers. And I say geom, which stands for geometry, with a capital G there, dot box plot. That's how you refer to the type of plot you want to do. And then three of the arguments I'll use quite often is guide.title, guide.xlabel, guide.ylabel, and you can just imagine what they are. Guide.title is going to put a nice bold title on the top of your graph. You pass an argument to it in, in, in quotation marks, and I'm going to call it age analysis by type of infection. So you can immediately see what's going to happen with this box plot. On the x-axis, we're going to have a box plot for minor infections and for major infections, and for each of those, we're going to do a block, box plot of the age. So GATFLY is going to extract from that one column age the values that belong to minor infection, the values that belong to major infection, and it's going to plot them as a box plot. That's wonderful. And I'm going to label my x-axis, guide.xlabel, the type of infection, which is minor, minor major, and on the y-axis, I want to use this label function. I'm going to execute this. Now it's got to compile on the server side, on the Amazon Web Services. So it's going to take a little bit. 
before we start uh, to see where before we start seeing our first plot so let's hang in there a bit and there we have our very first very beautiful plot i have my title guide.titles age analysis by type i have my x-axis label type of infection i have my y-axis label and two beautiful we not we can change the various things about this i'm not going to do it now but we have our two beautiful box plots there we even see our outliers on that side and we see if we hover we can also zoom in and zoom out and on the x-axis it's found minor infections and it's found major infections let's repeat i mean that is beautiful i love the colors the default colors that were chosen this is change the color. We can do the exact same thing, just works for size sake. We call the plot function and the following arguments. The data frame, the x-axis, instead of infections, I want it to go down the gender column and find whatever it can. On y, the age, and it's also going to be a box plot geometry. So geom.boxplot. I'm going to have a title, so it's guide.title, an x label and a y label. This time I'm going to add something new though, a new argument theme. And I pass to it the arguments the following. Default underscore color equals, now you've got to use, be careful, there's, it's colorant and then just the quotation mark orange. So nothing in between there, no equal sign there, nothing. Just get used to how to write a color. There's a few keywords for color that you can use straight off the bat. So if I execute that second time around, things are going to be a bit faster. Let's have a look. And there we are in orange, beautiful. So it found female and male. It attached the age values to it beautifully and it drew our two box plots for us. Now that is really, really professional. It looks fantastic, looks phenomenal. I want to show you a different type of, so we, we can start seeing things here already. See, we see that the age, we see major infection patients are slightly older than the minor infection patients. We can certainly see that. We can see that uh, we had a bit more spread in the data as far as the age analysis of the major infections concerned. Another type of graph that will show that to us uh, even better is this density plot. So it takes the following arguments. Again, it's plot, gadfly, the data frame. But on the x-axis, I want age. Now, age is just a string of the numerical values. You go, go from youngest to oldest. So what am I going to have on the y-axis? Well, I'm not going to call it y, I'm going to call it color. Not y, color. And for that, I want to look down the infection column. Now remember, it's going to find two types of infection. Two types of infection, minor and major, and I'm going to pass that to the color. And then I'm going to call geom.density, because a density estimate on the y-axis gives us a density estimate. Um, of of our data. So it's, it's going to find minor infections and look at all its ages and major infections and look at all its ages. Again, I'm going to just do guide.title, guide.xlabel and guide.ylabel. Let me show you the plot. First time we're going to do a density plot, so it's going to think about it a bit. It's going to compile that. It's going to look through the data and it's going to render the plot for us. There we go. That's what it does. So you see, I call the y-axis distributions because it is a density estimate. You see the values there. You see the values there. And now we can see the age distribution. See from 0 age to 50. So this is a kernel density estimate of the minor infections and major infections. So I cannot pass a y argument here. It is part of the density geometry. I want it to find the two sets of ages, the minor infection age and the major infection age, and I pass that to the color argument. Now we can start to see, well, there's perhaps not a difference between, I'm, I'm, I'm going to put money down that there's no uh, statistically significant difference in ages between major and minor infections. And it might be a bit difficult to see uh, not really, but it might be slightly difficult to suggest that just from the box plots, but these density plots really give you a lot of information. Let's do the same thing for gender. So again, age, but this time I want to do the density, kernel density estimates for gender. 
let's do that and you can see as far as the gender is concerned really the age analysis is almost uh, identical so again if i compare males to females as far as the age distribution is concerned um, i'm not going to find with a parametric or non-parametric test i'm probably not going to find i'm not going to find uh, i can say a statistically significant difference let's do some more box plots just to have a look at our data so I'm going to go on x-axis infections and the HbA1c, comparing major and minor infections. All the other things the same. I've given descriptive words to the title, the x-axis and the y-axis labels, and we see there is a big difference. Now, remember, this is just fake data. Probably you won't see anything like this, but the minor infections seem to have had higher HbA1c than the major infections. I'm going to go through this rather quickly now. You know how to write the code for these plots. Let's rather concentrate on the data. If I look at HbA1c, major and minor infections, as you see, we saw that big difference in the box plots, but look at the kernel density estimates. We can beautifully see. Just a reminder, I don't pass a y argument. I pass the color argument. And on the x-axis, I want the HbA1c percentage values. I don't pass y because the density will be calculated for me. Let's look at box plots just by gender. If we look at box plots by gender, we see there isn't really any difference. But look at those plots. They are lovely. And let's just pass a, a, a box plot for CRP versus uh, infection. And we see the major infections quite a bit higher in the C-reactive protein. And lastly, if we just look at CRP analysis by gender, we see they are rather equal to each other. So box plots and kernel density estimate plots, it helps you so much to get to grips with your data. Look at the code that has been written to generate these GetFly. It really makes it easy for you to plot your data. In the next section, we are going to start doing some inferential statistics, which is what it's all about. So finally, we get to do some inferential statistics. We're going to compare groups to each other. Now, there's various ways to go about sorting out your data frame. I'm going to use just the simplest way here. I'm going to create smaller little data frames. I'm going to create four of them, a minor data frame, a major data frame, a female and a male. And this is the syntax. This is, this is how you go about it. So I'm going to create these four computer variables. I can call them whatever I want. I've used these descriptive terms. So I refer to the data frame and then in square brackets, you see the whole square brackets there. It takes two arguments. There's my comma and colon at the end. And in the first bit, we're going to have data frame the infections column, dot equals equals, so it's a Boolean question, but dot refers to each individual individual cell. So it's going to go down the infections column and it's going to say, is this equal, is this entry equal to minor infection? If it returns a true, it's going to pop it into this new minor data frame. Same with major, down the infection data frame, if it finds major, it's going to put in the major data frame. Again, look at the syntax. It's data frame, open and close parentheses, then data frame and its column. So in its column, and then dot equal equal. So I'm asking a question, is it equal to cell by cell? If it finds major infection, it's going to put it in the comma colon. And I'm using a semi semicolon right at the end because I don't want this to be uh, printed out to the screen. So I've created four little smaller data frames, and they are very specific as far as the infection entries are concerned and the gender entries are concerned. Now let's do some proportional analysis first. We're going to count the level of amputations by gender. So we're going to take the minor and the major columns because we want to construct a 2 by 2 contingency table here so that we can do some categorical data analysis for proportions. So again, I'm going to use my by function. It takes the following arguments, the data frame, the column, and then I'm constructing this new variable d such that I create this data frame with an n new column called n, which is the size of how many different things it finds. So for gender, it's going to find male and female, and it'll count for me how many of those it finds, and it'll pop it into this new column called n. There we go. So in the minor data frame, I find female and male entries, and I find I've got this new 
uh, new uh, column header called n, new variable n, which is, is a count of those. And I'm going to do the same for the major column. Now, as far as the hypothesis test package is concerned, it does not have a chi-square test, but it does have a Fisher's exact test. So I can construct this two by two contingency table. So I've just shown you how it's done. I have female and male as my two categories, and I have my rows as mine infection, major infection. So remember for the mine infection, we found 29 females, 31 males. So I fill it in there, the 29 and the 31. If I do the construction this way, the 29, under female is A, the 31 is B, the 31 under female is C, and the, four, the 29 under male there is D. So A, B, C, D goes along like that. And those are the four arguments for Fisher's exact test. 29, 31, 31, 29. Let's run that. And the hypothesis test package is very nicely constructed because look at the beauty of all of this. The output, Fisher's exact test, population details, the parameter of interest is an odds ratio with a value under the, under the null hypothesis uh, that the odds are 1, 1 to 1, that there's no difference. The point estimate that we get is 0 0.8, 7, 0 0.88. My 95% confidence intervals low and upper limits and under a 5% alpha value, I failed to reject the null hypothesis because a two-sided p-value gives me that. And it gives me a little summary of the contingency table. So here, I just put it so that we can see what it looks like. All you have to do is to put in Fisher's exact test with its four arguments. And it shows you there that indeed you did it right, the A, B, C, D. And we see that proportional analysis here shows us that there's no statistical significant difference in the proportions between male and female, that distribution for major, minor and major infection groups. Now, sh now we're going to deal with, not proportions, but we're going to deal with Continuous data type, ratio type numerical, we're going to compare age, age groups for the minor and major. We're going to do the CRP for minor and major, and we're going to do the, uh, sorry, the age, the HPA1C and the CRP. Now, you can do it with uh, plotting the quantiles and seeing if that forms a straight line. Um, but there's also a statistical test that you can do that is in the hypothesis test package, and that's the, what the hypothesis test package refers to as the kolmorov smirnov test. And what does it do? It takes the distribution, it takes the actual values of your sample, and it compares it to an ideal distribution based on a mean and a standard deviation. Now remember the terms, use them pr properly, if I have a point estimate or measure of central tendency of my sample, such as mean or median, that is a statistic. If I have the mean or median of a whole population, that would be a parameter. So what are we doing when we decide between a parametric or non-parametric test? We want to know if the sample values we have, if they were taken from a population in which that parameter was normally distributed. If it was, then I can use a parametric test. If not, my p-values will be inaccurate, uh, my analysis is wrong and I have to use a non-parametric test. So let's run this. This is how it's run. Exact one sample KS test. And it takes these three, uh, well, two arguments. The data frame with all the values, so all the age values. And it's going, co going to compare that to a normal distribution. So this normal comes from the distributions package which we, which we, uh, uh, which we imported and says, construct for me a normal distribution around this mean and this standard deviation. And all I have is my sample. I don't have values for the whole population. So I'm going to enter the mean and the standard deviation for the ages of the patients that I do have. Now I'm cheating a bit here because you've got to do it separately for the minor and the major groups. Do this uh, KS test for both. And if either one of them or both of them are not from a normal distribution, you cannot use a parametric test. So um, this is only for illustrative purposes, so I only want to run, run it once just to show you what we have here. So as far as the age is, just the age of all the patients in my data set is concerned, we see a two-sided p-value, very significant. I then reject my null hypothesis and say that the ages here were not taken from a population in which that parameter, the age parameter, was normally distributed. So I cannot use a parametric t-test. 
like a student's t-test i have to use a non-parametric test but again do it for minor and major both not for the whole group as i've done here so let's do that we've actually i think got to do it for all of them but for uh, argument's sake here yeah, i'm just doing it on all the patients so let's compare hba1c against this normal distribution with this mean and this standard deviation and we see that's not significant in other words we failed to reject this null hypothesis we can use uh, we, we can use in this instance a, a, a parametric t-test. Let's do it for CRP and we find there a statistically significant difference. So let's compare the patients in the two groups. Let's compare their ages. Now we saw up here the age for instance. We should use a non-parametric test and that's exactly what we're going to do here. Cat uh, numerical data. So ratio type numerical continuous variables, we're going to use the non-parametric Mann-Whitney U test. Mann-Whitney U, and it just takes the two arguments. And we see here uh, the uh, null hypothesis states there's no difference between the group. We find a F statistic here for our Mann-Whitney U test of negative 2.4. That converts to a two-sided p-value of 0 0.28. It's not significant. We failed to reject the null hypothesis. And... Um, we uh, uh, we we uh, can write that in our report. Now let's go over to the HbA1c. Now remember, as far as the HbA1c was concerned, we could use a t-test if I remember correctly. But let's use the non-parametric test and let's run that. And again, we see well we find a very significant, extremely significant p-value. We won't write that in a report. We'll just say it's less than 0 0.01, for instance, or less than 0.05. But let's do something. Let's check the variance of the HbA1c in the minor, a comma, and then in the major group there. And we see that, well, the variances are nearly equal, so we can probably use an equal variance t-test, a proper student's t-test. And this is how it looks like. Equal variance t-test, and takes the two arguments, the HbA1c values in the minor data frame and in the major data frame. And I'm just going to compare those two values to each other. And lo and behold, you see, you're still going to find a significant p-value there. Nothing is going to change. And it gives you your number of observations. It gives you your t-statistic. It says there was 118 degrees of freedom. Remember, 120 patients minus two groups. That's your degrees of freedom. And it gives you your empirical standard error there. So beautiful there, a non-parametric and a parametric test for our data there. Now... I can describe quickly the HbA1c, I can describe the HbA1c for minor and major. If I had used the non-parametric test, I could describe the medians for both and say that we found a significant difference. If I used the t-test, I can describe the two means of the group, 7.1 and 4.8, and say I found a significant p-value of less than 0 0.01 there. Beautifully, beautiful, everything I want is right there. I even have my 95% confidence intervals around the difference in mean. Mm, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Just for argument's sake, let's run the uh, Mann-Whitney U-Test. Mann-Whitney U-Test takes two arguments, the values in this array here, minor CRP and major CRP. Remember, those are just two sets of values that I'm comparing to each other. And again, we see we find a significant p-value. Uh, in this uh, little uh, file, I've also done comparisons between female and male. We can quickly run through them using a non-parametric test, HbA1c, and then lastly, just the CRP, and you can see the values that were there. And look at these beautiful results. We can really, really use Julia to do beautiful statistical analysis. Everything here, from the plots in Gadfly to the results here, ready to be used in writing a paper for submission to a journal. Lovely stuff. I hope you've enjoyed this project. I hope we can do some more.